Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mary Miller, the director of the Getty Research Institute, and I'm so very pleased to welcome you all here today. I met many of the presenters and many of the mentors last night over dinner, uh, and please, if you haven't met me and you're here today, say hello at one of our breaks today. I'm eager to meet our entire audience. Uh, you know, we're at this incredibly interesting and important point. I think it's perhaps even a turning point in the history of art, um, a part of the humanities that has almost always been seen to be uh, a kind of second fiddle to the studies of literature and history and philosophy. But look around at our world today. The future of the humanities, I would say, is not in the text, as it still was at the time that most of the, say, the mentors and, uh, and others, many others other than this, and maybe even the students at about the time that you were born. Um, but the world has changed so quickly. And, uh, you know, I would also happen to say, I would be willing to say that many of the advisors and mentors in this room had no idea that when they were at your stage of, the, of your program and your studies, that what had been the basis of humanistic inquiry from the days of Sophocles and Sappho, whose writings in turn would be the subject of inquiry for generations, that, it, well, it was always the text. A text once privileged and handwritten, then disseminated through the printing press, then by that cheap, crumbling paper of the books we hate to pull off the shelf in the library, where they turn to dust in your hands. But those cheap paper books and widespread translations of works into English and many other languages made it possible circa 1900 for so much wider access to the history of, uh, and literature of the world. Um, it was possible at a library uh, for so many people to discover the literature of the world. And if the world, word had been king up until the 20th century, during the 20th century, it was pretty much the emperor. But that's not the case these days. And I would bet that it's one of the reasons that the academic humanities, the enrollments in many of your institutions, have suffered. Because today's students are thinking less about the text. And you know, you know what they're thinking about. You are the people who are doing this thinking. It's about the image. It's about the moving image. It's about the live stream that we have of this very conference today. You're the advisors, the directors of graduate studies, the mentors who are here today see in our presenters the future. And that future should be a discipline that sees itself as the centered heart of humanistic inquiry. I look forward to learning more about how we take those steps today. Now, this is the second year of the Getty Graduate Symposium, and so I think this is a tradition that we have fully committed to. There are many people to thank at the GRI, but let me start by acknowledging Andrew Perchuk, who approved the concept of this before it launched last, uh, last year, and then most of all to Rebecca Peabody, who heads our research program, um, who proved the concept. Two years ago, the Getty Graduate Symposium was just an idea. Rebecca made it a reality, and I am happy to introduce her to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca Peabody, Head of Research Projects and Programs here at the Getty Research Institute and one of the organizers of today's event. Uh, and it is a pleasure to welcome you here to the second annual Getty Graduate Symposium. This symposium is the result of a series of collaborations that started a couple of years ago when we reached out to the department chairs at each of the nine schools represented here today and asked if they would join us in putting together an event to showcase the work of emerging scholars from research universities across California. Each of our nine partner institutions nominates a graduate student along with a faculty advisor to represent their department and their school. 
And over the course of the day, we will see the evidence of one of the most important collaborations, which is all of the work that students and their advisors do together. Last year, we organized the first iteration of this event, and I'm really pleased to be back here again this year for the second and our now annual series of symposia. I'm also excited to share that this year, we've expanded the scope of the event to include a pre-symposium workshop for undergraduate and master's level students who are thinking of pursuing careers as curators or as art historians. So whether behind the scenes or on stage or out in the audience, this event is a conversation between scholars at all stages of their careers and one that I hope will continue well beyond this weekend. I wanted to highlight the collaborative nature of this event in order to call out the layers of engagement that went into making it possible and to create an opportunity to thank everyone involved at each of those stages. But I also think it's an appropriate way to underscore the reason that we're all here today, which is both to showcase and to support the work of emerging scholars. We have a lot of points of connection with students here at the Getty, from our two internship programs, the Getty Marrow Undergraduate Internship and the Getty Graduate Internship, to the seminars we teach and host in special collections, to the community of research assistants, thesis writers, and dissertation writers who spend time here each day. With this event, we're able to consolidate some of those connections, reach out to universities that aren't quite as local, and initiate a sustained conversation that will bring us together on a regular basis. In short, this event allows us to deepen our commitment to graduate education by highlighting the important work of emerging scholars, by providing a stage and a stepping stone in their professional careers, by connecting with art history departments across the state, and by contributing to the scholarly community that does so much to sustain us all. I would like to thank each of our partner institutions who are indicated on the program, as well as our new collaborators on the workshop, the Atlanta University Center Consortium, represented today by Spelman and Morehouse Colleges, and the Art History Society at California State University at Los Angeles. Thanks to our speakers and their advisors, many of whom have traveled to be with us today, and to our audience, many of whom have also traveled to be with us or are perhaps joining us virtually via live stream. There is a link here on screen, of course, and it can also be found online. At the GRI, my thanks to Mary Miller and Andrew Perchuk for their continued support of this program, to Kim Richter for her expert help with yesterday's workshop, and Jennifer De La Fuente and the rest of our events team who do so much behind the scenes to make sure everything runs smoothly. I also wanted to thank Sofia Jimenez for her help and support with our live stream, and Daniel Spaulding, who was so helpful in thinking through how the abstracts might fit together into productive sessions today. A couple of notes about our program. We will have three sessions made up of three papers each. We won't take questions after the individual papers, but we have reserved time at the end of each session for a discussion of the papers, as well as questions from you, the audience. If you drove today, we have complimentary parking for you, so please be sure to stop by the check-in table outside so our visitor services staff can validate your parking. And last but not least, if you haven't already, please take a moment now to silence your phone, but don't put it away until you've taken a photo of our YouTube link and texted it to everyone who might join us. Uh, and I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Louise Deglin, along with her advisor, Stella Nair, both of whom are joining us from the University of California, Los Angeles. Well, I think I can speak on behalf of uh, all the advisors and the students and to sincerely thank the Getty for providing this really wonderful opportunity for us all. I'm honored to introduce our first speaker of the day, Louise Deglin, who is a very promising doctoral candidate in the Department of Art History at UCLA. She's studying the arts of the indigenous Americas with a focus on the Andean region. Deglin came to us from Paris, where she did her undergraduate studies in art history and archaeology at the École de Louvre and continued on there to do two master's degrees, one in museology and the other in art history. Deglin has conducted field work in French Guiana and Peru and has interned at several museums, including the Louvre in, in Museum in Paris, the Museo de Indio in Rio de Janeiro, and LACMA here in Los Angeles. Deglin has only recently completed her coursework and thus just begun research on her doctoral project, which will focus on the art and architecture of the Wari Empire. The Wari controlled much of the central Andes and developed a complex and highly varied artistic tradition, yet relatively little art historical research has been done on Wari art. 
Degling will help rectify this troubling omission with her dissertation research. The talk that she will give today is just the first step in this promising journey. Louise. Thank you, Stella, for the introduction. Thank you also to Jennifer and Rebecca for coordinating this wonderful symposium. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Bundled in a heavy woolen tunic, this elite warrior man stares motionless at the viewer. His face is divided in two halves, red and black, revealing a contrasting motif on each side. His eyes and mouth are wide open, echoing the schematized heads decorating the two bands on his chest. The head, framed by large earplugs, is topped by a gray headband from which feathers emerge. His arms extend on each side of the body, stemming from a sleeveless tunic which barely covers his feet. On his back, his long jet black hair ends in a delicate point, mimicking the tapering of the garment. While the painted decoration flattened the modeled features of the vessel when seen from the front, they underlined the shape of the body from the side. Under this profusion of motifs and colors, the body of the figure is both concealed and revealed, inviting the viewer to a closer inspection. This fascinating jar was made in the central Andes between the 7th and 11th century CE, and is one of many representations of richly adorned Wari dignitaries about which little is still known. The Wari founded what is considered the first Andean Empire 800 years before the Incas. They rose from the Ayacucho Valley in the central highlands and later expanded throughout most of what is now Peru, although the nature of their presence seems to vary across time and space. The Andes are centered around the mountain range, which gives its name and bridge and an, a rich environmental diversity. Wari sites exist in each of these ecosystems, from river valleys to jungle and ridge top mountains. Many Inca achievements, such as their extensive road system, actually came from Wari inventions. Despite ample evidence for the importance of the Wari, scholarship on the subject is still young. The Wari did not rely on a formalized form of writing to manage their territory. The study of this rich Native American art practice has thus been hindered by the lack of written records and the denial of indigenous forms of knowledge by European invaders. Looting and site destruction, common in the Wari heartland around Ayacucho, have contributed to Dele Wari art historical studies. The case of this face snake jar from the Detroit Institute of Art illustrates well this situation. It was acquired in 1991, but its specific provenance is still unknown. This object was most likely looted in the 20th century, as most Wari objects known today in museum collections. In this context, few art historians have ever dedicated themselves to Wari art, and basic questions regarding Wari production still remain to be answered. Wari artists produced a wide array of intricately designed objects made of textile, ceramic, wood, or even shell. These objects were mostly movable and centered around the body, such as containers, garments, and jewelry. This multifaceted artistic tradition cannot be easily contained within art historical categories such as abstraction, naturalism, or figuration. My dissertation project, now still in its early stages, will investigate the diversity of these artworks, which has never been addressed by scholarship thus far. By being so prone to change and variability, Wari art challenges the fraught view of Native American artistic tradition as homogenous and standardized. That is why, through my research, I wish to begin unpacking the characteristics and functioning of Wari art in a way which embraces its diversity and acknowledges the agency of its makers, materials, and making processes. I want today to perform a visual analysis of this painted vessel as an artwork in its own right, in spite of its lack of archaeological context. I hope to demonstrate that unprovenanced artifacts, which make up the bulk of Wari artworks known today, still constitute valuable sources of information for art historians. By closely examining the conventions of representation and the evidence of making on this object, I wish to gain insights on the nature of Wari artistic practices at large. Little is known about this object in particular, but larger Wari archaeological studies can inform our understanding of the making and use of this work. 
In the warrior state, most decorated ceramics were produced within workshops, likely controlled by warrior or local elites, found in both the heartland and the provinces. The pots and figurines made within this workshop could vary greatly in size, form, and function, but archaeologists have shown that the warrior focused their attention on serving vessels specifically. Indeed, archaeological evidence suggests that feasting, drinking, and the ingestion of psychotropic substances form the core of warrior ceremonies. Archaeologist Patricia Knobloch has identified on warrior ceramics depictions of the hallucinogenic plant Anadenanthera colubrina, which she argues might have been mixed with alcoholic drinks and ingested by the warrior. Similarly, I have recorded a zoomorphic motif on jars from Conchapada that I interpret as the poisonous toad of the Bufo genus. While the hallucinogenic effect of such amphibians is still debated by scholars, zooarchaeologist Suzanne de France has found a Bufo toad that had been brought intentionally by the Wari to their side of Cerro The mind-altering substances used by the Wari, whether psychotropic plants, animals, or alcohol, most certainly impacted the way their objects were made conceived and perceived, in particular during ritual activities. Drinking and eating vessels clearly held symbolic meaning for the warrior, who often used them in political or religious rituals. Decorated vessels could be displayed in niches alongside mummies of ancestors within important warrior buildings, such as ritual halls or mausolea. After their ceremonies, the warriors sometimes intentionally smashed their vessels and buried or scattered their remains between different rooms or buildings. The meaning of this practice is still unsure, but it seems to have been spread by the wari throughout their territory. The Detroit jart might thus have been used for drinking and toasting to then be deposited or discarded afterward. This generic archaeological background helps us understand the function and use of that this face nuke jar might have fulfilled. However, it does not tell us about warrior artistic process, nor does it give us access to the biography of this specific warrior object. I will now turn to the artwork itself to look for evidence of making, organizing principles, and aesthetic choices which might inform our understanding of warrior artistic practices. As warrior art cannot be defined by a fixed set of forms or motifs, I suggest that its commonality may have lied instead in its use and manipulation of conventions of representation. In 1963, archaeologist Alan Sawyer had already noted the importance of distortion and symmetry as organizing principles on noir textiles. In this talk, I will use a similar approach for this ceramic vessel. More specifically, my examination of this artwork will focus on four distinct criteria. Symmetry, color association, composition, and scale. Warrior imagery is almost unmistakably structured by symmetry, as exemplified by this ceramic vessel. Here, the symmetry of the hair, the face paint, and the garment reinforces the bilateral layout of the body of both the figure and the vessel. Warrior artists commonly use symmetry and repetition to create patterns out of a single motif, as in the case here of the bands of stylized heads on both the ceramic and the textile. In doing so, Wari artists scattered the point of focus of the composition and blurred its orientation, rendering it difficult to comprehend. This manipulation of the image results in a flat and deconstructed visual, asking for the beholder to mentally identify each of its individual components and shift them into a coherent and readable ensemble. This fixed new jar also illustrates that color association with another essential organizing principle of Wari art. Here, yellow, orange, purple, and gray schematized heads alternate on the bends of the tunic, while flat sections of red and black cover the face of the figure. Color was an essential component of Wari art, as evidenced by their mastery of bright dyes and pigments, which are still incredibly vibrant today. The Wari and many other Indian groups had a physical connection with color, literally embodying it by applying it to their faces, wearing it, weaving it, and sprinkling it on the bones of their ancestors. We know that it is color overall, more than a specific substance, which mattered to them, as the color used on bones and skin was invariably red, while the type of colorant could vary between cinnabar, ochre, ushiode, and cochineal. This suggests that in the War Empire, color was critical in indicating the importance of a body. 
it would be, however, limiting to solely focus on the cultural meaning of color in Wari art. Rather than purely iconographic or symbolic, the ubiquitous juxtaposition of colors in Wari art certainly reflects an aesthetic sensibility. Art historian Gabriela Siracuzano has shown that in both Amara and Quechua, the two main indigenous languages spoken in the Andes, the concept of Sigairu expresses an, an aesthetic and symbolic concern for color association. Indeed, while the term designates the combination of black and red, the suffix gairu refers to concepts of extreme and powerful beauty. The seed of the wairuru, bright red with a black spot on one side, perfectly illustrates that concept. The powerful color combinations found on Wari artworks were thus most likely intended to provide a certain visual effect. The display with hues impacts the viewer in two ways. First, the abundant and overuse of colors deconstructs the hierarchy of the composition and flattens the representation. Second, it introduces movement, as in the case here of the motifs on the tunic, which seem to be flowing. Hence, as art historian Susan Berg has noted for worried textiles, quote, the intricate color conveyed the clear impression of order, but is scattered focus, unquote. The structure of the decoration on this jar, with its extensive use of patterns covering the human figure, similarly confuses the gaze of the viewer. The eye is forced to move back and forth the human subject and the ornamental textile, face paint and headdress, disrupting the traditional art historical hierarchy between figure and ground. This phenomenon occurs in Indian weaving, where motifs can be read both in positive and negative. The absence of distinction between figure and ground seems deeply anchored in the thinking and making of artworks in the Andes. When an in indigenous community around Cusco in the 1980s, Ed Frankemont noted that, quote, an Indian weaver would consider nothing background and foreground, unquote. While centuries separate the weavers made by Frankemont and the artists of the Wari Empire, their approach to artistic composition appears strikingly similar. As a result of this phenomenon, Wari imagery seems to both enhance and conceal the human figure. Depending on how objects were handled and displayed, the viewer would get caught by the dialectic opposing the body and its ornamentation. Finally, when placed within its larger corpus, this vessel raises the issue of scale. Due to their number and ubiquity, face nude jars constitute one, if not the most studied corpus of Wari objects up to date. They are, however, far from uniform. In the Wari heartland, face nude jars can range from one inch miniatures to 40 inches monumental vessel, whether as functional containers or purely votive objects. Scale manipulation occurs in a variety of media in Wari art, from ceramic and metal to textile. In playing with scale, Wari artists did not only prove their technical mastery, but also generated unique properties in relation to size. Indeed, scholars specializing on the later Inca empire have demonstrated that scale was an essential component of Inca visual culture, in which reduced and monumental sized objects condensed or instead expanded the power of their reference. Hence here, this face in a jar should not be merely perceived as average-sized, but as human-sized, intended for one individual, up-close handling, and most likely intimate events. This worry artwork thus appears to follow a rigorous, if not lifeless, structure in its use of symmetry, color association, flattened composition, and scale, providing a sense of visual completeness. These common denominators can inform our knowledge of warrior modes of making and thinking art beyond the use of specific motifs and modes of representation. But a detailed inspection of that vessel indicates that such conventions of representation are often interrupted to introduce surprise and rhythm, revealing a new insight into wari artistic practices. Here, the color of the details of the heads woven on a tunic changes without any logical sequence. while the swirl motif on the face of the figure differs from left to right. Indeed, the organizing principles behind warrior art never seem to follow a perfect logic. This approach results in an organic rather than mathematical symmetry, similar to that of a body. Susan Berg has argued that, quote, modern symmetry classifications seem in some respects inadequate to address the categories of ancient Indians, unquote. 
Why would that be? The skill set of warrior artists allowed for lifelike depictions and accurate geometric shapes. So the fact that they repeatedly broke off patterns and conventions cannot be attributed to a lack of dexterity. The making process of warrior artworks can explain, at least in part, their variability, as it allowed for adjustments, changes, and mistakes. In the ancient Indies, most potters would paint patches of colors directly onto the slipped vessel before tracing their black outlines, thus requiring the ceramicist to mentally project the intended motif onto the surface. The, project, the process of weaving in the Indies is just as progressive and tied to its maker. Anthropologist Ed Frankamont has compared modern Indian weavers to jazz musicians who introduce movement and distortion to their work as they go along and follow, quote, symmetrical rules as a guide, but not a limit, unquote. While they could use molds for certain parts of their ceramics, warrior artists did not use cartoons nor models and solely relied on their memory and the rhythm of their hands to create motifs, rendering each dis creation distinctly unique and prone to improvisation. The making of warrior art thus integrated formative errors, which art historian Todd Olson finds in the unscripted interaction of the material in the hand of the artist. This generative process impacted the symmetry, color, and composition of warrior artworks. Hence, if warrior artists followed clear conventions, they would disrupt their expected logic, whether intentionally or not. The contingent marks on this face nick jar can thus be considered evidence for the agency of warrior artists. For archaeologist Ian Hodder, norms and rules act as a frame for the actions of individuals whose agency lies in turn in the way they react and adapt to such norms. Rather than considering that the warrior state gave considerable leeway to its artists, I see mark making as a possible practice used by artists to negotiate artistic norms, whether that of the warrior, local elites, or specific patrons. As a result, such marks function today as a visual signature, attesting the hand and process of the artist. While it is unsure whether this intervention was intentional, the existence of owner's marks, such as those engraved at the bottom of warrior ceramics found at the site of Surubaul, does indicate that people in the warrior state could physically inscribe their ownership onto an object. A similar practice might have existed among artists in order to signal authorship. This individualized, if not intimate, approach to warrior artworks is reflected in the extreme care given to their surface, even when not visible. Indeed, although face nuke jars, uh, this face nuke jar might seem like a simple painted pot, it was certainly conceived as much more than the application of the decoration onto a surface. Warrior artists would not leave the base of a decorated ceramic or the reverse of a cloth unfinished, contrary, for instance, to European tapestries, whose yarns are left hanging in the back. The Detroit Institute of Arts does not make available any image of the base of this face nude jar, thus preventing us to engage with that important point. This warrior bowl from the Museo Largo, with its slipped and polished surface on what's in its inside and its base, can give us an idea of how the non-readily visible parts of the Detroit jar might look. Overall, warrior artists seem to perceive their creations as integral units, focusing less on what was visible than what was present. The surface was not perceived as an independent layer, but as a reflection of what was underneath. Mathematician Branko Grunbaum, after analyzing multiple Indian textiles, formulated the concept of textile surface, which refers to decorative structures in which form and matter collide. Different from the Euclidean plane, the fabric plane includes a third dimension, that of thickness. I suggest that this idea that images are embedded in their structure can be applied to Wari art overall. I consider that, similarly, the decoration on Wari artworks is far from shallow or intended for visual enjoyment, but is instead conceived as integral to the nature and function of the object. In conclusion, Wari art appears to follow organizing principles, such as symmetry and scale, but embraces organic changes that render each artwork unique and ultimately irreproducible. Wari art is in its essence anti-hierarchical, blurring the line between figure and ground, structure and decoration, and surface and matter, thus eluding pre-established art historical categories. 
in consequence, I suggest that it is necessarily necessary to look beyond questions of style and iconography in order to better understand the nature and organization of war artistic practices. Overall, if this Facenic jar lacks context of use and finding, it points to the thinking and making process of its maker, their priorities, conceptual approach, and aesthetic concerns. It encourages us, in a way, to look beyond the surface. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm Elizabeth Cameron. I'm uh, Kristen Lasista's advisor, and I'm delighted to introduce her to you. Um, Kristen is a PhD candidate in the History of Art and Visual Studies Department um, at the University of, Cal of California in Santa Cruz. Her research and teaching interests focus on contemporary arts from Africa and its diasporas, the transatlantic slave trade, and the centuries-long relationship between Africa and Britain. This paper is taken from um, preliminary research for her dissertation um, entitled Dress to Express Black Women Dandies and Their Displays of Empowerment, in which she examines photographs, short films, and videos, performances of black women dandies generated and circulating with the, um, be between the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Africa, and the United States. I give you Kristen. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. Thank you to the Getty Research Institute for this amazing, incredible opportunity. And thank you all for being here today. When I was in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo last summer, I remember sitting and waiting at one of the tables pictured to meet the oldest women supper, Clementine Batia. When she arrived, all the vendors stopped and stared. Even the police officer patrolling the area broke into the biggest smile and came to greet her. Dressed in a red leather jacket and skirt, a black blouse, black tights, and black boots with heels, she moved gracefully to meet me. Despite the heat of the day, she did not break a sweat. When I asked to take her picture, she performed for the camera as she posed with poise and exuded elegance. For my presentation today, I focus on women's sapeurs in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Sapeurs, or Congolese dandies, are members of LASAP, which in English stands for Society of Ambiance Makers and Elegant Persons. By utilizing images and components of my conversations with them, I offer a reading of LASAP as a source of income for women sapeurs. This is not to exclude the idea that men sapeurs view or take LASAP as a form of work, nor do I wish to give the impression that work and fun or pleasure are mutually exclusive. My goal is to shift the focus away from sensational readings of LASAP, which concentrate on extravagance and elegance and excess in the face of dire poverty and political upheaval. My presentation comes from field research I conducted in July and August 2019 in Kinshasa with the help of my faculty advisor, Elizabeth Cameron, my, car my colleague, Carly Forbes, who's in the audience with us, and our research assistant, Moise Kinsanda. My research consisted primarily of conversations with sapeurs and individuals, such as photographers and curators who work with them. These conversations were in Lingala, the local language in Kinshasa, in French, and in English, and recorded with permission. The photographs of women sapeurs in my presentation are taken by me, unless otherwise noted, and used with the sapeur's permission as well. While sapeurs have been around since the early 20th century, their introduction to the United States and Europe via advertisements, like the Guinness beer commercial that aired in 2014, videos such as Solange Knowles' Losing You music video from 2012, and online articles has been relatively recent. They are known for their expensive outfits, their extroversion, and their elegance, which stand in stark contrast to images of the Congo that often concentrate on poverty, internal conflict, and disease. Although these representations show Congo in a light that might be surprising to audiences abroad, 
images of sapeurs circulating in the United States and Europe have spotlighted men for the most part. For instance, Daniel Tamagni's Gentleman of Bakongo is a photo book of sapeurs in Brazzaville, Republic of Congo. It dedicates only two pages to women who are the girlfriends and wives of sapeurs, not to women who are sapeurs themselves. While its exact origins are unclear, Lesop today is associated with Brazzaville, the capital of the Republic of Congo, and Kinshasa, capital of Democratic Republic of Congo. These are twin cities separated by the Congo River and their colonial history. While when and where Lesop exactly started is debatable, Didier Gondola asserts that it dates back to the first years of the colonial period in Brazzaville, which housed the French colonial administration and Europeans. Congolese houseboys and servants working in European homes began to dress in the styles of their employers as they would give second-hand clothing as compensation. At this point, it is necessary to take a step back and understand why European cloth, clothing, and accessories could be an acceptable form of compensation. Phyllis M. Martin's research on colonial Brazzaville indicates that the importation of European cloth, clothing, and accessories into the region that became known as French Equatorial Africa had entered a culture of dressing well, which is one of the values held by members of LESAP. Martin points out that many Central Africans prior to colonization already understood the power, and the power of fashion and its ability to signify identity and status. However, in colonial Brazzaville, the existing clothing culture was transformed in two ways. One, the increased access to imported cloth, clothing, and accessories um, could be purchased by anyone who could afford them. And two, the interactions from people from a diverse regions in Africa had a significant impact on the clothing culture. The colonial administration and trading companies in Brazzaville recruited and brought to the city sk skilled laborers from Gabon, from countries in West Africa, and the French Antilles. Referred to as the Bapopo, or the coastmen, they became the new urban elite in Brazzaville. They were viewed by the Congolese as models of success and looked to as fashion leaders as they wore European clothing on almost an everyday basis. From the 1930s onward, Congolese in Brazzaville and in Kinshasa were attracted to the European styles of clothing sported by the Bapopo. They were no longer satisfied with their employer's secondhand clothing as a form of compensation and became instead obsessed with acquiring the latest fashions from Paris. In the 1940s and 1950s, Lesop became associated with popular music and with young people. Urban youth flocked to venues such as nightclubs and beer halls to hear Congolese rumba. In these spaces, sapeurs would display and discuss their fashion and often engage in friendly competitions. In my conversations with sapeurs, both men and women, they note that Papa Wemba, the late Congolese um, musician, is a constant source of inspiration as in, and, and influence as he popularized Lesop in Brazzaville, in Kinshasa, and for Congolese living abroad in Europe during the 1970s and 1980s. Another musician, Stirvas Nyarkos, impacted Lesop with his song, Religion Ya Ketendi, which put forth the idea that seeking and wearing Ketendi, or cloth in Kikongo language, should be the first priority in life. This has been taken with utter seriousness by sapeurs to the point that Lesop today is perceived by audiences in the United States and Europe for their obsession with clothing. In my research, I have found that the existing scholarly literature on Lesop comes primarily from the fields of anthropology and sociology. These readings of Lesop focus on escapism in two respects. One, a literal escape by embarking for Europe, particularly for Paris, and two, a figurative escape by donning griefs or designer clothing. These two types of escapism are connected, as one of the ways sapeurs can find griefs is by traveling to Europe and acquiring them there. To understand why traveling to Europe is important, Didier Gondola notes that both uh, the Republic of Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo gained independence in 1960 against a backdrop of social and economic chaos, leaving urban youth struggling to find work in the cities. Viewing Europe as a land of opportunity, many young Congolese people escaped to Western European cities such as Paris, London, and Brussels. While there, they became disillusioned as they faced discrimination 
and found themselves settling for the most unwanted jobs and for poor living conditions. For them, Lasop became a source of empowerment that enabled them to create new identities away from home and in Europe. Likewise, Dominic Thomas suggests that Congolese youth have a fascination with France, constructing it as a place where their dreams could be fulfilled. Thomas explains this as the migrant impulse. For sapeurs, this means traveling to France to obtain griefs and eventually return, Cong return home to Congo to display their designer acquisitions. And so in the photos that you see before you, um, they're taken by Hector Mediaville, the director of the Guinness Beer commercial that aired in 2014. In these photos, you see um, a couple examples of sapeurs um, showing off some of the things that they have acquired. Sapeurs expect that the wearing of designer clothing will enhance their social status. Congolese youth who become sapeurs, or it's more correct to say they are born sapeurs, but they start to dress like one later on in life, expect to be perceived as a person of distinction after escaping to Europe and then returning to Congo. This is marked visually by the display of cleanliness, their elegant manners, and most conspicuously, the donning of griefs. As mentioned before, scholars discuss the escapism associated with the SOP in terms of dressing in designer clothing from brands such as Versace, Dolce & Gabbana, Yoji Yamamoto, and Yves Saint Laurent. Didier Gondola asserts that, quote, without the grief, the SOP would not exist. If the sapeur believes that clothing makes the man, he also believes that griefs make the clothing. By acquiring the grief, which he will do at any cost, the sapeur buys himself a fragment of his dream." End quote. This dream that Gondola, as well as Dominic Thomas, refers to is the dream of having social status and riches. For sapeurs, donning designer clothing is in itself an accomplishment and can bestow upon its wearer a sense of power. Dressing in expensive clothing enables sapeurs to escape their circumstances, which might include hardship and poverty. However, this imaginative escape from poverty and from hardship could be perceived as selfish ambition. In photographs and videos of sapeurs posted online, escapism through dressing well has been viewed with compassion and understanding on the one hand and with contempt on the other. For example, RT Documentary posted a video on YouTube entitled The Congolese Dandies Living in Poverty and Spending a Fortune to Look Like a Million Bucks. The documentary follows sapeurs in Brazzaville, giving the audience glimpses of their wardrobes and their reasoning behind the acquisition of griefs. On the page, commenters largely criticize sapeurs for their spending habits as they choose to purchase clothing over supporting their families. These reviewers Derisive comments indicate their disgust with the sapeurs for not having their priorities in order. They condemn the sapeurs for appearing materialistic and superficial, causing those who, are, who they are responsible for, mainly their families, to suffer. In contrast, some reviewers of the video see the sapeurs' lifestyle and choices with sympathy, recognizing that designer clothing gives its wearers a sense of empowerment and pride in the face of hardship and poverty. While interpretations of Lesap often focus on escapism through traveling to Europe and escaping by dressing well in designer clothing, I offer instead an alternative. Being part of Lesap is a form of practical work. In discussions about the relationship between Lesap and work, work is often talked about in terms of acquiring griefs. According to the scholarly literature, this is achieved by having another job and or participating in illicit activities, such as stealing, and or selling counterfeit clothing. In my conversations with women sapeurs, La Princesse, who's pictured here, said that in addition to being a sapeur, she sells clothing in a boutique, while Mama Miner, who's also pictured here, told me that she sells fish in the marketplace. Kaja Erika Dorgensen's discussion on La Sop and work is largely informed by understandings of 18th to 19th century dandyism in England and France. During this time, dandies were understood as self-made white gentlemen, known for their status, their style, and their wit. In drawing connections between dandyism and Lesop, Dorgensen writes, quote, cultivating lifestyles that emphasize clothing, personal appearance, and etiquette, dandies are performative in that they revel in the act of doing nothing. Work is removed from the sphere of presentation, and for sapeurs, this means the means by which they can afford designer clothing is seldom discussed 
and deemed largely irrelevant, end quote. While sapers do value clothing, personal appearance, and etiquette, I disagree with Jorgensen's assertion that work is removed from this sphere of presentation. Instead, I believe that their presentation, particularly their performance, is pragmatic work itself. My work is indebted to, the, to Marlon M. Bailey's expansion of the concept of labor through the study of contemporary ballroom culture in Detroit, Michigan. Members of LASAP and ballroom culture both value expensive brands, utilize clothing as a means of self-fashioning, stage and participate in competitions, and are confronted with economic and social hardships. Bailey argues, quote, the concept of labor reflects how creating culture, family, language, gen gender, and community requires constant and strenuous work, labor. Overall, performance provides a means through which black LGBT people undertake this necessary work to sustain themselves as a minoritarian community, end quote. Thus, Bailey asserts that, the perform that performance um, enables ballroom members to survive and thrive despite economic and social challenges presented to them living in Detroit. Ballroom culture and LASAP are not given. They require work to be maintained. While conducted, conducting his study, Bailey also articulates that he is a member of the ballroom community in Detroit, acting as a performative co-witness. In other words, he interviews, researches, and writes on the very community he is part of. His informants are people he has built relationships with over time, and people who share similar life experiences and struggles. In contrast, it is necessary for me to acknowledge my own positionality in relationship to the sapeurs. Since I am not a part of LASAP, and since discussions were mediated and translated by my research assistant, my conversations with women suppers last summer can only provide a limited picture of what it is like to be a woman and a sapeur living and working in Kinshasa. Although this was the beginning of a larger project, my conversations with women suppers were illuminating as they framed being a sapeur as a job that entails hard work and having a good attitude towards work. Barbara Eves, one of the women suppers I spoke with, said that performing is like her job, likening it to women who have businesses, to women who work in offices, and to women who work in the military or with police. The question then is, how is performance connected to work? Phyllis M. Martin reminds us that dressing well is deeply rooted in Congolese society and reflected most obviously in the dress of sapeurs. While dressing over the top is a given for sapeurs, they are distinguished from women who simply dress well by the way they work and, the way, and by their attitude, according to Mama Africa and Mama Miminer, pictured here. One instance this was made clear for me was when La Princesse and Barbara Eves performed in front of the camera. And so I'm gonna show you two very brief clips of them performing. from these short clips, these are just snapshots of the performances that they would give in a competition. 
Both La Princesse and Barbara Eves are, are confident and comfortable while photographs and videos are taken of them. Their movements and their transitions between their movements are seamless, punctuated by qu abrupt, quick foot stomping. To perform with such ease, practice, or work is necessary. Besides for performing in front of the camera, suppers also perform in competitions where they can earn monetary prizes. Mama Africa said that she was crowned the champion on International Women's Day on March 8, 2018 in Brazzaville. In order to stand out and win such competitions, dressing and performing better than other suppers is required. How then, but how then is performance by women suppers a form of pragmatic work? In my conversations with them, I was struck that they connected being a supper to family responsibilities. Mama Africa told me that she often worries about money as she is responsible for her children, her sister, and her house as her father already passed away. Although not pictured, Mama Africa was accompanied by an assistant who also took photos and kept appointments written down, so it seems that she supports her as well. When I met with La Princesse for the first time, she brought her son along as well. During our conversation, she told me that she constantly tells her son, quote, you eat money from Lasap, end quote. In other words, being a supper helps her support her children. La Princesse also expressed her wish to use her earnings as a supper to contribute to her son's studies as he is interested in studying computers. Barbara Eves told me proudly that she was able to send her two daughters to study in Europe because of Lasap. It is apparent from conversations with these suppers that work is not only about acquiring griefs or designer clothing. They work not only to support themselves, but also their families and their assistants if they have one. In conclusion, while representations of Lasap tend to highlight flamboyancy and frivolity as a means of escaping reality, it is important to remember that suppers in actuality are perhaps more grounded in reality than it seems. As the origins of Lasap began with work, as houseboys and servants received secondhand clothing as compensation during the colonial era, it is important to recognize that being part of Lasop then and today requires work to sustain its members and their families. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Weems um, from the University of California, Riverside. I want to thank you all. This is a fantastic um, audience for these speakers, and I want to thank you all for coming. It is indeed my privilege to introduce Cynthia Neary Lewis, a PhD candidate in art history um, at the University of California, Riverside. Cynthia is studying the arts of the United States and the indigenous and colonial Americas. She is a Los Angeles native, having completed her BA at Pomona College and her master's at the California State University, Fullerton. She is in something of an advantageous position as a PhD student, as she already holds a tenured professorship at Rio Hondo College in Whittier, um, where she teaches courses on a rich array of North American and colonial Spanish topics. Um, Cynthia has, I think for much of her professional life, um, been a deep student and deep deeply a student and deeply engaged in the history of Alta California and the California missions. She's been engaged, I think, in this research from the moments, from the first moments of the uh, mission Spanish colonial history to the most recent moments of their, um, we, could, we could say their sort of continued afterlife um, as monuments to a kind of American imperial desire as well as more contemporary discourses around Californian identity. Her dissertation, um, whose title tentatively is The Illuminated Walls of the California Mission, The Index of American Design California Project, 1936 to 1942, looks at a crucial and I think um, strangely understudied aspect of this mission history and an aspect I think of, of a sort of understudied moment in, in criticism of the US imperial project which is the moment um, in the context of the New Deal in which the government, um, the federal government, sends artists out across the nation um, to essentially create an illustrated archive 
of what it calls American tradition. Now, of course, this is an incredibly fraught enterprise, and indeed, it's that sense of stakes that Cynthia is going to tell us about today. So I'm very happy to introduce Cynthia to you. Thank you, Dr. Reams, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers. Uh, I acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrieleño Tongva peoples, and pay my respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging. In the first quarter of the 19th century, the interior walls of the Alta California missions were brilliantly painted. These colorful designs and mural programs were reportedly produced by native artists under the direction of Spanish priests or trained painters sent from Mexico. Most of the paintings were whitewashed by that century's end. From 1936 to 1942, the Index of American Design visited several California missions and produced photographs, drawings, and watercolors of extant and restored mural programs, as well as designs they discovered under layers of plaster. The Index, as I will refer to the project from this point on, was established as a branch of the Works Progress Administration's Federal Art Project in 1935. In 1918, the American literary critic Van Wyck Brooks had called for a usable past for the nation, a non-European, self-constructed cultural memory that might produce a more democratic future. Adopting this phrase as their tagline, the index sought to provide a visual reference a catalog of designs from the past that would inspire a distinctly American modern art. Approximately 100 artists and photographers were sent to 36 states to select and illustrate examples of American folk and decorative arts. In their aim of identifying a usable past, the index sought to transform the Spanish, Mexican, and native designs they found at the missions into modern national motifs. Today I summarize a key chapter of my dissertation, which explains the index's appropriation and recreation of the native designs specifically. Drawing from research conducted at the National Gallery of Art, where the index's materials are housed, I demonstrate how this federal project has influenced our contemporary understandings of both the designs and the native cultures that may have produced them. To reveal the co-option and commodification of these designs in the New Deal era, my initial method involved a decolonial reading of the index archive and visual documents. However, this was not enough. The study of these designs from a native perspective is long overdue. Thus, my paper today includes the voices of tribal nation representatives who led me to explore the native agency, intention, reception, and resistance of these images, both in the mission era and into the present. These contemporary perspectives help me to recognize the significant relationship between temporality and nationalism. The index's construction of a usable past also required a keen manipulation of the nation's art historical present and future. In this construction, they ignored the native conceptions of time, so central to the interpretation of the original designs, a situation illustrated in two case studies I will present shortly. Between 1769 and 1823, the Spanish Franciscan Junipero Serra and his successors founded a chain of 21 Catholic missions in Alta California. Most of the original adobe mission structures were rebuilt in stone by the early 19th century. But after the secularization of the missions in the 1830s, the stone churches and their visual programs fell into ruin. By the late 19th and early 20th centuries, preservation efforts had begun, but interest in mission art and architecture was for the most part a regional one. Much of their early literature on the wall paintings emphasizes their touristic and commercial value to the new state of California and its Spanish fantasy heritage. 
In the 1990s, California mission art historian Norman Neuerberg compiled an illustrated inventory of the known wall painting designs, with an emphasis on identifying their European sources. In 2010, the Getty published a fine volume on California mission art and architecture. The section on mission wall painting celebrated the index project and relied on its unsupported attributions and interpretations. The historiography of Novo Hispanic mission art has evolved since the early 20th century, but recently expanded notions on hybridity, mimicry, and acculturation have not yet been used to unpack the multivalence and significance of the California wall paintings. In fact, their study has remained grounded in the art historical framework of the 1930s. I seek to represent the original designs as part of an indigenous archive and system of knowledge, a project which adds depth and complexity, as well as a counter-narrative to the national one created by the index. Between 1797 and 1820, Tongva, Chumash, and Tataviam speakers of various lineages were pulled from their villages and enslaved at the San Fernando Mission. This multi-ethnic population came to be known as Fernandinho. The native populations at Mission San Luis Rey and the nearby Azistencia at Pala came to be known collectively as Luiseño, which included the Quechnawichom and their neighboring cultural groups, Cupeño, Coila, and Kumayay. Though their regional, linguistic, and political histories varied, the native peoples of Southern California shared a long tradition of painted images. The painting of rocks, caverns, floors, and bodies served as a means of accessing and shaping the sacred. Many of the geometric designs painted on rock mirror those found on native California baskets. By the 1930s, archaeologists had recorded some of these rituals and designs, many of which survived into the mission and post-mission eras. However, the index artists arrived with little or no information on the native peoples whose designs they would spend so much time re recreating. In line with the New Deal emphasis on cataloging and indexing American culture, the artists and their supervisors understood their task to be a documentarian one. They sought to meticulously record the designs, creating trompe l'oeil renderings to be contributed to the national catalog. In 1936, a team of index artists were sent to Mission San Fernando, where they began to document various mission designs, but from the outset, their project here took on a new dimension. In the process of preparing the walls of the Padres' house for repainting, a piece of crumbling plaster fell, exposing earth-colored designs and, pig and patterns. The artist explorers, as, as they came to be called by their supervisor, continued to chip away plaster, revealing an underlayer of more colorful designs, which they attributed to native artists. So in California, the project had expanded from straightforward documentation to the tasks of discovery, recovery, historical research, and recreation. National Project Director Holger Cahill had envisioned the index as, quote, a kind of archaeology, end quote, the short quote a quest to unearth and record what he loosely described as the indigenous arts of the nation. The physical discovery at San Fernando of supposedly Native American wall paintings under several thick layers of plaster was perfectly suited to this archaeological metaphor. Cahill had earlier made the decision to exclude Native American designs from the index project. But in a public relations sense, this discovery at San Fernando was too good to ignore. The team's work here was considered the state's most valuable contribution to their, their national project. The San Fernando story and images were heavily promoted, not only in the California Index's official reports to DC, but in newspapers, radio shows, and exhibitions. A doorway leading into the convento at San Fernando featured designs that the index artist honed in on. 
Artist Jeffrey Holt was assigned this subject, and he did at least two renderings of it. Oops. In both, an arch above the doorway is decorated with a row of triangles or half diamonds. Directly above the arch, a man dressed in a deer suit aims a bow and arrow toward a deer whose, pier whose pierced chest drips with blood. Such scenes, which the index interpreted as depictions of Indian life, led a supervisor to wonder, quote, could the thoughts of this primitive Indian tribe be discovered? Were they fully Latinized, or did they persist in expressing their own ideas and favorite designs? End quote. A comparison of Holt's two renderings reveals key differences. In one of them, he has made an effort to show the state of ruin of the architectural elements and the painted designs themselves. The second rendering does not show the effects of time. The designs are more precise, as if more recently painted. The index's mission watercolors portray, but rarely differentiate, various temporal phases. One, the state of the wall before chipping away the plaster, two, what they found under the plaster, or three, a blueprint for restoration. Index supervisors called the third category restoration drawings, attempts to illustrate the designs as they imagined they had originally appeared. Commenting on the museum's role in restoring America's ancient ruins, well-known theorist Benedict Anderson explained that, quote, if the museum process is to be an effective nation-building strategy, it must leave no trace of itself. The process must be invisible so that the restored objects appear to have always been as they are presently observed to be." End quote. Likewise, in the index's written reports, it is unclear which historical moment is being described, resulting in a conflation of the original native designs with the 1930s recreations. Invisibility and an ambiguous chronology were crucial to the index's process of nationalization. The deer motif was entered into the national record as a representation of both mission era and more significantly, prehistoric native hunting practices in this region. This simple interpretation served the index well. Their interest in wall painting is related to a broader search undertaken by 20th century American artists and intellectuals for an artistic heritage comparable to Europe's prehistoric cave paintings. They believe their discovery to be, at least indirectly, the American equivalent of Lescaux and Altamira. Their conclusions are reminiscent of an interpretive stumbling block faced by early 20th century scholars of Paleolithic European cave paintings. It was only in the uh, 1980s and 1990s uh, that theories related to shamanism and hallucinated visions began to emerge. David Whitley applied these ideas to his studies of petroglyphs in Baja California, which bear comparison with the so-called deer hunt painting at San Fernando. He notes that in the Baja imagery, deer appear as spirit helpers, which a shaman can transform himself into. Portals into rock houses are often guarded by rattlesnakes, uh, represented by diamond and zigzag patterns. Following Whitley, historian Lisbeth Haas concluded that the bowman at San Fernando represents a metaphor for entering a trance state. But what did all this mean in the space of the friar's convento? I recently viewed the deer hunt scene with Caroline Ward Holland, a representative of the Fernandeño Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. She accepts Haas's interpretation, but adds a reading that connects past and present. She said, this is medicine from the ancestors. They were and are still showing us the way out of the mission. It is not an actual deer hunt, it is a warning. We are the hunted. Fernandeño Tatavian president Rudy Ortega Jr. said that the diamonds are a symbol of power and divinity, and the half diamonds around the doorway are a symbol of connecting to the sacred. 
the Hegelian-based Western art historiography that both the index and early mission art historians relied on limited their temporal perception of the painted walls to a series of synchronic states, layered chronologically one upon and after the other. The index believed that through modern archaeology and their objective documentation, the native designs could be revealed to the nation with their meanings still fixed in prehistory. But the indigenous peoples of California have a worldview that is incompatible with linear progression. Thus, their contemporary interpretations of designs produced during the mission era precludes the notions of fixed time, intention, and audience. In other words, designs painted in 1810 can speak to them as directly today as they were meant to speak to their ancestors in mission times. Between 1938 and 1941, the index worked at San Luis Rey, uh, the mission, and its nearby Asistencia, San Antonio de Pala. Following earlier attributions, the 2000 Getty publication states that paintings in the chapel were almost certainly executed um, and designed by the Luiseno artist working under only minimal supervision from the fathers at Mission San Luis Rey. Visitors to the chapel at Pala today are greeted by a sign that vaguely exp explains the chapel's restoration history. We're told that we will see a replication of original murals painted by Indian artist Antonio Lugo. The situation, of course, is more complicated. Part of the index's work at Pala was not only to correct inconsistencies in the modern restorations, but to reveal the political web in which they occurred. Already in disrepair by the 1840s, an earthquake in 1899 further damaged the chapel. The murals remained in decent condition considering. The California Landmarks Club, headed by LA Times reporter Charles Lummis, restored the chapel in 1901 and 1902. In exactly the same years, neighbors of the Luiseno, the Cupeño, were being forcibly relocated to Pala after being expelled from Warner's Ranch, a semi-reservation near their homeland. Their removal was the result of a Supreme Court decision which Lummis had publicly battled. And when their expulsion was inevitable, he suggested that they be re relocated to the mission at Pala, which he had already been working to restore. According to Lummis, his team worked painstakingly to preserve the Indian murals in the chapel, but their efforts were in vain. In this 1916 book, Picturesque Paula, a mission historian reported that in 1903, a priest painted over the ancient decorations. And he writes, this was another white man's affront, which caused irritation and bitterness that required many months to assuage. So it was into this situation that the index entered the picture in the late 1930s. In their research notes attached to the backs of these drawings, they cited the 1903 whitewashing story, including a 1915 account by Charles Saunders who said, quote, the priest's interest in Aboriginal art was on par with that of the old Spaniards who made bonfires of Aztec hieroglyphics. Perhaps time will eventually bring them to light again, like writing on a palimpsest. The necessity of time's passage, as well as the index's historical position within the right time, the 1930s, is key. Since the closing of the American frontier, historians had begun to consider American art in terms of chronological phases of youth, formative years, and maturity. The New Deal era marked a new stage of the nation's artistic development, with the Depression as its catalyst. While the index project at San Fernando was centered on the process of uncovering and revealing a national prehistory, they took their role at Paula to be more about correcting previous mistakes in co constructing this chronology, and thus creating a more authentic native past than their predecessors had. In a late 
20th century National Gallery catalog, a curator noted that the whitewashing actually preserved the native designs. The idea that the modern aesthetic could inadvertently preserve its own roots is an interesting contemporary appendix to the index's nationalist conception of a stratified art history. By reframing the 1903 whitewashing as an act of protection, the priest's affront to the native people at Pala is erased. Following their visits to the missions, the index produced Mission Motifs, a set of prints to be used as a design source book for modern American artists. Through achronic assemblage, the history of each mission is reduced to one page of streamlined modern designs. In another index folio of designs from each mission, we see one selected and simplified from the Paula watercolors that I just showed you. These index publications, meant to serve as the summary and conclusion of their California project, are visual representations of the writing of mission art history from the US perspective. Abstracted, aestheticized, removed from native time, experience, and meaning. For too long, California mission art studies have relied on a temporal model that is not well suited to decolonial theories and purposes. I draw from the ideas of Amy Buono and Deepesh Chakrabarti, who argue that art historians, in their studies of objects produced in colonial context, must attend to diachronic processes and focus on the ontological now. A model for this is the work of the late Luisenio artist, James Luna. His 2005 installation, a ch chapel for Pablo Tac was a space to honor the 19th century Luiseño scholar who recorded a dictionary and history of his people in 1835. As Lisbeth Haas explains, Tac's writings highlight a shamanic concept of power. Like his ancestors, Luna returned to the painted designs to trigger memory and reactivate this power. The nave of the chapel is lined with a white cloth painted with cross and diamond patterns, which Luna said were inspired by the wall painting program at Paula. Like the index, he has selected and abstracted elements of the original native designs, but by rendering them on cloth rather than the surface of the wall, they become transparent, unfixed, always suggesting the presence of the layers of history and meaning beneath them. Through their various manifestations, the original wall paintings, the index's visual documentation, modern restorations, and these contemporary native interpretations and appropriations, like Luna's, the California mission designs continue to experience an afterlife that defies both colonial and national temporalities. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, Kristen, and Cynthia for three really rich and engaging papers. Uh, I invite you to return to the stage now along with Elizabeth Cameron, who will moderate our discussion and question and answer session. Elizabeth is professor and departmental chair at the Department of History of Art and Visual Culture at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her specialty is the arts and visual cultures of Central Africa especially those of the peoples of the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia, with an emphasis on women's arts and visual cultures, missionary and colonial architecture, and issues of colonialism, post-colonialism, and iconoclasm. Welcome. Thank you. Do I have to turn this on? Thank you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to um, moderate this panel. I had the privilege last night of sitting with Rebecca, and uh, we were talking about what a, what a privilege it is to um, help mentor the oncoming um, 
new art historians. Um, so I'd like to thank Rebecca and Mary and the rest of the staff, Jennifer, um, and many others for sponsoring this. And we were also talking about how with an open call to nine universities, you get nine papers. Um, and then you have to divide them into three panels. And how do you do that? How do you create panels where there's some resonance between the papers? Um, and I think Rebecca has done a remarkable job of trying to find commonalities in these very uh, different topics and presentations. Um, and so I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just reflect for a moment on the way that the papers that they heard this morning resonated with their own work. And I did warn them ahead of time, so they've had some time to think about it as they were listening to the other papers. So should we start with Cynthia? Sure. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your papers. And even though um, Dr. Cameron did give us a warning this morning. I hadn't heard the papers yet, so okay. <laughs> um, so I'm still kind of composing some of my thoughts. But one of the one of the first things I could say that unifies, or so something that was in common between the three, was, had to do with the power of design, color, and design, and how design can be a carrier, perhaps in some cases more so than a, than a full program of painting or textile, the designs themselves, the colors, the composition, the, um, the, they become a, a means of expressing identity or, and they seem to be a more permanent way of capturing those, you know, those essences of, um, you know, multi, the different cultures, the diverse cultures that were involved in their production of the Wari and the, um, the Sapur designs that you discussed. I know that's pretty vague, but that's kind of one thing that I saw that was helpful for me to, to, be, to be thinking about the way that you address that. And that it's more than on the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I divided um, our papers together more as um, I really saw the relationship with the subpoers with that idea of really expressing your social identity through cloth and the Indies are really a textile based society. Um, it is really at the center of any type of uh, expression there so um, that seemed quite obvious and um, with you Cynthia um, I saw more um, that I would say historiography uh, behind the collection and recording of uh, indigenous uh, objects and motifs, um, that eraser of the past. And also I was um, very interested at the end by um, the motif that you showed that were printed um, by the index and how they ma were made straight and perfectly um, you know, symmetrical, et cetera. And really it seemed that it was that erasure, actually, of the hint of the artist, which I, I thought was very interesting. I think, Cynthia, there was a word that you used, um, counter-narrative, that I think spoke to all three of our papers. Um, and so with yours, um, I thought that in your presentation, you had a lot of reading against the grain of the, um, a lot of the accounts, which is really great, um, as well as just trying to highlight the perspectives of the native artists as well. And Louise, with your paper, um, one of the words that really struck me was standardization. And so just reading Wari art um, as very diverse and complex. Um, and then I guess in thinking of my own work as counter-narrative, trying to really shift readings of Lesop as this very elegant, extravagant um, group that relies on access. And so I think that's one of the things all our papers are trying to do. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think that gives some basis for questions from the audience. Did anybody have questions? Yes. Is there a mic? Or yes, there is. Who has the mic? Does she go to the mic or does the mic come to her? I think the mic is coming to you. There we go. Well, while the mic's coming to her, 
Um, one of the things I was also impressed by in all three papers was the focus on the body in different ways. Um, and I thought that was an interesting resonance between the papers. Okay, great. Um, I loved all of your papers. Thank you so much for being here today and presenting these artworks that are generally not um, presented in our uh, survey classes and providing them for students, so I thank you for that. Um, my question is for Kristen. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how the subpairs and the women especially, how they were speaking about what they're trying to do with their, like we asked them questions specifically, what, what's your goal here? What are you trying to present? I think you've done a fantastic job of articulating how your work is creating an intervention of presenting labor and how we can understand this up. But then we specifically asked them in Congo, like, what would you tell Americans? who are trying to view this app. So I thought um, it'd be great if you could summarize some of their answers. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Carly, for your question. Um, so we, we spoke to both men and women who were suppers. Um, and in our conversations, um, we told them that a lot of the images that we receive of Congo in the United States in particular are images of poverty and internal conflict and disease, especially with the Ebola outbreak and the measles outbreak. And so, and then another image that we get is of suppers, and so those imagey, images are very um, disparate in their representation of Congo. And so <laughs> a lot of the suppers that we talked to were saying that just think of, when you think of Congo, think of suppers, and think of it as this very diverse um, country. Because even in my research on Kinshasa, all I got were articles on Ebola, and Ebola was occurring on the you know, the other side of the country. And so a lot of the suppers were saying, there's no Ebola here. Like, we should, you know, come here to Congo so you can actually experience what it's like rather than just relying on the news for images of Congo. Um, I believe there's a question here and then right behind him. Uh, I, I just wanted to propose maybe another commonality between the three papers, which was uh, the issue of time or temporality, um, because it seemed like all three were, uh, in a certain way, breaking with a more traditional or Eurocentric attitude towards how we order art historical progressions. You know, there's, uh, in the case of the Wari, you know, there's um, a kind of deep time that's on some level you know, we, we have no written records from this culture, so it's kind of, we have to use what's available to us, which in part uh, means uh, using contemporary native textile traditions uh, that goes into that. Um, in Cynthia's paper, you know, there's this uh, entirely other kind of attitude towards time. And uh, with the sapeurs, you know, there's uh, this fact that this culture has been around for you know well over 50 years, but then there's this kind of emergence into a global view that's happened very recently, uh, and has maybe have a kind of, had a kind of distorting effect. So I, th I thought it was interesting in all three cases how um, the the papers um, wanted to resist that kind of um, ordering, temporalizing uh, imperative that's kind of at the basis of art history and do something a little different. So that's a very open-ended observation, not really a question. But if anyone had thoughts about that, I'd be curious. <laughs> Cynthia. Uh, I'm, I, do want, I would like to comment on that. Uh, it, this is one of the areas in which I think I've received the most sort of pushback, that's been the most challenging um, from just conversations with colleagues and, and other symposia and, and format um, or venues that where I have kind of presented this I, this information of kind of disrupting this synchronic or this chronology um, particularly in regards to using looking at contemporary native interpretations so the question that I you know usually what someone asks is well Cynthia that was really interesting but do you really think that asking a Native American person today, is that really going to help us understand? Is that really art history? Yeah. Um, 
so I, I argue, yes, we have, you know, but, but it, it, is, it has been a challenge to try to, especially as a non-native, not a part of the community, to, to be the one to try to reinsert these images back into native time. Um, so did, have any of you had any kind of challenges with that or? Um, I mean, it's more of a comment, but I completely understand that aspect. And of course, like it, for me, it is very important to work with descendant communities. And of course, there are challenges with like direct historical approach. And I don't think we are equating contemporary people with exactly what happened in the past. Um, but also in the end is there's this complex, uh, this concept as well of cyclical time where the past is meant to be repeated. So I think it's very important to keep that in mind and it, we should definitely include that in our scholarship. Did you wanna, no? <laughs> okay, uh, here. Hello. Um, thank you all. I, I'd like to thank you all for presenting your papers and for allowing us to uh, better understand uh, these makers and these artworks in a way that is uh, kind of recontextualizing their history and avoiding what may be mixed construed uh, interpretations of them. I had a specific question for Kristen. Um, when you were connecting the Saper uh, way of being and the culture to ballroom culture, I almost instantaneously thought of the uh, FX series Pose and how there's this uh, popularization or rather this introduction of ballroom culture. Um, also thinking about the documentary Paris is Burning, um, there's this introduction of this uh, formerly underground culture to mainstream culture uh, using social media and then also these, uh, these films and documentaries. So how would at all, um, do you think that your point or your work is being supported by the popularization or the understanding of these communities, especially ballroom culture, um, to other folks? So do you find that it's supported at all by uh, this larger understanding of what these underground communities uh, exist as and have operated as? Mm -hmm. And so I think the proliferation of images and videos, both on LASAP and um, ballroom culture, are key in really just showing to the world that these underground cultures do exist. And so I think in one sense, it is good that they are bring, being brought to the mainstream. However, there is this danger that scholars have also articulated that they can become misrepresented or appropriated in um, inappropriate ways. Um, and so it just really depends. Um, and so with my scholarship, I hope to really get the perspectives of suppers today, um, just so I can hopefully give a reading that is what they, well, their words rather than my own or other scholars' interpretations. Um, I believe there's a mic right here. Oh, yeah. And then there was one in the back row right there. Uh, hello, I'd like to thank you guys for your time as well. Um, I had a question for um, Kurt, Kristen as well. Um, I was like, could you illuminate kind of, you touched on it a little bit about how the indigenous cultures of the people were interacting with like the idea of being a support, a support especially with uh, Mama Africa and her raising her kids and things like that. That's kind of a very indigenous, like that their way of thinking and their moral beliefs. I was wondering if you can kind of like, not give another example, but just like shed light on like how their, um, their actual culture has like mingled in with this culture of being a support as well. So like of either idea of working or just like taking care of the family, like how is that kind of intermingled with the idea of being a support as well? Mm -hmm. And so in my conversations with women suppers, um, some of them have told me that they have been criticized for being a supper because their critics believe that they should be working at home and that it's very inappropriate for them to be working in the street. And so for critics, the job of Congolese women in particular is to, you know, take care of the house, take care of the children, raise the children, tend to the husband. Um, and so being a supper, from what I understand from conversations with women who are suppers, is that it's a very radical choice because they are subject to more criticism than men are. Um, one of the women did say that um, there are um, familial obligations that both men and women suppers have to fulfill, um, but really women are the ones who are under scrutiny more than men for that. And then here in the back, and then over here, next. Yes, it's very enlightening presentations, but in particular, Cynthia, um, 
I wanted to ask a question and make a comment. Are you familiar with the California Missions Foundation? Yes, I, uh, I am familiar. Okay, and, and at, at, you, know, the, you may know that the, this year's conference is happening uh, this month in mm -hmm. Monterey. Are you by any chance speaking there? I am not, no, I will, I won't that, be. That, that's unfortunate, I'll put in a plug, because uh, over the years I have attended a number of these conferences, and one of the things that the plus side is the emphasis on indigenous cultures, contemporary and historical, uh, which is enlightening uh, as, as time goes by. And, uh, and, but I have never heard a presentation like yours this morning at any of the conferences. And I, and, and, and I met Norm Nuremberg many years ago when he was working at the new church in um, San Juan Capistrano. And, and not doing what you're, you know, it's like duplicating not, not the true historic, but the implied historic, correct? Well, anyway. He really uh, laid the groundwork, he did, yes. Y yes, yeah, so anyway, this is, this is something I will, I will bring to their attention, because I think a presentation by you would be most enlightening and contemporary. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Oh, goodness, we have lots of questions. Here? Oh, you've got, you've got the mic, go, go for it. Um, hi, I wanted to say thank you all for your time and presenting your work. And I have a specific question for Luis. Um, I know that in the history of pre-Columbian art, there is kind of a legacy of the unnamed artist. And you mentioned that on a lot of the Wari ceramics there, or a few of the Wari ceramics, there are physical inscriptions that um, point to ownership. And so I wanted to ask you, how do these physical inscriptions, how do they interact with the legacy of the unnamed artist or the anonymous artist? Thank you for your question. So unfortunately, I think that um, the few marks that I have seen, like the one I showed, are more marks of um, uh, people who own them, marks of ownership, in that they were made after the ceramic was fired, um, and quite in a crude way, which would be quite uh, surprising coming from the artist. Um, but I, and this is pretty specific to one site, but I really hope that we can find more. And overall, yeah, it really points to that idea that artists, I, I do think it doesn't have to be in writing. There is a way to, to express your own um, identity and your own approach to the object through, through the work. We could give it to Mary. Thank you so much for these. Um, is this on? Yeah, these enlightening uh, talks this morning. Um, given the stage of your work and the stage of the work of so many people who are in the audience today, I wondered, and the fact that um, performance, a single object, an archive, you've come to very different kinds of sources for the work that you've presented today. Could you tell us, uh, and I, I think of this particularly because I'm, I'm afraid that one of those messages that people often get is, well, all the good topics have already been taken. Uh, and almost all of us have, in this room have heard that at some point, oh, that's already been worked on. Uh, uh, how, how is it that you've come to this topic? And I think that's enlightening for our, our symposium today. And if we could just go down the road like we did at the beginning? Uh, yes, it, well, before I came to UC Riverside, before I started the uh, PhD program, I had been studying 18th century Mexican, Mexican colonial paintings that were sent to the missions from Mexico City. And so I really wasn't expecting to delve into the 1930s and to start looking at the missions from, you know, through this lens. Uh, I received a travel grant through, um, through the department uh, and went to just something I had been curious about. I had read about it here and there about the index. I had seen some of their beautiful watercolors published in the Getty um, publication and a few, other, um, a few other places. I had seen one in person. And I decided, so I used that, I kind of just took a leap, really, and I thought, you know, I'm going to use this opportunity, this, to, this, this grant, to go to D.C. and just dig into that archive. And 
I haven't left, so I'm really glad. I mean, sometimes it just take, I, for me it was scary <laughs> to kind of move out of my comfort zone of the you know, late colonial period. Um, because I've really had to kind of catch up on the modern and, you know, and, and the 20th century um, historiography. But, so that's the story of how I had to, it was basically just, and, and I knew that um, in the first visit to the index, to looking at the archives at the Index of American Design, I could see the excitement in the staff Yes, of course. No one has looked. Oh, no one has looked at this, and it was wonderful opening up some of these, and like the rubber bands and the clips were still like from the 1940s when they had first kind of sealed these away. People hadn't looked at this, so that's how I also kind of got really excited that no one has looked at this. So that's so I, I, I've decided to to continue. Um, personally, I got into the arts of the Americas through the Mayas, uh, but then um, I, I saw that uh, Wari ceramic uh, in a book and tried to find more information and could not find anything because there's been very little work done um, on the Wari, especially by art historians. Um, and then when I got to Peru for the first time, um, getting to actually see archaeological collections, which had not been curated um, for a museum, uh, but actually really what was found there. I was really struck by the diversity of these artworks and really how it challenges those narratives that we get about this culture needs exactly those specific motifs and uh, specific characteristics to be identified and really giving more agency to, to these groups. So. <laughs> so I think there are, for me, multiple factors that really have led me to research on the Sippers. Um, I think the earliest influence was um, my older sister. She got her PhD at UC Riverside. She specialized in Victorian literature. And so growing up, she would give me Victorian novels that I would then devour. <laughs> and I got really interested in these um, Victorian novels, the figure of the dandy, especially in Oscar Wilde's works. Um, and then when I was an undergrad, I started off as an art major. And our professor in our beginning sculpture class had us watch Art 21 the PBS Art 21 episodes, and one of the episodes I watched was on um, Inka Shonabare, who is the uh, artist born in Lagos, or um, grew up in Lagos and now works and resides in London. Um, and his work really delves with um, the issues in Victorianism. He also highlights himself as a dandy in some of his photographic work. And when I was an undergrad, I did my undergraduate thesis on two of his photographic series in which he poses himself as a Victorian dandy. And when I got to um, UC Santa Cruz, um, when it was time to figure out what I wanted to do for my research, um, I expressed to Elizabeth that I wanted to continue um, exploring the figure of the black dandy in particular. And she showed me images of suppers. And so that's how I got here. Thank you. All right. Um, OK, right here. <laughs> Hi. Thanks very much to the Getty for organizing this and to the excellent speakers. Will the lectures be available online? Uh, Rebecca? Yes, they will. They yes, they will. But they're live right now. Yeah. <laughs> but they're also archived, correct? Yes. And they could get them through. Okay, so they'll go online to Getty EDU in a couple of months to the um, program went to the, same event page. to the event page, so they will be available. So thank I have, you. Uh, two questions. I want to thank the uh, panelists uh, for their papers. For Cynthia, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, how you differ from what earlier was a critique of the entire field of anthropology for, in a sense, uh, reifying uh, the native, you know, as a kind of eternal uh, creature outside of time, and that, you know, living people were supposedly, uh, you know, repeating uh, knowledge, and the field of anthropology has been uh, in some ways devalued for exactly what uh, you are doing, it seems to me. So how do you separate yourself from that critique uh, 
uh, of anthropology, and also if time and ideas of temporality is a cosmology, and if Western chronology represents one kind, uh, what does this represent? If this is an alternative uh, cosmology, uh, you know, indigenous uh, North American uh, native temporality, then what is it? That is definitely something I'm, I have found, I'm still finding challenging and I'm still working through. It, I, see, I have found myself just in, in my writing of this chapter, sort of contradicting myself, you know, kind of moving in different directions and sometimes falling into that, um, doing exactly what the index was doing. You know, repeating it. Like in some, in many ways, my my project is as much a continuation as it is a critique of their project, because I, you know, I am trying to, oh, by inserting, taking, you know, taking the lead in rethinking this. Oh, I'm sorry about that. If you didn't hear what I said before, I said, you know, that I, I, I do feel that it's something that I, um, I haven't quite figured out yet. When I see, I can critique the index for coming up with this very ambiguous temporality and thinking that's okay, right? It's okay because that's part of their national project. So I'm critical of that. But then I wonder if what I'm doing by saying, oh, okay, well, we can kind of open it up to native time, we can go back and forth. I'm sort of suggesting that it's okay for native people to do that, but not for the index to do that. And I think that's what you're saying about anthropology too. So yeah, I'm still, that's, that's something I'm working on. And can I just follow up with Christine? You know, you, um, if, uh, I wondered about the idea of uh, something that's gendered going back and forth between Africa and Europe? And did you find changes in terms especially about, we've mentioned ballroom culture and especially the question of homosexuality. I'm familiar with Stromae's work and he's very influenced by Congolese. He's uh, Belgian, but influenced, he says, by Congolese uh, you know, culture. And um, he is, you know, presents himself as bisexual, et cetera. And I wonder in a, in a country where, um, you know, homosexuals don't have civil rights of certain kinds, does this uh, culture of the sapeur, which is associated in America, the ballroom culture, et cetera, with gay culture, is there a trans, a different relationship of it in Africa? Or is it performing a kind of uh, not only gender performance, but a sexualized performance that is problematic as well? Um, there definitely is um, a huge difference. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, in Congo society, there is still definitely an enormous stigma against um, the LGBTQI plus community. Um, and so women suppress in particular, when they are performing, are not necessarily expressing their um, sexual identities. Um, and when I conversed with them, I didn't ask them as well about what they would identify as because I wanted to also protect them in case they weren't outed at all. Um, in some interviews I've read with women suppers too, um, they've been criticized as appearing lesbian and so that still hasn't been, um, that's really indicative of not being very socially accepted. Um, but I think that comparing Lesop to ballroom culture is illuminating for my research because it really does focus on how performance can be utilized as a means of creating identity and um, sur surviving and thriving in the midst of um, hardship in life. And then. Hi. Um, it's a wonderful paper. Thank you very much. Um, I had a question related to gendered, um, gendered media and gendered ways of being, which did seem to be a sort of cross theme um, shared by your, your different papers. Um, in particular, um, I had questions for 
Louise and Cynthia about um, gendered ways of being and ritual context and the use of media. I thought you both did a wonderful job of uh, discussing the interplay of design and artistic practice across the media of textiles and pottery and wall painting, rock art, and so forth. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to ask all, um, the two of you um, was about any clues as to the gender of the artist. Um, I thought you also did a wonderful job, Louise, of discussing the designs as being embedded within the concept of a, a, a fabric structure. But um, I assume that you're talking about designs that are therefore, you know, of the feminine genesis and this being applied to other media. And um, Cynthia, um, one of the things I found really quite wonderful in your presentation was the discussion of the doorway painting with the sort of rattlesnake diamond pattern designs and the concept of the portal into the rock as a way of gaining power. Um, but as I understand Whitley's work on rock art, um, the sort of figural scenes involving the shooting of an animal and the use of deer and that concept of going into the rock is more of a male shamanistic rock art practice, whereas the um, sort of diamond back rattlesnake patterns are related to girls' initiation into puberty. So I wanted to ask you, um, both of you, um, what are your senses of the gender identities of the artists who are working across those media? Thank you so much for bringing that up. It's not, it's something that I haven't even begun to address. Um, the, the mission records, for the most part, the, they don't list the names of these, the native artists are, mm -hmm. you know, not, there are maybe three that are, mm -hmm. that we know of or that are said to have um, worked at not just one mission, but maybe were trained there and then were sent to other missions. Mm -hmm. So we, there, there are a handful of names of male artists, male painters. Male artists. Okay. Um, it was a tradition in the, Mendic the Franciscan, but the mendicant mm -hmm. uh, missions in general in New Spain, most of the workshops were male dominated. Sure. Sure. So uh, at this point, I've just, you know, and you even saw in the diorama mm -hmm. that was produced in the 1940s, it was a male artist. So I think everyone's mm -hmm. kind of going with those, with those few. That. Um, but the rattlesnake, I had, yeah, I had read that in Whitley um, mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, specific mm -hmm. shamanistic rituals based on gender. Sure. So that would be really, really interesting for me to look further into. Thank you. Yeah, I was also curious because in the Southwest, it's the tradition for the women to do the plastering and painting of walls. So like Kiva murals and also murals... Um, and early church architecture is suspected to have maybe been done by women, but I was just curious about that. Need to do more research, I do, thank you. <laughs> okay, and, and Louise, um, do you have a sense of um, the gender of the artist you're talking about creating the pottery, or do you think that the same person was making the pot who was pa also painting the design? So that's a great question, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, so I'm currently in a seminar with my advisor, Selenair, thinking about gender because it is quite strikingly absent, I would say, from the warrior material record. But of course, again, with the problematic of using anthropology and ethnography to um, understand a bit better, weaving tends to be more of a feminine uh, craft, but at the same time, um, men learn to weave, uh, to spin at least uh, when they're young. Um, in prison, actually, they tend to weave a lot, etc. So there's a, it's never clear cut uh, definition, and uh, there's definitely um, this also distinction between the making, the shaping of the pot, and the painting, wow. and the fact that also we find very similar, uh, the same pigments, but also the same motifs sometimes from, for instance, weaving and ceramic. Um, it's definitely one of my questions. So thank. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, we have time for just for one quick question and then we're going to break. And thanks to all three speakers for uh, really engaging talks. 
Uh, this question is for Louise. I was uh, fascinated by this notion of images embedded in their structure that you introduced towards the end of your talk. And I'm wondering about how you might, uh, this is a kind of speculative hypothetical question, how you might be thinking about that in terms of the way in which you were breaking down the traditional relationship between figure and ground. Because it seemed to me like what you were suggesting is in fact a different notion of ground, one which didn't imply that kind of Euclidean plane, but might in fact be a kind of psychedelic experience in which traditional notions of figure and ground are already blended at the moment that precedes the creation of the image or figure in that environment. Um, that notion of ground might be a kind of symmetrical structure upon which variation is then introduced. Uh, so in general, just how you might be thinking about a kind of expanded or reworked notion of what ground might be in this context. Thank you. That's a very interesting and long question for me to answer, so I'll try to be as short as possible. Um, but also you do mention the psychedelic, and actually that's something I'm starting to think about, is actually how um, all these images would look like once you are under influence of anything, because I think it does change a lot. Um, but um, regarding the ground, uh, that's definitely something that I'm still working on. Um, but I do think that there is something to include also with the materiality of the object, and that's really what I'm trying to also um, take into consideration. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic back over to Rebecca. Thank you so much to our speakers and to our moderator. This was a really great first session. Uh, we're going to take a break now for lunch. I invite you to join us outside. We have a light lunch reception to which you are all invited, and we will reconvene in this space or online at 1.30 for our next session. Thank you.
Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us or rejoining us if you are with us for the morning session. I would like to welcome our next speaker and advisor pair, Jonathan Dentler, who will be introduced by Vanessa Schwartz, both joining us from the University of Southern California. Well, welcome back from lunch, everybody. And it's really a pleasure to be here and be part of this uh, symposium. And uh, I'm going to be brief and simply say that it takes a village to raise a graduate student. And by that, I mean sometimes you have to come up uh, on a hill to raise that graduate student. And so all of us at the University of Southern California are very grateful to uh, the Getty. Uh, to, to be one of our um, most important villages, and we have benefited tremendously, uh, all of us, my colleagues and uh, our students, from having this be our local hut um, to, to come and seek shelter uh, and uh, get sukkah, uh, intellectual sukkah from. But also, I really want to acknowledge as well that while I am the advisor uh, of Jonathan Dentler, uh, one of the great privileges of advising a graduate student is that you also get to know your colleagues best by having conversation with your colleagues in and through your graduate students. And so there are many people in this room that uh, I have advised uh, with Jonathan uh, Dentler as an interlocutor. So who is Jonathan Dentler? He is a historian of global visual communications and their technological and aesthetic forms. And he's completing his dissertation on the history of wire photography. And I'll be presenting a piece of that here today. Uh, that uh, uh, dissertation is being written actually in the history department at the University of Southern California. Jonathan has also completed the visual studies graduate certificate at USC. He's an honors graduate of Columbia University. He has held many fellowships and awards, including a DAAD, Dodd Fellowship for Graduate Studies in Germany, a Mellon Humanities in the Digital World Fellowship, a Terra Foundation for American Art Summer Residency in Giverny, and he's completing this dissertation this year on a Mellon Council for European Studies Dissertation Completion Fellowship. I also want to note that uh, in 2018, he published an article in Transbordeur, Photographie, Histoire et Société, which is the new photo history journal out of Lausanne. And that article is called Image câblée, la téléphotographie à l'ère de la mondialisation de la presse illustrée, wired images, telephotography in the era of the globalization of the illustrated press. So without further ado, I present Jonathan Dentler. Um, thanks, Vanessa, and thanks to Rebecca, um, Mary, and Jennifer, uh, and the whole GRI for having us. This is very uh, exciting. Uh, okay. okay. Wire service photography decisively altered the visual culture of the news by using a type of photo scanning technology similar to a fax machine to separate visual information from its material support, allowing it to travel as fast as text via radio waves and telephone wires. In History by Wire Photo, a syndicated feature article that appeared in many American newspapers on January 1st, 1955, reporter Saul Pett told the story of how AP Wire Photo made the photograph as timely as the headline, and in so doing, changed the face of journalism. Today, he began, it is commonplace for pictures to move by wire as fast as the news that they illustrate, for both to make the same addition. A negative is as breathless as a bulletin. <clears throat> and the history of wire photo is world history. Pet listed a series of epic-making press photographs sent by wire, beginning with the Hindenburg explosion in 1937 and ending with, quote, a crumpled Korean bridge sagging under the weight of fleeing war refugees. Just one and a half years after the armistice that ended hostilities, the photo to which he referred taken by AP photographer Max Desfor on December 4th, 1950, had become widely recognizable as an image that summed up the Korean War. 
Yet, when that photo was first published on December 5th, 1950, this is how it appeared. This breathless image offered the public a first glimpse into a dramatic scene bestowed with presence by radio and wire photography. Though it seems to verge on abstraction, it manages to be identifiable as a ruined bridge, with the bright white of the girders piercing up from what should have been a taut surface, now twisted into braided shapes. But for the upper left-hand quadrant, the gray tones have largely fallen out due to the radio transmission process, resulting in a bewildering manifold of white shapes and lines against black ground. The caption supplied in the St. Louis uh, Post-Dispatch fills in the narrative regarding the scene of Koreans who, quote, swarm across girders and broken spans of the Taedong River Bridge at Pyongyang as they flee and tear before advancing Chinese reds. I would suggest that this image of a shattered bridge was memorable not just because it is a powerful vision of the tragic and surrealistically confusing nature of war, Rather, as metaphor, the bridge also visualized and materialized how wire service photography used telecommunications infrastructure to stitch, bind, and link distant places into a simultaneously unfolding visible present. Wire photographs such as this forest bridge image made visible the massive and invisible organizational and infrastructural systems which increasingly knitted the world together. Such raw images were proof that whatever differences divided people, <clears throat> they would henceforth be mediated through a globe-spanning infrastructure that synchronized and visually bridged space. <clears throat> In order to understand such a claim, we must first begin as scholars to unpack informational images in their actual complexity and historical variability and examine the systems and structures that produced, transported, displayed, and stored them. In this talk, I will first take stock of why wire photography has been so overlooked and explain what it has to teach us before looking more closely at Max Desfor's Korea photos <clears throat> and how they made their way from the daily press into Edward Steichen's photo gallery at MoMA. Even more than other forms of press photography, wire photography seems guilty of all of informational image making's worst sins. Above all, its images trade quality for speed <clears throat> and are too fast for the reflective and creative processes that traditionally define artistic activity. In her work on contemporary image providers such as Agence France Presse, anthropologist Zeynep Gersel shows that wire photography services have traditionally been thought of their images as fast pictures as opposed to good pictures. Until certain technical challenges were overcome, the wire and radio photography transmission process degraded the edges and tones of the photographic image. Additionally, as Barbie Zellitzer has argued, within daily newspaper journalism itself, wire photography faced what she calls a discourse of resistance from text-focused editors through at least the 1930s, <clears throat> and picture editors for daily newspapers had less control over layout than did picture editors for magazines such as Life. In my dissertation entitled Wired Images, Visual Telecommunications, News Agencies, and the Invention of the World Picture, 1917 to 1955, I suggest that wire photography has been too quickly dismissed as simply an aesthetically poor relation of photojournalism in weekly picture periodicals. <clears throat> my point is not to assess whether these images are good or bad, but rather to attend to the ways in which they structured and conditioned a new kind of visual engagement with global events. Wire photographs were not just fast and poor, as Gersel points out. They had a complex temporality that operated along the edge of the moment at which an event first came into perceptual consciousness, often, as Pet showed, as the news itself was breaking. They provided a first glimpse of the event, charging it with excitement as a preview of later, more vivid depictions. Witnessing news coming into being as an image was a different subjective experience than reading the news or seeing it ex post facto in later pictorial representations. <clears throat> Wire photography both sutured viewers to a simultaneously occurring global present and forecasted later pictorial memorialization in slower and sharper formats. 
as events entered perception as images, they rendered the viewer breathless at the foreshortening of distance, widening the gap between what Reinhard Koselleck, in characterizing the modern experience of historical time, called the space of experience and the horizon of expectation. In this sense, wire photographs' connotative meaning was strongly associated with the collapse of geographic distance. Examining how pictures registered the traces of their movements through space in British America and the United States in the 18th and 19th centuries, Jennifer Roberts has argued that geography inhabits pictures. Vanessa Schwartz argues in Jet Age Aesthetic, The Glamour of Media in Motion, that the Jet Age Aesthetic addressed the experience of fluid motion peculiar to circulation and mobility in the post-war world. In contrast to Roberts' picture itineraries through the difficult to navigate spaces of colonial North America and the early Republic, Schwartz looks at a world in which new forms of media and transportation dematerialized experience into a system of smoothly circulating spaces, people, and images. Coming into its own between the 1920s and the advent of the Jet Age, wire photography shares aspects of both these regimes of transportation and visuality. Wire photography capitalized on its ability to separate images from their material supports as analog information, but those images tended nevertheless to visually register traces of their bumpy rides through circuits, electrical interference, and adverse weather patterns. With this in mind, we can reconsider how wire photography services such as the AP work together with figures such as Edward Steichen to create an infrastructure that bridged space so that viewers could witness distant events. The case of AP photojournalist and Tokyo Bureau picture editor Max Disfor illuminates the workings of wire photo. Disfor's years-long correspondence to his brother Irving, who worked for the AP in the organization's New York headquarters, reveals how global wire photography intersected with a broader visual cultural formation at mid-century. Born in Brooklyn, Desfors started working for the AP in 1933 as a runner boy and darkroom assistant. <clears throat> he began working as a photojournalist in the White House Press Corps and subsequently worked as a photographer and picture editor for the Navy during World War II before rejoining the AP after the war. When the Korean War broke out in 1950, his photos were crucial for AP's spot news coverage. After two of his photos inaugurated the first post-war commercial radio photo connection uh, between the United States and Japan, Irving wrote to Max that he had, quote, haunted the wire photo daily and watched the pictures avidly. Irving informed him that, quote, the papers all had the pictures and it was front page stuff, most of it. The pictures were terrific too and you seem to have had a clean scoop for I didn't see any other paratroop pictures with an opposition credit. Last Friday's issue of Life had no pictures of any sort when they could have had yours. I guess that they were still waiting for Sotrek's original negs, and it'll hit the coming issue with a great big ballyhoo. Irving was well positioned to compare the professional acknowledgement given to Max's work with that of Life photographers, because he promoted Max's pictures to photography magazines and regularly submitted portfolios to prize competitions and museums such as MoMA. In May 1951, Max and Irving's hard work paid off when Max won a Pulitzer Prize for his bridge photograph. A subsequent AP press release explained that Bill Achatz, AP Tokyo's picture editor at the time, had quickly put the picture on the radio to San Francisco after he received it by army plane from Korea. The AP wire photo cable on December 5th read, your attention is called the wire photo FX4 of today, just transmitted. An extraordinary picture of refugees climbing across Broken Bridge at Pyongyang, taken by AP photographer Max Desfor. It's one of the most unusual pictures to come out of the war. This cable reveals that certain photos were flagged as exceptional as they came off of the wire, in a sense nominating them for eventual prizes and elevation as images that would sum up events in historical memory. Four days after it first got, quote, smash play in newspapers around the country, on December 5th, it was retransmitted over the Continental Wire Photo Network from an original print that reached Seattle by air. Many versions of the photo circulated over the days, weeks, and months after it was taken, traveling in different combinations of air mail, as well as radio and wire transmission. Zeynep Gersel has argued that wire photos were trained to make images that summed up a whole event 
packing as much informational value into the image as possible. <clears throat> However, does Forest photos demonstrate that by mid-century at least, wire photography could circulate in the same venues and in similar ways to photojournalism in picture weeklies such as Life? During these years, Steichen used his position at MoMA to argue that photography's importance lay not in its status as a unique aesthetic object, but rather in how it communicated and linked the world together. At MoMA, Steichen selected certain wire photos for recirculation in more visually information-dense formats, freed from their ties to specific places and events. He featured 10 of Desfor's photographs, including the bridge photo in Korea, The Impact of War, which ran between February and April of 1951. Together with three life photographers, Desfor was one of six to whom Steichen devoted separate photo groups. The exhibition's press release disclosed that, quote, technically the photographs range from those taken automatically by gun camera to sensitively studied and carefully composed photographs by the most competent craftsmen. Steichen was attuned to the fact that press photography was not only one media, but also a circulation of images through many media. The important thing was not whether a photograph was made by a human or a machine for explicitly informational or aesthetic reasons, but rather, as Steichen commented in the press release for the exhibition, the way that, quote, photography bridges remoteness and indifference, brings and dumps a place in a moment called Korea right into our laps. One print shows hordes of people from an evacuating city crawling like ants over the smashed and twisted girders of a bombed bridge. Steichen read this forest photograph not for information about a particular event in a definite location, but for its more general message and the way that it bridged geographic distance. Steichen used the museum to both tame and tap into wire photography's potential helping spectators adapt to the new perceptual conditions created by global visual telecommunications. If the picture's thatic dimension, or its acknowledgement of its own channel of communication, had made itself felt in the wired photo as it was printed in the newspaper, this new version seems to reward close looking with smooth teleportation across time and space, almost as in jet travel. In his syndicated column, Camera News, Irving echoed Steichen, writing that the picture's collective impact was, quote, <clears throat> best evidenced by the solemnity with which crowds of visitors slowly make the rounds. These pictures are anything but static. To study these pictures intently is to be transported to the scene and the moment. The bridge of radio and wire disappeared in order to allow a bombed bridge in Korea to appear. The visual metaphor for photojournalism's effort to bridge space gave way to an allegory of human suffering. It would be easy to read Steichen's and Irving's statements back once again through notions of the camera's mechanical recording function, but this would be to miss the way that wire photography bridged a distance and generated a transporting sense of presence for the viewer. Images moved the viewer from the breathless excitement of the first tentative perception of an event difficult to see clearly and still hot off the wire, to this more organized and even solemn extended looking. Certainly most visitors to the exhibition would have been aware uh, that Desforce photographs had been printed as radio photos initially, and many had likely seen this first version of the photos themselves in their daily newspapers. <clears throat> but to what extent this earlier agitated and anticipatory act of looking either informed or lay dormant during the second calmer viewing is difficult to determine. The important point is that viewers were learning to toggle between seeing the material infrastructure that undergirded global media and the dematerialized teleportation afforded by sharper media forms in which the channel did not make itself apparent, back and forth between the bridge as wire and the bridge as bridge. As this media ecology developed, daily newspapers began to transform the way in which they displayed wire photographs, in essence nominating certain wire photos for later recirculation. Take for example another of Desfor's photos featured in Korea, The Impact of War. This photo functioned well as both a wire photo and a print on the museum wall in that it did not depend on fine gradations of light for its impact. The two small holes and pair of frostbitten hands are nearly black against the snow, and the photo lost relatively little detail in transmission, 
as is evident in this reproduction in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Such may have been Desfour's intention in making a photo with strong light and dark tones. Beginning in the late 1930s, photojournalism textbooks recommended this technique to wire photographers. <clears throat> By this time, daily newspapers such as the Inquirer began running picture pages of radio and wire photos that included short photo titles that summed up their information and allegorized their meaning, much as Steichen would do with his titles for the different sections of the family of man. Indeed, in 1953, Kathleen Haven of MoMA's Department of Photography wrote to Max that, quote, the recent press photographer's exhibition in San Francisco included one of your photographs entitled Futility, Dead Hands Through Snow, and that the Department of Photography would like a print for possible inclusion in the Family of Man exhibition. Although the photo was not ultimately selected for the Family of Man, the episode demonstrates the way in which photos that received smash play off the wire could pass from the daily press onto museum walls. <clears throat> when Max took over as AP Tokyo picture editor in the spring of 1951, he had to work on a grueling 24-7 schedule that he called working on Tokyo time. Lack of sleep was nothing new in wire service photography, but due to the very large time zone differences between Tokyo and other news capitals such as London and New York, managing radio photos through Tokyo upped the ante as never before. At AP Tokyo's offices on the sixth floor of the Asahi Shimbun building in the Ginza neighborhood, the work of the picture staff was never done. And let's see. That's, that's Max up there at his desk. Uh, the AP's internal staff publication carried photos of the office, which included one showing the photo workroom with the radio photo receiver in the corner it left. As Nadia Baer argues in The Decisive Network, Magnum Photos and the Post-War Image Market, to be published this May with UC Press, news photography was produced through networks of office staff, editors, and museum curators. Networks were essential to wire, wire photography services as well, and picture editors played a vital role by managing the flow of photos off of the wire. When Irving asked Max why he subjected himself to such a brutal work regime, he responded, it gives me a great deal of satisfaction. I know, for instance, that again, I've managed to beat the opposition to the radio station. I know that clicking along at top speed, I've still managed to tie up every little detail and loose end. I get a thrill in knowing that our good pictures get into the papers ahead of the others, and in some cases, the opposition doesn't even get into print at all because we outstrip them so much. Something like a machine himself, clicking along at top speed, Desfour was able to master detail and organization to get the radio photos out first. Without this logistical network, pictures might never even make it into newspapers in the first place, no matter how sensitively arranged their composition or how subtle their gradations of tone. In a number of ways, wire photography clarifies the emergence of a visual regime that we now associate with digital images and can be regarded as a key historical episode in the development of what W.J.T. Mitchell has called iconomania. In Bending the Frame, <clears throat> Fred Richen argues that the digital media revolution threatened photojournalism's more highly crafted pictures by increasing the speed at which images circulate. However, wire photography demonstrates that both the conditions that Richen diagnoses as a product of the digital, as well as many of his proposed solutions, have mid-century analog precedents. As Robert Harriman and John Lucades have argued, Digitization is helping us to see analog photography anew and making an older critical discourse that characterized photography as a discrete medium by its indexicality seem particularly exhausted. Wire photography operated on the tantalizing edge of what was seeable as a degraded copy that traded quality for speed. Today, a seemingly endless stream of what Hito Stero has referred to as the poor image accompanies us wherever we go. <clears throat> Yet while Sterl focuses on how digital images degrade as a result of recirculation and compression, wire photography hurtled poor images around the world at high velocity during press photography's analog age. Precisely because this first impression was hazy and indistinct, it simultaneously made something else visible the infrastructural effort that undergirded photojournalism itself. 
As media theorists such as John Durham Peters have pointed out, infrastructure's typical mode is to withdraw from view, and it is frequently concealed by design. Today's digital bridges tend to catch our attention only when they break down. But at mid-century, fast images made telecommunications visible and became part of a media ecology that helped spectators adjust to conditions of global connectedness. Jennifer Roberts has argued that the advent of telegraphy in the 19th century made the visual arts conspicuously weighty and slow in comparison to words. Their materiality meant that pictures were resistant to code and transmission. <clears throat> in the 20th century, the wired image bridged the gap that telegraphy had opened up between the textual and the visual, and artistic responses to this new condition, such as Steichen's exhibitions, but also developments in painting exemplified by Gerhard Richter and Andy Warhol's paintings of press images or Sigmar Polka's raster builder, and I think the list could go on and on, ought to be seen through this development. <clears throat> by acting as the perceptual horizon of world events, the first rush of sense data that would become more organized and vivid as it recirculated, Wire photography concretized the promise that soon transportation and media would link spectators into an integrated and synchronized global unity. In so doing, it proposed that the aesthetic could be packaged as information and suggested an informational aesthetic. Continuing on our theme of the global circulation of photographic images, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Shivani Sood. Shivani is a PhD candidate in the History of Art Department at UC Berkeley, where she's currently writing her dissertation on court painting in 19th century India, supported by fellowships from the American Institute of Indian Studies, the Fulbright, the SSRC. Her PhD project moves against both colonial and nationalist art history that marks 19th century painting as conservative and traditional. Uh, instead, Shivani's PhD traces the multiple scales, local, regional, global, through which court artists reconstituted an indigenous modernity in the colonial period. But her talk today is not from her PhD, but a completely different project on global diseases and 19th century image practices. And I'm especially thrilled that she's presenting this talk today since the bulk of the research was done at the GRI. And the talk is forthcoming in the next issue of the Getty Research Journal, which I believe is coming out this week or next week or soon. So, Shivani. Uh, thank you, Shigato. Wow, hearing my advisor say nice things about me in public, <laughs> very exciting. Um, and more seriously, I want to thank the conference organizers and the Getty Research Institute for giving me the opportunity to uh, share my work today. So I'll just get started. A late 19th century album in print depicts a residential colony in colonial Bombay that has been contaminated by the bubonic plague. Titled Flushing Engine Cleansing Infected Houses, the photograph documents the colonial state's effort to eradicate the disease by cleansing infected areas with clean water. The British commercial photographer, Francis Benjamin Stewart, has captured a powerful jet of water hitting the infected houses and bursting into tiny water molecules as it hits and cascades down the tenements, creating a soft, misty effect. Residents and bystanders have gathered behind government officials to observe the officers spray seawater onto the buildings in order to sanitize the space. Government officials stand on a horse-drawn cart blocking public access to the street, while the overseer near the center of the photograph direct, directs the flushing engine. Rows of figures on the left watch from a short distance, perhaps instructed to stand away from the building. 
The photograph is from a large leather-bound photo album now in the archives of the Getty Research Institute, which depicts the city of Bombay at the onset of the devastating bubonic plague epidemic of 1896 to 1914. The bubonic plague first struck the British port city of Bombay in September 1896, and by 1914 had spread through the entire Indian subcontinent. From the very onset of the epidemic, the British government in, in India investigated significant resources to prevent the spread of the disease, implementing invasive and destructive plague control measures at an unprecedented scale. The plague epidemic precipitated advancements in the newly developed field of tropical medicine, as well as city improvement schemes based on European principles of urban planning in Bombay, a port city that was central to imperial maritime trade. Yet, despite these strategies of plague control, the state failed to contain the disease. As the disease spread across the world, it not only left a long trail of casualties, but also a substantial visual archive on the first large-scale biopolitical crisis in India to be captured through the photographic lens. The Getty Research Institute's photo album is one of the earliest photographic documentations of an epidemic in South Asia. The photographs in the album are a part of a larger set that were commissioned by the Bombay Play Committee and compiled into multiple albums. Apart from the Getty Research Institute, the Wellcome Institute and the British Library in London hold similar albums with almost identical photographs. Each album contains approximately 140 tipped-in albumen and gelatin silver prints. Every page contains six gelatin prints interspersed with large-scale albumen prints. Stewart has co contributed eight large albumen prints to the album, while the remaining gelatin prints have been attributed to Captain C. Moss of the Gloucester Regiment. The albums appear to have been distributed to various British government officers. For instance, it is likely that the British Library's photo album had been given to he uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Henry Piers Dimock, the director of the JJ Hospital in Bombay, by the Bombay Plate Committee. I've also found an album in the private collection of the Earl of Elgin. In addition, the images circulated within a larger public sphere. Photographs from the album were reproduced in the British Weekly Illustrated newspaper, The Graphic, not long after the production of the album. Apart from these reproductions, there's little evidence to suggest the ways in which the photographs were used or seen by viewers. The photographs do not appear to adhere to the conventions of 19th century clinical medical photography, which typically focused on the depiction of infected persons and the physical appearance of diseases. At the same time, the photographs are visually distinct from bacteriological photomicrography, a technique that produced magnified images of microscopic subjects that were too small to be seen by the naked eye, and thus allowed medical practitioners to study the physical configuration of germs and bacteria. Rather, the photographs represent epidemiological photography, a new genre that emerged at the turn of the century and brought together the conventions of topographic, ethnographic, documentary, and war photography to document the broader ecology of epidemics, including factors relating to their outbreak, their modes of transmission, and their destructive consequences. In the album, one sees medical staff, hospitals, corpses, and burial grounds, officials performing preventative measures such as cleaning streets and houses, and health inspections, infantrymen on duty, and general views of the city. As one of the first examples of, e of epidemiological photography, the Bombay photo album thus serves as a significant archive of late 19th century colonial epidemiological, visual, and urban practices. By engaging with the photographs from this album, my talk examines how the bubonic plague epidemic was documented and visualized in relation to rapidly evolving ideas about photography, disease, health, and both the urban and natural environment. What do the photographs reveal about colonial attitudes toward urbanism and health? More broadly, how do photographs transcribe the material relations between people, objects, and the natural world? Taking the Bombay Plague photographs as a case study, I aim to foreground the environmental and biological context of photographic practices, focusing on the multiple ways in which non-human materials, such as water, air, light, and microorganisms, can drive and affect image making. 
In doing so, I hope to propose a new way of reading photography that foregrounds the dynamic materiality of the natural world over the phenomenological exchange between humans and their, their environment. As a whole, the Bombay photo albums appear to present a narrative of plague reform and colonial intervention. Stewart's photograph, for example, brings our attention to the sanitation, sanitation measures implemented by the Bombay Plague Committee to eradicate the plague in the city. This act of cleaning accentuates the grime and oppressive density of indigenous urban housing settlements. The image ostensibly lacks the symbols of colonial health, order, cleanliness, uniformity, spaciousness, and other tropes of colonial public health discourse. The colonial state's documentation and study of the plague in India can be seen as part and parcel of Western medicine's wider investigation into the nature of infectious diseases in the tropics. The study of tropical diseases was a branch of colonial science that culminated in the formation of tropical medicine as a formal scientific division of Western medical practice in 1899. The Bombay photo albums were produced in the last decade of the 19th century, at a time when conflicting theories of disease causation characterized medical discourse. Even though British health officials had largely accepted newer bacteriological theories of disease causation, many colonial administrators still found it difficult to discard earlier ideas of disease and miasma and criticized new germ theories for focusing on the infectious spread of pathogens rather than the unsanitary and climatic factors that purportedly enabled diseases to thrive. Within colonial scientific discourse, the Indian environment was portrayed as intrinsically pathogenic and environmental factors such as noxious miasmas, heat, moisture, and rotting vegetation were believed to be responsible for the causation and propagation of disease. In addition, colonial officials believed that poor ventilation created by overcrowding within dwellings, especially within the new low-cost urban housing settlements that had been built in Bombay to accommodate the influx of migrant workers, exacerbated the propagation of diseases. Perhaps Stewart's photograph was then intended to represent the indigenous areas of Bombay as dangerous and disease-ridden, in contrast to the supposedly sanitary spaces of the European residential areas, which are not, of course, depicted in the albums. Accordingly, one might argue that the various elements in the photograph, the native bodies, the infected unsanitary tenements, collectively produced an image of a pathological landscape, which could only be improved through the implementation of modern scientific health measures introduced by the colonial state. We can then read Stewart's photograph as representative of the discourse of tropical hygiene that portrayed India as a repository of disease and other biosocial disorders. Indeed, as scholars have noted, British authority in India derived its moral legitimacy in part from discursive systems of representations that highlighted the lack of order, sanitation, and health in the colony while emphasizing the necessity of imperial rule. Thus, the tropics have largely been seen as a conceptual category, discursively produced by European textual and visual materials that constructed the non-West as a space of disease, danger, and disorder. Yet, Stewart's photograph should not simply be read as a representation of the tropics as a pathologized space of disease. It could also be read as a document of the material properties of the natural world and the relations and interactions between people, objects, and the environment. In the colony, imperial conceptualizations of health and disease were based on the recognition of the vitality of environmental forces. By shifting our understanding of the environment from a conceptual category to a material subject, Stewart's photograph of the flushing engine I propose can be reread to demonstrate colonial engagements with the environment that emphasizes the material and biophysical properties of natural elements such as water, sunlight, air, and microorganisms. Water, the central focus of this photograph, is presented here as a salient force with the potential to sanitize and eradicate infections, contagion, and disease. European officials at the time believed that water, specifically seawater, could cleanse infected spaces and flush out diseases. By the end of 1896, three million gallons of salt water were even being flushed daily through Bombay's drains to clean the city's irrigation and sewage systems. 
The photograph could then be read as an artifact of colonial gov governmentality that presents an ostensibly efficient system of controlling and mobilizing the natural environment. Certainly, scholars have demonstrated that colonial officials mobilized photography as a tool to domesticate the colonial landscape. Images of the colony served to naturalize the position of the human, indeed European subject, as controlling the natural world. This 1891 photograph of a railway bridge, for instance, can be read as contributing to the myth of a successful imperial project. The photograph presents a clear and expansive view of a rail railway bridge extending across the Ganges and receding into the distance. The landscape, specifically water, is rendered as inert substance, merely to be acted upon by the human subject. Horizontally bisecting the picture plane, it is the bridge that dominates photographic space. One could say that the photograph conveys the colonial government's ability to govern and transform the natural world for the continuing expansion of the British Empire. Indeed, as James Ryan has argued, the very idea of empire depended in part on an idea of landscape as both controlled space and the means of representing such control on a global scale. If we compare such documentary photographs with Stewart's album in print, a more ambiguous understanding of the natural world emerges. Stewart's photograph, in contrast, is marked by a tension between controlled and uncontrollable natural forces. While still in the flushing engine, water remains in the possession of human agents as a resource to be used, consumed, and exploited. As the water surges forth from the high-pressure nozzle, and hits the surface of the building, countless tiny water particles are released into the air. The area hit by the jet of water is, on, is enveloped in a fine haze of water vapor, an effect of the inherent biophysical disposition of water. In the photograph, details such as the tenements, the wall, the windows, and even the people that are in proximity to the stream of water are obscured. Their ethereal forms just visible through a sheer curtain of mist. Indeed, the photograph lacks the clarity, order, and precision that we find in contemporaneous colonial documentary photographs, especially uh, album and prints, which typically yielded very clear images. On the one hand, Stewart's photograph is informed by a distinct environmentalist conceptualization of disease, one that is attentive to the productive potentiality of water as a cleansing agent. By making the act of cleaning the primary subject of the photograph, the photographer highlights the efficacy of water to act as a vital force. At the same time, the photograph's visuality is shaped by the dynamic nature of water in its material form. Might we be able to push this line of thought in order to conceptualize an ecologically attentive reading of photography, one that highlights the material pressures placed on photography by non-human elements, such as water, sunlight, and air? That is to say, how might we correlate visual practices with material processes? Captain C. Moss's photographs from the album, plague-stricken houses unroofed to let in sun and air, and Aliba Kolaba infected houses unroofed, document the interactions between natural elements such as air, sunlight, and microorganisms. The photograph's captions, alongside contemporaneous medical discourse, suggest that air and sunlight are active agents in the eradication of the plague epidemic in Bombay. The photograph on the left depicts three crudely thatched huts, which have been unroofed to allow sunlight and air into the interior spaces. The palm trees in the background evoke a sense of the hot tropical climate of Bombay, while the deep shadows on the ground suggest that the photograph was taken in the late afternoon. The photograph on the right depicts a similar scene. Partially hidden by the towering palm trees and dense tropical vegetation are two huts whose roofs have been replaced with bamboo frames that allow air and sunlight to enter the homes. When read alongside contemporaneous notions of miasma, health, climate, and disease, Moss's photographs reflect concurrent epidemiological theories. Colonial officials believed that disease proliferated in warm, humid, confined, and dark spaces, and presumed that contaminated homes could be cleansed and sterilized through not only water, but also direct exposure to air and sunlight. Moss's photographs prefigure the dramatic rebuilding of the city by the colonial government in the wake of the plague epidemic, which included the reclamation of land from the sea, the building of broad boulevards that would 
that would bring breezes deemed healthful from the ocean to the neighborhoods and the conversion of local agrarian lands into garden suburbs. These city improvement schemes were based on the principles of urban planning devised by the garden city movement in Europe, which similarly sought to ameliorate the detrimental effects of overcrowding and congestion on urban life through city planning. Indeed, in late 19th century and early 20th century Bombay, developments in public health and city planning were entwined with a growing focus on the effects of the local environment on residents' health and well-being. Thus, to see epidemiological photographs such as mosses as merely an image of the tropics as a pathologized site or as an index of colonial authoritative power is to obscure the gradual development of colonial scientific epistemologies and the different field of, fields of thought that constituted discourses of tropical hygiene and medicine. Such a reading would also obscure the material engagement between people, objects, and the environment. Here, I would like to shift our focus from colonial conceptualizations of the productive materiality of the environment to the physical properties of air and sunlight as material. Tim Ingold contends that histories of material culture have focused largely on the materiality of objects, which is based on humans' phenomenological relationship to the material world, and thus privileges the human perspective rather than physical materials and their properties, independent of humans. Following Ingold, I would argue that Moss's photographs take the latter approach, foregrounding the biophysical properties of air and sunlight. The photograph on the left appears to follow the conventions of clarity and exactitude that were demanded of colonial documentary image practices. Objects are photographed in crisp detail, and one can easily distinguish between shapes, forms, and figures. The photograph on the right, in contrast, is unclear, blurry, and overly bright. It is difficult to differentiate between various objects and forms. The white bull yoked to the cart appears to merge into the white wall behind the animal. Details such as the leaves of the trees, the huts, and the bamboo frames are difficult to discern. The difference in clarity between the two photographs can perhaps be attributed to the varying effects of environmental factors, such as light, temperature, and humidity on photography. The low contrast between shadows and light suggests that Moss took the photograph in bright sunlight, perhaps at midday or shortly after. The overexposure of light, surely accidental but perhaps difficult to avoid in the bright tropical sunlight of India, has in, in effect produced a washed out and technically imperfect photograph. The aesthetic parameters of the photographs are thus determined by elements that could readily be observed and regulated alongside factors that remain beyond human intentionality and control. Following recent theories in the emergent field of new materialism, we might choose to read air and light as vibrant matter, to borrow scholar Jane Bennett's provocative term. Bennett proposes that non-human objects are not simply acted upon, but rather participate as important actors in cultural, ecological, and historical processes. Indeed, Moss's photographs demonstrate that matter, far from being a static and inert substance, possesses the capability to affect and even disrupt image-making practices. The specific material and bioecological conditions of the time of photographic production shape the manner in which histories are recorded and in which photographs develop and deteriorate over the course of their lives. This is not to be interpreted as an exercise in biological determinism, Rather, it is to recognize that colonial cultural production was simultaneously embedded in social and biophysical networks. We might ask, what are the historical implications of centralizing the material world of matter? That is to say, why does matter matter? A materially sensitive analysis would reveal that the epidemiological landscape was not merely an archive that visualized imperial control over the natural environment. Rather, photographs of the plague reveal a historical sensibility to the material operations of non-human forces, such as germs, water, and air. Shifting from a focus on the materiality of non-human subjects to the material properties of the natural environment, a close reading of the images reveals that elemental forces left a material imprint on the photographs, attesting to the significant power of non-human forms in shaping image practices. Thank you.
Hi, <clears throat> I'm Richard Meyer from Stanford University. Very pleased to be here. Thank you to the Getty for the invitation of all to of, that they have extended to all of us. Um, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Christian Whitworth is a PhD candidate in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford, where he concentrates in film and media studies. He holds an MA in Art History from Tufts, and his writing on modern and contemporary photography, experimental cinema, and video art has been published in After Image and Millennium Film Journal. So I am not Christian's advisor. His advisor is Pavla Levy, who is a film a scholar, but there is a sort of odd appropriateness to um, me being the introducer here today, and that is that although I know very well that Christian is in the film and media studies program, I think of him as an art historian. Um, this is strange, but um, this is because last year when he took my seminar on overlooked and understudied art, he was so remarkable, so visually and historically attentive, that he seemed to me like a born art historian, or what a born art historian should be, but too often is not. But the fact that Christian, in fact, it, it, the fact that he's not um, studying art primarily reminds me that a scholar's object of study, whether it's visual art, film, photography, textiles, ceramics, or other forms of visual culture, matters far less than their rigor as a researcher, their attentiveness as a looker, their imagination as a thinker. All of these qualities are on evident display in Christian's paper, Found Photos in Detroit, and the Ethics of an Archive in Decline. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Richard, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you again to the organizers of this symposium, to everyone at the Getty, um, and special thanks to everyone back north at Stanford for their encouragement um, and support, especially Marcy Kwan um, with this paper. <clears throat> A young black boy peeks through the last remaining semblance of his photographic form a happenstance patch of glossy halftone whose opening reaffirms the efficacy of his sight. Yet his grin, just visible beneath the sheen of paper sheared, seems to signal more than the fragile evidence of his eye above. Red in tandem with this tarnish, a simple smirk recasts his expression as a curious longing for obsolescence. If he here appears to amuse himself with this inevitable self-loss, he does so in uncertain anticipation of another end in sight, for the originary exposure whose pulverization he now reluctantly resists was not merely the images, but so too his own. The exhibition abandonment disclosure of the young black boy developed in tune with the archive in which he has come to reside. A 2012 photo book by Italian photographers Ariana Arcara and Luca Santesi entitled Found Photos in Detroit. Embossed within the surface of its cover rests a small white label fashioned as if by meager means. Here, the label's administrative posturing stages a complex negotiation between process and place. Quote, we found these photos on the streets of Detroit, end quote, reads a small note at the end of the book. Their terse reminder seems to suggest the accidental retrieval of the surplus material. But a second statement reveals the fabrication of the author's archive, quote, we took them and started to sift between the thousands of Polaroids, letters, prints of photographic evidence, police documents, mugshots, and family albums, end quote. Any such distinction between photography's various vernaculars begins to fade within the pages of this book. Free associations risk false equivalences, and the mutation of interpretation once again bears its wildly disorienting face. Caution may not only be recommended, but required. Narratives of Detroit, which perpetuate an image of decline, too often assign to its black community the abject deterioration of form. 
But what exactly is this relationship between signification and subjection? How do we resist the tendency to equate photographic representation of the real with the real itself? Faded, flaked, and caked with dirt, the image must become neither the individual nor the community. As Harvey Young writes, quote, the mystery of blackness, which manages to become a fact through its repeated deployment across a range of bodies, too often encourages the misidentification of, in of individuated bodies, a body, as the black body. The latter replaces the former. The individual becomes anonymously or more accurately metonymically black, end quote. To ascribe to the body, then, the condition of its image is to add to this metonymy a degree of valuation, a report on its integrity. A reading such as this would reduce each person through a process of fixed abstraction to a warped and wrinkled paper frame. This is, after all, the process of hypervisualization encountered by black subjects daily, where the streets outside the home become the sites for the enactment of racialized surveillance. The performance of black life in a place shaped by whiteness becomes coded so that, quote, the lived experience of race, as George Lipsitz writes, has a spatial dimension, and the lived experience of space has a racial dimension. Where the edge of this private property is marked by the long stretch of police caution tape, the illumination of the white flash, aided by the probing police searchlight, prefigures the viewer's false access and thus encroachment towards the intimacy of the home. To cross the line, to approach the front stoop of this home is, in essence, in essence, to enter that home and the next until the street no longer remains the sole source of the archive. Is it possible, then, to open the book without invading the home? Is the refusal of the photographs the preservation of their privacy, or is the primal scene of the violence of the archive reproduced regardless of the direction of my gaze? Such is the dilemma that art history must now confront. Grappling with its own constitutive limits, the discipline will soon recognize the inescapable subjection of its variegated performances. Writing, speaking, rehearsing the passings of its persons organizes art's histories around interruptions, displacements, and dispossessions. Ultimately, I seek within these photographs an optic of visibility, one that attempts not to see, let alone allegorize the trauma of the scene, but to encounter, as if by nearing association, one's gaze as an object free from the strings which attach it to any particular subject. Such is the effect of the evidentiary image to which many of these family photographs draw near. Although the photograph of the crime scene does not directly present the moment of the crime too intensive for our eyes, it evokes it. It supports what James Baldwin has elsewhere called the evidence of things not seen. Its ability to unsettle is evidence of a trace of something not readily accepted not so easily ascribed to reality. And in this moment of separation, the spectator becomes a spectator of one's own absence, a witness without access, a witness of one's own relation, and thus an observer of the process of observation itself. To look is, in short, to be entirely conscious of one's own looking, and to ask oneself in turn whether he or she should be looking at all. This is the question with which Elizabeth Alexander begins her essay, Can You Be Black and Look at This?, Hers is a case for the collective memory of a history of horror, an imperative to bear witness as an act of retelling, in this case of the 81-second videotape of the beating of Rodney King. Though many may wish to forget, a reanimation may be a form of remembering, but remembrance itself is a vexed term. For the act of historicization, the recording of memory can assume any number of appearances. Whatever collective version of black American bodily history one bespeaks is itself evidence of the ideologies within which the author exists as an agent of circulation. There's no denying that, the black, body, that black bodies and their attendant dramas are publicly consumed by a larger populace, as my words make evidently clear. White men and white women have been the primary stagers and consumers of historical spectacles, often making metaphor of the black body in order to invoke a national historical memory. How often, for example, have the American traumas of the 1990s been staged in the body of Rodney King, visible yet again through the pixelated abject detritus of the artifactual videotape? Should I attempt to avoid the reproduction of the metaphor of the black body through my analysis of these found photos, I must mark my words as a product of the position from which I too have found them. I first approached this book while studying photography as an undergraduate in Rochester. 
nestled in a long series of stacks of art books in a university library, found photos in Detroit struck me as a vision of a world entirely distinct from my own. To put it plainly, I was and still am a young white male from a from a middle-class suburban neighborhood on the outskirts of Cleveland, who has only ever really known and will likely only ever know those streets which demarcate the college campus. But my position is not neutral, nor is it inseparable from the conditions in which these images circulate. Foundness is a state of being constructed too by me. Therefore, I cannot claim to speak for them, nor will I. But if my ignorance should be the excuse behind my refusal to look, I would not only enact a massive disservice to those pictured here, but also to myself and what the institution of art history might be able to do. I may not be able to speak to, nor for, nor about these individuals, but I can speak beside them, about the very structures of the apparatus that has conditioned their archival existence. Such an attempt at revival must begin with the parsing of these relations not just between myself and the individuals within, but also between the body and the image in whatever state it remains. Any reading of these images must confront this gap between the possible and the potential. And in some sense, the photographs themselves, apart from their decontextualization within the album, anticipate conceptions of black temporality that transgress the, bound the boundaries of the ongoing present in which neoliberal conceptions of progressive social change is about an overcoming or erasure of the benighted past. Within these photographs, generations of black men present a host of individuated experiences of personal, intimate ties to time. But each shares access to a durational wake to draw upon Christina Sharp's important work, a reference to personal, public, and historical events which illustrate the intimacies of pain and joy as part of black being in the world. The wake is a state of being, a form of relationality that extends beyond the past and the present against the racializing codes and frameworks of the writing of history, which so often seeks to fix its subjects as non-persons limited to the conditions and mechanisms of modernity. The work of fabulation taken up by such scholars as Sharp, Sadia Hartman, and Tavian Nyong'o offers a radical reinscription of black aspiration which does not refer to social or economic mobility, but rather a deep concern with the question of black vi vitality within a climate, a weather that is perversely anti-black. Their aim is, quote, an image, as Nyong'o writes, that participates in a virtual set of incompossible pasts and futures, a black speculative engagement with the camera and, more broadly, with the documentary and archival historical apparatus, end quote. This equation of the writing of history as the production of an image should not be overlooked. Their visual descriptions which reanimate the lives and thus the relations of those within, however anonymous, serve to situate those subjects within a performance, a black feminist ethic of care and compassion. Much of their historicizing involves narration, at times speculative, at times intimately real. Yet Sharp, like the others, is careful to recognize the mediation of her voice. She knows when and when not to attend to stories, to be concerned for black health, to claim ownership through kinship, to, quote, stand and say, as the Canadian poet Claire Harris once wrote, the child was black and female and therefore mine. Of course, this child may not be a child, may not really be known, may not be female, but Harris's felt responsibility becomes sharps, becomes every viewer's. To watch through a series of cropped square photographs as a young, shirtless black boy exhibits the many bruises littering his arms and back is to confront the ethics of spectatorial care. In the first, he stands with his shoulders square to the wall behind him and in turn to the camera, to us. And in the following sequence of three photographs, he lifts up first his left arm, pointing his elbow outward so as to catalog across the surface of his brown skin the darkened impressions of abuse. As he levels his arm with his shoulders, his exhibition becomes a blockade. The arm acts as a barrier, a level of protection between him and the viewer, a way of warding off an all-too-familiar gaze, which colonizes the, colonizes the body, marking it with its own abstract discolorations. My responsibility is not to tell his story. His is not mine to tell. But I can still seek to behold him, not through a fabulative reconstruction of the fragments of his identity, but through a fabulative restaging of the photographic archive in which these images have been sequenced. The photograph is, after all, the apparatus that has conditioned his body. 
And while I still assert that the image cannot be read as the body, it can still speak of a body. As long as it remains within found photos, it will continue to exhibit his exhibition of bruises. To rewrite the apparatus then is to curtail its effects by closing off and reassigning its modes of circulation. To behold the photograph is in short to give it away, to entrust it to those who not only speak of the boy but, to who, but who relate to him as well. To write this care into the historicity of the objects is to be ever conscious of the captions with which one defines, protects, and performs the lives of the pictured. While some photographs carry on their surfaces the weight of their inscriptions, other face a similar fate through mere association. Reproductions of handwritten notes within the pages of found photos cast black sociality as threatening and violent. One begins with an alarming address, quote, hi bitch, this is the brother of the boy that shot you and I just want you to know that if he gets any time, we're going to kill you, end quote. An extended address relays the aftermath of violence, the story about a lawsuit and the desperate attempt through intimidation to save one's family. These captions threaten not only the subjects to whom they are addressed, but the photographs whose pages they share. For the space of the text opens on to multiple meanings. The reader assumes not just the tone, but the longer narrative woven into the fabric of these words. Perhaps they speak more of fear and anxiety against and under the pressures of systemic violence and surveillance conditioning these communities from which the letters emerge. Perhaps these notations of family serve as markers of a long lineage of black bodies whose severe disjunctures of flesh come to be hidden and made manifest in the symbolic substitutions of their traumas. Perhaps in the end it really is impossible to know. For this note is no different than a second, which reads, Rudy, this is my daddy's number, 1614252. If anything happens to me, call him. He lives in Ohio. His name is Willie. Expressions of fear are here joined by love and protection, much like those texts by Sharp and Hartman. Though the author of this note intended it to be shared between herself and Rudy, it opens onto a network of black care with which we might rework those earlier annotations, re-narrating those stories within as a way of shielding those involved, deflecting those intrusive gazes and cloaking what had previously been violently exposed. And while the image work and the text work do not have an indexical relationship, their approximation may be a way of listening in accordance with the work of Tina Camp to the sonic frequencies of images of black bodies. She invites us to pause and sit with the image and with the family within, not to study its forms, but to register its invisible and inaudible yet wholly affective properties. The posterior surface of a small photographic memento, for example, bears not just the mark of its owner, but so too its aspirations. When me draws close to Tony, we might discern out of its quiet the love of a young couple who so desires against the constraints of their respective situations to commit to a life together. Should these images start to layer the intimate anecdotal histories of those persons pictured within, what complex relations might emerge between a social totality and the politics of pleasure, between the virtual history of a people and the singular performance of one's identity? What, in other words, remains the relationship between the series of found photographs as a whole, as an album, as an archive of fabulation, and the pause, care, and attention given to any one? Angela Davis, for example, remembers her own commodified replicated image as an embodiment of a certain soulless soul, fixed, artifactualized, in a way that erases, quote, the activist involvement of vast numbers of black women in movements that are now represented with even greater masculinist contours than they actually exhibited at the time, end quote. The recurrence of and repetition in black performance continues to face the constant pulverization of its figures and forms, in turn enforcing the mythical misinterpretation of its evidence. To be a found photograph, then, is to be attendant to a specific mode of aestheticization, a formalism void of narrative and ideology, which hides the evidence of its origins and the conditions of, its bod of the body's being, just as said body presses to reveal it. Such a formalism might be immediately recognized as an aforementioned quiet, a calm and effervescence ad infinitum. This is ultimately the formalism of trauma, or rather the trauma of formalism, an abstraction recognized as repetition compulsion, not just within the frame of the image, but also in its archival acquisition. 
We look for such an image here as an almost compulsive, regimented, and repetitious formula of image making and image collecting. The construction of an archive that resists intelligibility, that seeks to reinscribe language, meaning, and being into a space drained of all temporal signification. The found photographs live through the process of counting, ordering, and accumulating. The book and its viewers softly deny their death, or at least forestall their death in this life. Indeed, the quiet effervescence of trauma seems to contradict the violent and obscene visions of its effects, which more often than not suffuse the content of the image. But the photograph's nearly imperceptible retreat must be recognized in the object's oscillation between many and one, between banality and rupture. In one such image, a black man stands with his back to a white wall marked by a series of smears. Each gestural drag, crowned by a singular fingerprint, emerges as a product of process. The rote regularity of not just mark making, but also counting, ordering, and categorizing. In short, the procedural enactment of the archive and, given the fingerprint's long and checkered past, an institution of criminalization. But once the smears find their imagined limitlessness beyond the hardened edges of the frame, the central figure issues, force, issues forth with an adverse singularity. Those processes of coordination or curtailment which once attempted to contain the whole of the many now confront the life of the one. Any desire to count, order, and accumulate should now fail upon the sight of the man, who seems to be the only subject of this image of which there is only one iteration. In this instance, the subject is not he who stands at the center, but rather centrality itself, the being among the symptoms of the archive. Might there be a way to resist the anonymity, to maintain the individuality amidst the multiplicity of the archive? And might there be a rereading of these many wayward objects, one which enacts the refusal to reproduce the representation of their spectacles of suffering? Such a collection should be an occasion to revisit again and again, a moment when enter in animation when words strongly influence nearby and adjacent words seems to tie political insurgency, insurgency to cultural performance to a growing list of names from Philando Castile to Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and here Sandra Bland. The continuous enumeration of the victims of police violence and more broadly systemic racism will be the only way to maintain the one among the many especially in the proliferation and circulation of videos of said violence, not just by onlookers, but by police and by the victims themselves. The captions to these images matter more than ever, but we cannot and must not dissociate the name from the individual, lest we risk again the violent decontextualization of the archive. These found photos and videos called from the streets of America may no longer remain on the street, but they cannot be dissociated from the street, nor from the body, nor from the family of the subjects pictured within. Their waywardness is both a warning against and a reason for their rereading. But the caption, the duplicative denotation, carries the responsibility of their afterlives. Say their names, in short, to keep them alive. Mark their words, tell their stories, even if the truth, however distant it may seem, stems always from the grain of, of a fable. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, Shivani, and Jonathan for giving us so much to think about within and across your papers. Uh, thank you for joining us back on stage, and I will take just a minute to introduce our moderator for this session, Richard Meyer. Robert and Ruth Halpern, professor in art history at Stanford University, teaches courses in 20th century American art, the history of photography, arts censorship and the First Amendment, curatorial practice, and gender and sexuality studies. His first book, Outlaw Representation, Censorship and Homosexuality in 20th Century American Art, was awarded the Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship from the Smithsonian American Art Museum. In 2013, he published What Was Contemporary Art? A Study of the Idea of the Contemporary in Early 20th Century American Art, and with Catherine Lord, Art and Queer Culture, a survey focusing on the dialogue between visual art and non-normative sexualities from 1885 to the present. Uh, just before I turn things over to Richard and our speakers, a quick note about our screen, which you may have seen flickering. This is unfortunately not a quick fix, but part of a larger technological problem. We're in line to get it fixed. We might not get to it today, but I wanted you to know that we did notice, and we're on it. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, 
I have to say, I usually, am, I mean, I'm almost never at a loss for words, but I find the um, task of responding to these three papers daunting. But, um, so I'm not going to respond so much as I'm going to, I'm actually going to say what I didn't, I'm going to ask about what I didn't understand, because I have the firm belief that there might be others in the audience who also, and when I say didn't understand, it, it just means um, you probably didn't have enough time to fully explain this, or I'm going to just press you. So in each case, um, it has to do with the nature of the photographs that you are working on. In each case, they seemed a little bit elusive, and by that I mean, um, Jonathan, it seemed as though, I thought that you were at a certain point making a claim that it didn't so much matter whether it was fast or good, the wire print, the wire print uh, versus the, the blow up at, 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 at MoMA, um, and those seemed to be like entirely different visual experiences. Um, and also the idea that it even becomes a print rather than something just for newspaper um, uh, print, you know, like that it becomes a print that would be saved or at least a preserved, let's say, at MoMA, seems like a totally different um, world, visual world to, and, and phenomenological world. And also, the last thing I'll say about that, the image with, of the futility I, I don't know if I quite believed you that the, that the printing, that it, that, it, that it didn't really matter. It was already black, the contrast, the tonality was already um, contrasty enough that, because to me, and again, it could just be the Getty's bad quivering screen, but, uh, or uh, feed, but uh, it seemed again quite different and extremely um, uh, moving in a different way when you saw it on the wall in the museum. So then, for um, Shivani, I was a little bit unclear. I know that there, this album exists here. I, I promise this is the only questions I'm asking, but I'm going to ask them all at once. Um, but you said that there were several of them, like there was one at some prince's house or something. The, the Earl of Elgin. Yeah, the Earl of Elgin. Um, you know, the guy who stole... Oh, anyway, the, um, but anyway... Uh, and I didn't quite understand, I, I, so I was a little um, confused by that, like how is it that there were these um, multiples, if they're one of a, I guess they're not one of a kind photographs, but, but were they all order, ordered in exactly the same way in each album? And then I was curious about how one of them anyway got into a newspaper, because it, it, it seemed like very different routes of circulation. And I'm assuming um, that you came to it through the Getty, but I wanted to hear a little bit about that too. And then yours, most confusing of all to me, <laughs> you, you sort of told us this origin story, not origin, but this discovery story which happened in Rochester. And so it, I just didn't understand, is this a book that has been published by an artist? Is it, I, I did literally not understand what the status of the photographs were. And also, the thing that this ties up for all three of you is, it seems like what can't be seen is very important to you. And I wanted you to make it a little bit more important to us by telling us about the specificity of what you could see um, and couldn't through the objects that you discovered in archives or special collections or libraries. Oh, I don't know why. Do you want to? I don't know who's supposed to. Oh, I think I asked you first. Hello. Oh, it, it's on. Um, yeah, I can. I can go first. I can answer. Um, so MoMA is a totally different world than the newspaper. Um, I think they are different, and it's important that they're different. And I, I tried to make this point in the paper, but one thematizes the fact that it's traveled through space, the one in the newspaper. So it's important that it looks blurry. The one in MoMA works differently because it's supposed to smoothly transport you. They talk about it as telecommunication. So they're very aware that they look differently, uh, different, and I think that they're supposed to be different. But, but they're not, I would argue that they're not from different worlds. They make up one world, one unity that is moving viewers through space in different ways. That's why they're a media ecology that works to get, like any ecology has different species, 
that are different, you know, look different, uh, do different things differently, uh, but work together in some kind of a whole. Um, and I think that that's what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> for, the, for the futility photo, <clears throat> now, this is tricky because I think that there are some photos, some wire photos, as they're printed in the newspaper, that are more comfortable, let's say, with their blurriness, with the fact that they're very different from prints in a museum. <clears throat> and uh, as, I, as I try to suggest, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And then there are others that want to lessen the difference between themselves and prints in a museum, and that figure in advance the ways in which, they attempt to figure in advance the ways in which they uh, would be made distinct from museum prints at, via their transmission process. Um, and that's why photojournalists and textbooks say, if you don't want a picture to be really blurry, shoot in high contrast, because <clears throat> then you won't have gray tones that, that fall out. So, Within the category of wire photography, I think there are photos that are trying to do different things. And my point with the futility photo is that by mid-century, the, the distance between these worlds, if you want to think of them as worlds, or just between these different categories of, of, of photographs, is decreasing. Because you have the daily photos already almost kind of forecasting or seeing the radio photos as potential MoMA photos and, and treating them in that way, uh, whereas others are, are much more different. I, yeah. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, um, yeah I'll try to answer um, that as best as I can um, because we know very little about how the um, photographs were used and um, how they were circulated as well. Um, but uh, in the medical reports um, that I've examined, they are not referred to for their kind of ethnographic testimony um, and, um, and for their medical value either. Um, it seems that, uh, but it, it, it wasn't uncommon for such photo albums to be given um, to officers and other dignitaries as diplomatic gifts, perhaps. Um, it, in, uh, in terms of uh, the album that's at the Earl of Elgin, I actually just recently stumbled upon that in November when I was visiting um, Broom, Broom Hall House in Edinburgh. Um, and I was quite surprised to see it there. Um, but it was also, but the album, one of the albums was also given to the head of um, the hospital in Bombay. Um, so it's really, um, we can only speculate as to why. They were given most likely as a kind of just visual record of the colonial state's efforts to um, eradicate the plague, which of course they failed to do so for many, many years. Yeah. And they're all, all these albums are, as so far as you can tell, the exact same, I mean, they're oh, right. identical? Right, so um, yeah, actually at first I thought they were um, identical, and it seems like um, the photographs are just uh, um, a few shots apart. Um, and so they were taken uh, probably as from a large set of photographs, um, and then distributed amongst these albums. And also, um, uh, to, so Francis um, Benjamin Stewart, the uh, photographer, he, was, uh, he owned the copyright of the photographs. And so perhaps he um, gave or sold one, uh, photographs to newspapers like The Graphic. Okay, um, so Richard, your confusion was my confusion, exactly, in that- I'm I confused now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? That that was, that are, or that continues to be the stakes of what this book is. It's the fact that I stumbled upon this book, it was published as an art book by art photographers, and now exists in, I mean, there were a thousand editions of this book that were published, now it continues to exist in mostly private collections or university libraries that have an extensive photo book collection. Um, but what struck me and what um, sort of ignited the discomfort around this book when I initially approached it and found it as I tried to uh, unpack in my talk was that um, all of the photographs have sort of been um, taken out of their usual channels of recognition. Um, and that the very conditions and the, uh, the unknown conditions in which these photographs exist 
is sort of the, um, the impetus behind the writing of this paper. Um, trying to decide what to do with these photographs when um, such a dearth of information exists about them um, and when they exist they existed, I should say, originally as uh, private, very intimate, very personal photographs, or at least of events that were themselves um, uh, very incredibly violent. Um, how do we grapple with these images? And should they continue to circulate? Should the book be closed? And I guess, should they be shown here today? And I think these are the questions that are um, the impetus behind the paper. Um, how to look at these things when we cannot really look um, at what we're trying to understand or we don't know what we're trying to understand. Uh, but it's a matter, I think, of trying to articulate a form of visuality that has less to do with looking for what's inside the photograph, inside the content of the image, and more um, how a mass of images exist within an album, within an archive. Can I jump onto that yeah, just quickly? Please. Um, I'd like, maybe I can bring up the, the, the general Please. visible and invisible. Yeah. As I think to some extent, um, I mean, very, very different in many very relevant ways, of course, but y your picture album and, and my pictures both to some extent suspend their um, kind of ability to communicate. Sometimes they don't do it clearly, and that opens up a bit of a gap. For me, what that then reveals is the infrastructure that undergirds, underlies media, <clears throat> in which I think I'm interested in this moment because uh, it was a moment where it was more visible and then it kind of became invisible. So wire photography at this time was in the process of shifting between a technology, you know, we're gonna write about it and we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna show it because it's new and it's novel and it's cool um, and it's bringing us this new world and an infrastructure. So the reason I stopped my dissertation and this paper in 1955 is that's when television comes in and the, the radio photo process is getting better. So it recedes from visibility as infrastructure and becomes media communication. So in that sense, I see a connection with the way that these photos as tools for communication have been taken out of circulation and I don't go into this then ethical <laughs> self-examination, well, I mean, which I think was very brave and very uh, difficult. Um, I, so I see that Andrew has a question, but I'm just yeah. going to follow up yeah. with this one last thing, which is maybe you could think about this, but um, if you want. Uh, I was surprised, um, and maybe this has to do with your infrastructural commitments, that you didn't actually do very much of a description of that bridge photo in of, terms of the machine or no, no, the of, bridge photo of the people actually crawling over the bridge and the ways in which it recedes and similarly with your photograph I thought well yes there's the water but there are all those people like what are they doing on the street and then there was the whole compositional you know the, the ways in which it was composed as a picture and that just relates, there were certain photographs that you did talk about and others, I guess, for, I mean, I, it seemed like for ethical reasons that you didn't or didn't want to push too hard and then there was the note, you know, and I guess what I'm wondering, I don't want to make this uh, only ethical because I think it's also methodological and I think it's also art historical and I know, anyway, we may not identify as art historians or, or wish to, but, I sort of wonder why, I mean, don't we need to attend somewhat more fully to the images that are our key images? Obviously, you only had 20 minutes or so here, but, but maybe, the, and I thought that in various ways I was surprised by what wasn't of, of interest. And the last part of this is, I think in each of these cases, one of the challenges you're facing we're betraying the object when we project it as image, I mean, not, not to mention the wire photo, you know, we can't actually capture the objects that you guys are working on through a PowerPoint. Yeah. So maybe that's part of the reason why you don't want to fetishize the individual image. But I was waiting for more of a discussion also of the, of the ice image, which I thought was intense. Mm. I didn't actually realize the person was dead at first, which I guess is my weirdness. I thought maybe they Very were dead. breathing through the, anyway. Yeah. 
Well, at one point they were breathing through it, but oh, okay. not when the photo was taken. But that seemed like I wanted some, some more... Yeah. Well, as I said in the talk, you know, um, this is not just about my reading of some image and what it means to me. Uh, this is about knowledge, uh, about the past, um, and art history. You know, the history part is in there. Um, and <laughs> we kind of, we kind of uh, need to understand how we got to the world that we're in now with digital media where we can just take objects out of their context to some extent as images, put them up on the wall, and I think it's important for us to understand that. How did we get here? Um, as, as to the betraying the objects, yeah, to some extent. but. To a great degree, epistemologically, I'm a pragmatist, and I could have made a little drawing of some hands sticking through the snow and said, this is this forced picture of hands sticking through the snow. It would have borne some relation to it, but not as good of a relation as replete of uh, a similarity to the thing that I'm trying to communicate about. And I, I think that that's what I'm basically trying to say, is that even though I'm interested in the ways that these images communicative potential is interrupted in certain ways by the transmission process. I am still talking about images that communicate and I'm trying to communicate something about them, knowledge about them. So. Um, yeah, I, I would love to respond to that as well. Um, I completely agree. The first photograph, um, it's uh, visually, it's very striking. Um, the composition is just, I think, very striking. Um, I wish we were up there. It's with the the tenements, the um, the lines, and uh, the jet of water um, creating the, that diagonal line cutting through. Um, and so I think for me, um, these photographs are constructed, they are choreographed, um, and uh, in a particular way to be striking. Um, and, but for me, I think part of my interest also lies in seeing photographs as not just a visual or a social process, but also a material and physical one. And um, uh, photographic histories often focus on the meaning that photographs gain um, in being embedded in social relationships. And I'm sort of interest, interested in the process of production, of becoming. Um, and so I was trying to focus on that as well. Yeah, okay. thank you. I'm going to have to answer it, unless you, but do you feel urgently? Like um, I, I just want to say very quickly that um, I think there are symptoms that cannot always be read within the images themselves. I think it's incredibly important to return to the object time after time and return to the history time after time. But there, I, I think, is a way um, to ask questions about images and about objects, and I think the questions that we're also asking are incredibly particular to photography. I'm not saying that these are heuristics that cannot be applied elsewhere, but I think that um, for the um, constraints of time that I had, my immediate um, interest was with asking these questions about how to look at these images that um, would not be necessarily worthy or would not immediately be reckoned with uh, because of the lack of a history to which they emerge. Thank you. I think Andrew had a question and then whoever Thank you all. One of the things that are audience... It's not. Not on. Okay. One of the things that struck me is that Jonathan and Shivani's talks were very much about uh, one of the key elements of photography as a medium, which is it is a medium of transmission. And Christian's talk, a more ambiguous uh, ontology. So first thought would be, what in the ontology of photograph, what is the difference between one that is made to be transmitted and one that is meant for more personal kinds of circulation? 
then also historically, how is the photograph different than other means of transmission? Uh, prints, for instance. And then in both Jonathan and Shivani's case, it seemed to me another thing was the transmission of the photograph with anxieties about other kinds of transmission. So in your case with the Korean War, about the transmission and spread of communism, and in Shivani's about the transmission and spread of disease, and then in Christians, really, it's about what happens both through the production of this photo book and through your own very beautiful but very elevated language that puts these photographs back into transmission. I can start. Um, just that, um, yes, I, I think. The challenge is that these objects in my paper especially um, are sort of walking this fine line between resisting transmission, as you say, um, resisting circulation, and at the same time recognizing the spheres of circulation from which, in which I should say they were originally circulating or initial, initially moving. Um, I think it's incredibly particular of uh, the family photo album uh, to be circulating within intimate exchanges within the family and within the home. Um, I think it's part of the specificity and particularity of photography, though, um, as a medium that always points towards something that is beyond the hardened edges of its frame. Um, to be a medium that is always pointing towards or to something that continues to exist. And this is why I love your phrasing um, of a photograph at the edge of an event. It's because a photograph is, regardless of whether I think it's being transmitted across a wire, is always at the edge or adjacent to or in association with a larger reality that exists beyond the frame. And so I think circulation and transmission here um, for me is a matter of a battle between um, what exists within the frame and what exists without, or what exists within the home and what exists on the street. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that um, really brings my mind to the intersections between uh, the, milit the militarist and the medical, um, particularly within the colonial context. Um, and I think uh, with, these, with the history of the plague, um, it's interesting because the response to the epidemic was a military one, not a medical one um, in colonial Bombay, um, or in India at the time. And I think we could really think about, um, we could connect these images sort of to the global development of um, a kind of militarist aesthetics, um, uh, especially in relation to photographs of natural disasters. And I think that's one that continues even today. So if we think about um, this rhetoric of uh, war on epidemics, um, war on diseases, um, I think that's a rhetoric that continues even today. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> on photo as a means of trans, yeah. Um, well, the AP, it's a business, and so they're trying to get it to as many people as possible. It's a nonprofit, but they work, they want to get as much funding from their, the newspapers that, that take the AP as they can, and those newspapers are very much businesses. So it's, it's, it's not exact, I wouldn't call it a one-to-many media exactly, but it's sort of a one-to-many media as opposed to one-to-some or some-to-some, -some, like, like a photo album or family pictures. Uh, so in that sense, it's very like a 20th century type of media. Um, as far as like how photo is different, um, I'm, not, I'm not so tied to like a medium specificity way of looking at photography. I think that photo is effective at getting, being places when events happen and then getting it back to where people are gonna see it. Um, photo is fast, it's faster than sketching. And, it, and the, the wrestle, what they're trying to do is wrestle with, can we get this information in visual form from one place to another? Now, the wire can transmit drawings 
and graphic information, and sometimes it does. It transmits weather maps, all kinds of different things. So it's not just photo that's doing it. I think most of what it does is photo, and so I look at photo primarily. Um, but I'm not, I'm not so tied to <coughs> why photo is essentially different from, from other kinds of media. Uh, and anxiety about transmission. I think that this could be an interesting route to go down. But does Flores not that ideologically dedicated of a cold warrior? And like the family of man goes to East Berlin and it goes to Moscow. <clears throat> so I think there's more. And, uh, they're using the communist blocks using radio photography too, so I wouldn't want to tie it too directly to communism, but maybe there is some kind of a worry or an association between the event and a kind of un unpredictability, a uh, chaotic, um, stochastic, like, eruption of something, whether it's a disease or a war or a natural disaster or, or uh, the Hindenburg explosion. The event, which wire photography is usually trying to capture, is something that breaks out um, and it's kind of random, typically. Sometimes it's planned, you know, pseudo events. So I'd be careful about tying it too much, but I think it's an interesting avenue to, to try to think down. Okay, thank you very much to all three speakers. Um, can you hear me okay? ways was the whole question of decay and degradation. And I think that my question is primarily uh, for Christian, but it's one that links with Shivani's really exciting calling on the effects and the materialization of um, weather and the non- tangible environment in lots of ways. Because Christian, your images were both extraordinarily evocative and moving as images of abandonment and decay, and were deeply troubling to look at for that reason and for the kind of appropriation that was going on, both in the volume that you were discussing and in a sense, in talking about them at all, but you're well aware of the ethics of that. What intrigues me is the overlap, particularly because of the sighting in Detroit, of the images that you're talking about and the sort of Detroit ruin porn that particularly became popularized, I guess, through the work of Polidori and Sugru, that, that gets, that puts into circulation images of extraordinary 19th century opulent architecture and that asks us implicitly to take a certain form of pleasure from their decay. Um, and by extended implication, a sort of forbidden pleasure in the social economic processes that have caused it. So I'm packing a lot into a short space, but the question that I'm really asking is when does it become acceptable to find the decay and degradation that is caused by natural effects pleasurable mm -hmm. and Frankly, when not? Yeah. That's a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, I grappled a lot with um, whether or not, uh, not just the images themselves, but showing the images w was a perpetuation of um, narratives of Detroit, I think that I mentioned in my paper, that per themselves perpetuate an image of decline. Um, I think Detroit has metonymically come to signify ruin. Um, and there are, like you say, all of these associations between Detroit and ruin porn and images of a wasted industrial landscape um, long into Detroit's history. And I think, I mean, just 
not to harp too much on a personal autobiography, but growing or going to school in Rochester when Kodak was declaring bankruptcy and recognizing sort of the end of a vernacular celluloid surface um, was itself in news media outlets um, echoes of an industrial Detroit. And so I, um, I was thinking a lot about uh, what current practices of Detroit and ruin um, usually espouse, and I notice this a lot in Cleveland, where I'm from, is that neoliberal practices which see ruin uh, as a uh, opportunity or possibility for uh, reclamation and um, uh, revival are themselves perpetuations of a hierarchy uh, in which the ruin itself has uh, been established in the first place. And so I, I think my, my intention is less a revival or a reconstitution of these images and more of a repatriation. My, my intent is less to do with um, sort of resignifying or reviving what is in ruin and more with, um, yeah, finding a way to um, hold it as it exists. But I think this is still a question uh, because the images continue to exist in ruin. And I think this was what I was trying to get at in the visual analysis with which I began, which was, does this boy um, figuratively recognize uh, the deterioration of his own image? And what are his wishes and what are his aspirations in relation to his form? Uh, hello. Um... I'm going to appreciate you guys for coming out and talking as well. But, uh, I have a, a question for Christian, and um, that's kind of loud. But um, oh, and I appreciate how you situate yourself with your work. I thought that was it was decent. Um, but I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts about the future of this like kind of violent archive that you were talking about and this violent dissociation that we're kind of going through, especially in the like age of the point and shoot, like pull, pull out your phone and like instantly make archives on your phone through social media and things of that nature. So I kind of wanted to know like your thoughts about the future of that and is and the future like how can we like I don't kind of curb it or just kind of like the white consumption of it or like or our consumption of it in general. So just like what are your thoughts about it in the future and do you have any ways not to kind of like solve it but just you know what, like what do you think is like the direction that we're going in? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, and I think this is why I end with the image of the, the police image of the, uh, from, the cop, from the cop car of the Sandra Bland incident, is because these images continue to exist whether we recognize it or not, and I think it's time that art history recognize um, that these images circulate and these images continue to exist and continue to be produced. Um, so how do we grapple with this form of visuality? And I think your question is a good one um, in the sense that we have to come to terms with the fact that the uh, conditions in which we circulate the images are the conditions for which they are read. And I think evermore we have to ask ourselves whether or not images can be annotated and how we are creating and writing a caption for those images. So I don't think it's a matter of um, trying to lessen the production of the image. I think um, um, they're going to exist regardless, but I think it is a matter of um, better articulating a caption for those images because that, that's how they'll continue to be represented, continue to live. Thank you so much to all three of you for your wonderful, insightful uh, lectures. My question to all three is, how did you develop the lens to which look at looking at each one of your archives or for you in the book? Sure. Um, just a quick response to that. Um, well, I think um, this uh, paper really, it emerges from uh, the research that I did for my master's. And um, I was working on the history of uh, disease um, in the colony of photography. And um, predominantly, uh, the narrative has been one of power, of disciplining the body, um, and of seeing the tropics as a 
pathologized site, a uh, space of disease. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, um, I guess, push back a little bit on that narrative um, because I find that it, it obscures the, the real material relations between people and the, their environment. Um, and so I was just, yeah, and so that's, I think that's where I sort of started um, to think about these kinds of questions about the environment and I wanted to explore the interface of um, the natural world, um, human ideas, uh, and objects. And for me, this was a way to uh, deepen our understanding of um, the relationship of people, objects, and their environment in which the human is not the sole actor in a network of relations. Um, well, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and it takes a village, as Vanessa said. And um, yeah, this work came out of a seminar in 2015 on the news, the news, news picture. And uh, Zainab Gersel, the anthropologist, wrote a short piece in that about wire photography, and I found it very interesting. Um, but I had more questions, and the more I looked into it, the more I thought um, there's more here. And I'd been interested in um, Stephen Kern's work on the culture of, of time and space from a more kind of intellectual history perspective. And then I got really interested in transportation as media, um, shaping subjective experience, particularly through um, Chivalbush's um, The Railway Journey. And uh, yeah, Jason and Vanessa's, Vanessa's perspective on, on this was very important. Jason Hill had a great uh, article on radio photography, uh, a, a particular radio photo, photo that showed up in PM in 1940. So I kind of took off from all these things and then said, where's the archive? Um, and the AP was kind enough to let me into their corporate archive in New York. You know, it's a hard thing to research because corporations tend not to be as easy to access as states. Then I found state archives also in France and Germany and the UK and, and the United States and kind of all went, went from there. Um, I, I like your use of the word lens as a way to approach the archive because for me it was a matter of pulling the lens back a little bit and um, addressing sort of my own position in relation to the archive which was the book that I had encountered in the library. Um, and so, I mean, short answer, it was just a matter of uh, better understanding the way that my um, own positionality is um, addressed within the discipline in which I research um, and uh, recognizing that I continue to look at these images long after the book has been closed, that these images circulate time after time online. So, yeah. I think Megan... Oh, sure. Into it? Okay. I, uh, this, will, this is a short question. Uh, there's a lot of suffering across all three projects, and I wondered if you could uh, each answer where do you locate empathy in your projects? Because that seemed to be the inverse, perhaps, of what Jonathan, when you mentioned that this is about making knowledge. Uh, that's not the only thing our field does. So I'm wondering if you could all three speak to this idea of where does empathy fit in your projects? I can answer straight away. Um, the picture of the person who was ostensibly killed by retreating communist forces, you know, I feel that for me to get too deep into the level of empathy with that person, I don't know very much about that person at all. And then we, I think we get into some problematic territory about you know, going back to Bart and the photo as a myth and what is in the photo, what is it trying to tell us? Because the situation of, the situating of that photo, one could argue, was kind of Cold War propaganda and all that. I, I, to, to answer the question directly of where I find more empathy, it's with figures who I actually got to know a little bit better in the course of the research. So Max Desfor, not to compare his experience or, to a Korean peasant who was killed by Chinese forces, but I, I felt like I got 
a much more intimate picture into his life through his correspondence with his brother, um, what it was like to work on this 24-7 schedule and the labor of, of doing wire photography connected to global news centers. He didn't get a lot of sleep. His marriage basically fell apart. That's probably the closest that I got to a, 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 mo a more emotional rather than knowledge building uh, experience in the course of my research. So. Um, I think this is an incredibly important question, so thank you for asking this. Um, I think it's undeniable in the fact that our relationship to images and to objects, and for me, photography in particular, um, is a relationship that is uh, sort of subtended by uh, questions of empathy and questions of affective response. And that's why I continue to return to Tina Camp's work on listening to images, because I think it really gives us a model for how to work with images that is less a way of objectively reasoning with the content of their frames and more an understanding of how um, affective relations can be built and worked with and written in the writing of those images. Uh, so I think my empathetic uh, relationship with these images um, is a grappling, uh, like I say, not about, not about the subjects of the photographs, but with the conditions in which they have come to exist. Um, I don't think I can ever know these subjects, ever know these people, but like I say, I can hopefully uh, work with the archival conditions in which they have come to be subjected. Thank you. Um, that's uh, actually a very difficult question for me. And um, it, um, I think uh, the first thing I want to say is on, um, it's difficult to find empathy and create empathy when the subjects are anonymous. And so when you don't have subjectivities, that's something I struggled with a little bit. Um, and at the same time, um, Nicholas Mirzoff's work on Hurricane Katrina really helped me think through the uh, history and representation of natural disasters. Um, and, and thinking about the ramifications of how the ramifications um, of environmental disasters are largely on the poor. Um, they're often suffering the consequences of urbanization, environmental disasters, and that was exactly the case um, in colonial Bombay where it was the poor migrant workers, the lower class, who were suffering, um, the, uh, who suffered mostly from the plague epidemic. Um, and at the same time, they were seen as the vector of disease themselves. Um, and so, I think that's something that continues to have resonance in, um, I guess, our society today as well. And I think that's where I find empathy. Yeah. Thank you. OK, well, um, thank you. We will, um, what are we doing now? We're taking a break for half an hour. Oh, you're, and I just want to thank our three presenters for these great <laughs> Yes, thank you. We have coffee and cookies for you in the lobby, and we'll reconvene at 4 o'clock. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I think we're going to dive right into our third session of the day, starting with our next speaker, Holly Gore, who will be introduced by her advisor, Jenny Sorkin, both joining us from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Thank you for all staying through the, to the last session. I know this is the one to struggle through because everybody gets tired. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very pleased to, that this symposium is happening on the West Coast. Uh, and uh, I'm so pleased that my student Holly Gore was chosen by our department. Holly is a sixth year PhD candidate specializing in modern and contemporary art with a focus on American craft. Um, it's also quite notable that she has a background in making, which I think is something that is quite rare for art history uh, in the sense that uh, we don't often pull maybe enough from art departments um, with people who have actual hands-on knowledge of art practice. Uh, Holly was an art student who became a cabinet maker uh, and then a museum preparator for many years uh, and is planning to go back to museum work. And when Mary was talking this morning about the changing nature of our discipline, uh, it made me think a lot about the issues about uh, museum practice and sending students, doctoral students, into museum work, which used to be a kind of verboten territory. Uh, and now I think is something that uh, everybody's on board with. Um, and, and that is where Holly aims to locate her practice after graduating. Um, her current research focuses on the intersections of modernist art and design with skilled manual labor. Her dissertation, Reinventing Work, Modernist Wood and Skilled Trade, 1930 to 1970, investigates 20th century artists and designers as they used their performance of woodworking as a means to enacting American citizenship. The project has been supported by a loose fellowship in American art, a project grant from the Center for Craft, and a Margaret Mallory graduate fellowship at UCSB. In fall 2019, Holly was the Furniture Society resident writer at the Aramont School for Arts and Crafts. As a 2017-18 Wingate Curatorial Fellow at the Asheville Art Museum, she curated the multimedia exhibition Crafting Abstraction. And I'd like to welcome Holly to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you all for coming to this afternoon session and special thanks to everyone at the Getty who made this day possible. It's been a great day and I'm really pleased to have been able to participate. So the name of my paper is um, Cooperative Projects, the Socially Engaged Woodworking Classroom of Molly Gregory. A photograph from 1948 shows painter Joseph Albers teaching at Black Mountain College. In the picture, Albers appears with his back to the camera leading a class discussion. The scene is a color course that Albers famously developed with the aim of opening eyes to the interactivity of color and the subjectivity of perception. An image of the same event taken from a different angle brings to focus another lesson that was simultaneously taking place. The second photograph offers a better view of the art classroom itself. The white walls are bare and the windows undressed. The primary furnishings are blocky wood constructions upon which Albers and the students sit. At 1940s Black Mountain College, this austere interior was loaded with significance. The room was in the studies building, the visual icon and academic hub of the college's Lake Eden campus. In 1941, student and faculty volunteers built the studies building under the direction of local tradesmen in an heroic effort that saved the catastrophically underfunded school from having to close. As the walls and windows of the art classroom spoke of communal self-sufficiency, so did the furniture. Designed by college woodworking instructor Mary Gregory, or Molly as she was most often called, it was built by her students within a pedagogical framework of socially engaged craft. Mm -hmm. 
The furniture units that Gregory and her students fabricated were configurable to many different purposes. They functioned as seats, tables, step stools, pedestals, podiums, and workstations for making art. At a cash poor institution where supplies were always short, the making of such needed objects provided real life experience with building community, a lesson in social interaction. This paper investigates communal self-sufficiency as a cornerstone of Molly Gregory's woodworking practice. Gregory is marginally recognized in American modernism, a minor figure both within the history of Black Mountain College and American studio furniture. Her reputation as a designer rests on the work she did as an independent craftswoman in Lincoln, Massachusetts from 1953 until 1988. Among the functional woodworks she produced then were techn technically complex furnishings such as the multi-drawer cabinet, which is shown at left, um, overtly modern designs like the table at the lower right, and farm structures including the thatch-roofed chicken coop above. All the while Gregory was running her shop, she taught woodworking to school children part-time. Gregory's teaching is significant to the history of American modernism because it demonstrates that amateur woodworking in progressive educational settings was a crucible for hand-built utopias. In one sense, Gregory's creative agency is hard to see because she avoided a signature style, that recognizable touch that has long read as a mark of authentic personal expression. Her designs are heterogeneous, ranging from a Bauhaus-inflected bowl comprising a circle inscribed in a square to a chapel lectern whose decorative borders are carved with tiny animals. This paper finds consistency in Gregory's lifelong commitment to woodworking as a group endeavor in building idealized communities. It examines three instances of her engagement with cooperative projects. First, her training in New England progressive schools. Second, her teaching at Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And third, her initiation of a wood carving program at the Concord Academy, a private all-girls high school in Massachusetts. In all, Gregory furthered the participation of women and girls in constructing visionary environments, a mode of craft, or mode of modern craft, um, whose existence has been widely credited as an achievement of men. And here, just very quickly, are some visuals of Gregory at work in cooperative projects. Um, here she is in the woodworking shop at Black Mountain College, teaching at the Concord Academy, and much later in her life, shed, at a shed raising in somewhere probably in New England, circa 1980. Gregory was born in 1914 to affluent parents and grew up on a gentleman's farm in rural Massachusetts. At a young age, she learned to care for animals and fix things using tools. Such hands-on learning in the context of service, in this case to the Gregory family, was central to her formalized schooling, which was at the leading edge of progressive education. Broadly defined, progressive education was a late 19th to early 20th century reform movement that responded to anxieties surrounding industrialization, urbanization, immigration, and beginning in the 1930s, the rise of fascism in Europe. Progressive educators considered conventional rote learning as irrelevant to modern problems. The alternative methods they devised were to engage, to engage the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, with the goal of nurturing strength of character such as a healthy democracy required. Progressive curricula orchestrated experiential learning through nature study, art practice, and instruction in functional craft. As with the farm chores of Gregory's youth, this training was by no means con conceived as vocational, but as foundational to developing good citizenship. As a child, Gregory attended the private press progressive all-girls Beaver Country Day School. In 1932, she was among the first entering class at Bennington College for Women in Vermont. Bennington was an experimental liberal arts college, being among the first to adopt the progressive methodologies that numerous primary and secondary schools used. At Bennington, Gregory majored in sculpture, studying in the academic tradition with figurative artist Simon Maselcio. When Gregory graduated in 1936 with the declared aim of being a sculptor, she started down an unlikely path. It was the height of the Great Depression. Women were all but excluded from the fine arts of painting and sculpture. And furthermore, her training was in the progressive spirit of personal development, oriented more toward producing character and class distinctions than a viable career in art. 
the more acceptable profession for a woman of Gregory's education, was teaching, which is what she initially did. For five years after Bennington, Gregory taught art and class at the Cambridge School of Weston, a private progressive high school in a suburb of Boston. There, she began learning about woodworking in a progressive framework by assisting shop instructor Alfred Holst. The workshop where Holst taught, a freestanding building called the Hobby House, had extraordinary significance. In 1932, students and teachers at the school had built it themselves with Holst in the lead. Though the project was complete by the time of Gregory's arrival, the ideas that supported it were still in force. The Hobby House belonged to a genre, a genre of progressive educational building projects whose most illustrious example was at the Laboratory School in Chicago, a primary school run by prominent educational reformer John Dewey. In 1899, Laboratory School students raised a small clapboard outbuilding called the Clubhouse, and this project is shown um, at left. Oh, sorry, that's at right. The yellow slide is the, is the Clubhouse. Um, and they did so purported, pur purportedly of their own initiative and with limited guidance from adults. The pedagogy that supported this self-directed enterprise had it that in a collaborative building project, students would learn aspects of math, engineering, and economics integrated with lessons in sociability. Both the clubhouse and the hobby house construction were notable as scenarios where women, men, boys, and girls performed work that was ordinarily men only. For Gregory, Exposure to woodworking at the Cambridge School bolst bolstered her already impressive credentials as a progressive educator. It also gave her rare access to a masculinized skill set. A pivotal moment in Gregory's career came in 1941, when she took a one-year teaching apprentice with Joseph Albers at Black Mountain College. Established in 1933, a year after Bennington, Black Mountain resembled its sister school for its bucolic mountainside setting and its application of progressive curricula to the education of young adults. Gregory wrote on her apprenticeship application that she was a working artist and hoped to teach sculpture. Albers, though, would only endorse her insofar as she was willing to teach woodworking, a lower status helper discipline that supported his art department as well as campus operations. Despite what discontents the scenario may have brought about, Gregory joined the faculty after her apprenticeship had ended, first as instructor of craft and then as woodworking instructor. In her time at Black Mountain College from 1941 until 1947, Gregory took a leading role in the utopian project of building a creative, self-sustaining community. Communal self-sufficiency was an ideal that defined Black Mountain College of the 1940s. The gritty manner in which it manifested grew out of an unusual administrative structure. Toward the preservation of academic freedom, the college had no board of trustees, an arrangement that left it without a reliable source of money. Uh, student and faculty workers pitched in to keep costs low. Organized in a work program, they performed such tasks as hauling coal, cutting firewood, and clearing cafeteria dishes. The work program kicked into high gear in 1941 when the college lost its lease on a rented facility and committed to building a new campus. The site was a former boys' summer camp at a pond called Lake Eden. In summer of 1941, work program volunteers winterized the existing camp lodges and helped to erect the studies building, uh, which architecture, architect A. Lawrence Coker had designed. The studies building project resembled the clubhouse and the hobby house construction for its use of amateur workers within a moralizing framework. But there was a market shift of emphasis in that the studies building was no ancillary outbuilding. It was the academic heart of the campus. And on the screen uh, at right, those are students, student workers building the studies building. And uh, so they're amateur, amateur stonemasons there um, setting the foundation. When Gregory arrived at Black Mountain in 1941, the fall semester started one month late because the Lake Eden construction was not sufficiently complete. Gregory, having brought with her what she later described as, quote, a shocking amount of tools which everyone thought was rather conspicuous, end quote, took the lead in finishing the studies building interior. Next, she supervised a work program crew in building a faculty cottage. 
in the woodworking shop that she ran, she and her students produced a steady stream of needed articles. In addition to the modular furniture units, there were tables, stools, benches, shelves, partitions, cabinets, bed stands, drain boards, easels, blackboards, a dog house, a projection table and screen, a table and shelf com combination for coffee urn and cups, a bed for the international truck, and a two-story trash chute for the studies building. While Gregory responded to demands from senior faculty for things that would make the campus livable, she also took initiative in determining what livable should mean and how the community should strive to live. Years afterward, Gregory recalled that Black Mountain College was unique in that, quote, most people there, faculty and students, were really involved in a creative awareness of each other, end quote. That this observation reflects an ideal that Gregory had worked to further shows in her advising of Black Mountain student Beata Gropius, or Addie as she was called, and Addie Gropius was the adoptive daughter of um, Walter Gropius, the famed uh, Bauhaus architect and his wife, Issei. Uh, so one time, Gregory organized Addie Gropius and four other female students in fashioning mahogany forks and spoons. Gregory then used these items to set a table in the studies building classroom for a birthday brunch where she flambéed crepe Suzettes in a makeshift kitchen for a dozen or so guests. Afterward, the birthday person kept the handmade utensils for a gift. At 1940s Black Mountain College, such endeavors and self-entertainment had moral gravitas. The school was effectively an island, culturally and geographically isolated, where faculty, students, and staff lived and worked year-round. A governing tenet was that the well-being of the community demanded the sociability of individuals, not only in terms of their willingness to cooperate with work program chores, but to give of themselves on a personal level. Addie Gropius admitted her struggles with this ethic in a love letter to her college boyfriend, describing her attempts at being, quote, good and social, end quote. The deeds she claimed to her credit were several, attending a dinner where she sang for an audience, committing to help with bookkeeping for the college farm, and working in Gregory's shop to produce a table for a classroom and a set of walnut bowls for a lovelorn friend. A drawing in the letter's margin matches Gropius's bowls to the Gregory design. And on the screen at left is a photograph from Gregory's portfolio showing the bowl design, and then at right is Gropius's letter, and it's the lower of the two drawings in that left-hand margin is matches the bowl. So it shows that she was making, making the project based on Gregory's model. Um, the gift-giving aspect of Gropius's bowl-making endeavor suggests further emulation of Gregory. Still, Gropius worried that she was, quote, the most irritating socially ungifted creature, end quote. This was a self-perception with which Gregory concurred and which she likely contributed. In one instance, Gregory criticized Gropius in a meeting where faculty discussed student progress. After one person praised Gropius's hard work in making costumes for a play, Gregory retorted that the arduousness of the project was the girl's own fault, her having become, quote, quite unpopular with the students. She cannot seem to get them to help her, end quote. Contextualized in this way, Gropius's social anxiety reads, rings as perception of her own aloofness as a moral shortcoming, a deficit that woodworking could perhaps remediate. Gregory's cooperative projects at Black Mountain College were, on one level, typical progressive education. As with the child carpenters of the laboratory school clubhouse, her students took tools in hand to grasp, in metaphoric terms, the values of cooperative enterprise. But Gregory complicated the progressive model in that her practice privileged the making of extraordinary objects, a manifestation of her drive to work as an artist and or furniture designer. Her straightforward, sturdy constructions were not sculpture, nor were they high style design. Their humble contours, however, belied lofty ideals. Former Black Mountain student Dorothy Ruddick Cole credited Gregory with contributing to a campus environment that resembled, quote, a chapel. End quote, and whose material culture was, in her estimation, all too rarefied. Cole said, I think it was because of the people around Albers, people like Molly Gregory, that newcomers who were put off by a conscious style felt that there was something perhaps affected about Black Mountain because that was its most conspicuous part. White walls, straw matting, and one plant, an absence of ornateness, a contempt for the Baroque or the Romantic, 
and I mean this far beyond visual things, but as a way of life. Cole's perception of the spare studies building interior was of a coded nonverbal communication. For those who, unlike her, incline sort toward such morality in the everyday, the objects of Gregory's cooperative projects had explicit value for their capacity to nudge a community toward its better self. Mid-century educators, students, and parents who were involved with progressive education constituted an eager audience for woodworks that spoke the virtues of cooperative community. This much is evident in the activities of a woodworking shop that Gregory established in 1956 at the Concord Academy, a private high school for girls, where her work involved the construction of an actual chapel. During the summer of 1956, Gregory joined a small group of Concord Academy teachers and their spouses who had volunteered to move an historic Baptist meeting house to the school grounds. Gregory designed a vestibule addition for the soon-to-be Concord Academy chapel and participated in the construction. Hired to teach woodworking classes that fall, she brought student workers to the project. She designed and her students helped to build a steeple that a crane hoisted atop the chapel on Columbus Day 1961. By then, her classroom had also generated collaborative student-made wood carvings for the chapel interior. These included a panel carved with a verse from the Christian Bible, a border of two dramatically elongated angles to flank it, a console memorizing, memorializing the child of an alumnae, and a lectern whose decorative borders were made of animalia. A pen-drawn illustration by a Concord Academy student that was printed in a school publication of 1958 suggests an idealistic understanding of these woodworking endeavors. It pictures a carving in progress whose chiseled lettering spells citizenship. The illustration aligns with a the progressive theory of craft as productive of character, while it also illustrates a real event. In 1957, Concord Academy headmistress Elizabeth Hall went into the shop that Gregory had set up in a campus basement and carved a series of plaques. These were intended for use in a system of student awards and commemorated character traits that Hall dubbed, quote, the 10 deadly virtues, end quote. These were cleanliness, citizenship, generosity, initiative, honesty, self-respect, friendliness, perseverance, responsibility, and consideration. By using a value-laden medium to fashion material tokens of communal values, Hall made explicit a purpose that was common to the chapel and its carvings, to remind the community of right action while affirming the manner in which it had already proven itself ideal. So in conclusion, histories of American modernism abound with instances of utopian design. A photograph from 1948 showing students at Black Mountain College links to three of them. First, the Arbuckminster Fuller Dome that the young men hold aloft portends the adaptations of Fuller's designs that were to populate 1960s countercultural communities such as Colorado's Drop City, so in here. Um, second, among the students who were present at the back Black Mountain Dome event was Arthur Borick, a carpenter whose book, Handmade Houses, A Guide to the Wood Butcher's Art, from 1973, and here's a page from that book, documented the, quote, old timers and, quote, rambunctious young dudes who built their off-the-grid lifestyles into California redwood forests. A third reference to hand-built utopia in the photograph resides in the cube-like wood constructions upon which the students are standing, Gregory's modular furniture units. In use one year after she left Black Mountain, they gestured toward an ideal that perme permeated the whole of her collaborative projects of community that was self-organizing and creative in tending to its needs, where distinctions between teachers, students, and artists were permeable, and which supported a workforce of all ages and genders. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Elizabeth Newsom from the Visual Arts Department at the University of California at San Diego, and I'm pleased to present my graduate advisee, Brianne Taya. Um, Brianne is a 2013 BA from UCLA. Um, she's earned an MA in Art History Theory and Criticism in the Department of Visual Arts, and she is now a doctoral candidate in art history theory and criticism. Um, her research focuses on the art of Mesoamerica with an emphasis on classic period Maya ceramics. <coughs> and um, here is another student whose background lies in art production and curatorial experience in ceramics in particular. And she has uh, traveled extensively through um, the Mayan-speaking re regions. Um, she has been awarded a fellowship from the Open School of Ethnography to study the Yucatec Maya language in Merida in the Yucatan. And um, she has been working closely with artists and artisans who are working in the Maya area to produce traditional style handicrafts. Um, Brianne's approach is focusing upon Maya ceramics from the standpoint of ontology, materiality, and issues of embodiment and being. So I will now introduce Brianne and the embodied chocolate pot. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to the Getty for organizing this and everyone in attendance today. So for the ancient Maya, everything was understood to be alive, from features of the natural environment, such as mountains and cenotes, to elements of the constructed landscape, like temple pyramids and stela. Such a notion of animacy extends the conventional understanding of personhood to encapsulate not only the human individual, but everything, both living and non-living, that has agency. Everything that has subjectivity and the ability to exact influence on other subjects. Personhood is not neatly bound into a single entity, as was postulated by Rene Descartes, but rather it can be understood as divisible and distributed. In her research on Melanesia, Marilyn Strathern argues that the singular person is a social microcosm. Melanesian persons, according to Strathern, are as individually as they are individually conceived. They are, the construct, they are constructed as the plural and composite site of the relationships that produce them. The individual and the collective, therefore, are interchangeable. Zoe Crossland builds on this concept to argue that personhood is not only divisible, but it is also distributed. Personhood extends beyond the physical confines of the biological body to encompass bodily secretions and the material objects with which bodies use and interact. Such an understanding of the distributed person, as Crossland argues, allows an extension of the concept of embodiment so that it does not rest upon a bounded and naturalized physicality or indeed assume a unified and bounded sense of self, but can be expressed through materials that are distributed and circulated away from the body. Such concepts of personhood, I believe, allow the opportunity to reconsider the role of ceramics in the ancient Maya civilization. I want to focus my inquiries on a single pot titled Lidded Tripod Cylinder Vessel with Head of Cacao Deity, addressing the question of function. A large number of ceramics were looted, therefore lacking provenance or provenience. However, with the handful of vessels that have been archaeologically excavated, scholars have determined that ceramics functioned as utilitarian objects used in ritual and daily activities, as funerary offerings, and as social currency exchanged between polities as gifts, reinforcing and establishing diplomatic relations and alliances. I want to expand this further by exploring how these ceramics may have functioned in relation to notions of personhood and embodiment. The lidded tripod cylinder dates approximately to the 5th century CE. The blackware vessel measures 11 and a half inches in height by five and a fourth inches in diameter. It is roughly twice as tall as it is wide, mimicking the proportions of human form. The vessel itself reads as a body with certain articulated body parts. Like a biological body, the vessel is a container. The, this equation of body and pot 
is further supported by the late and terminal classic Entierros Infantiles, recovered from the Mexican states of Campeche and Tabasco. Ollas, or water pots, were used to contain fetal or child remains. Children in Maya conceptions of individuals were not considered fully developed, and by carefully placing these bodies inside the ollas, they were metaphorically returned to the womb, known to be a dark and watery place. Moreover, the lidded tripod cylinder is also legible as a human body because it stands on legs and feet, and it is surmounted by a human-like head of the cacao deity, identified by the loop-like partitions of hair and the aquiline shape of the nose. This corporeality, however, is further manifested through metaphor. A layer of stucco applied post-fire wrapped around the body of the vessel and lid can be perceived, I hope to demonstrate, as clothing and by extension, a second skin. The stucco is painted with a red iron-based pigment. Eight medallions, which appear around the body and lid of the vessel, are bisected diagonally. The left half is painted with a malachite pigment, producing a light blue hue, while the right half remains an off-white color. Within each medallion is an incised glyph made using a stylus-type tool to scratch ink into the stuccoed surface. The feet and knob of the vessel remain unstuccoed, suggesting the stucco, like clothing, was meant to cover just the body. The, this design of medallions on stuccoed surface recalls a figure from a mural uncovered on the cheek knob structure at Calacamul in Campeche, Mexico, who wears a diaphanous blue wepeel embellished with orange cartouches containing abstract animal forms, which appear to mimic glyphs, and a row of hieroglyphic texts bordering the bottom edge of the garment. The glyphs lining the garment are in the style of a primary standard sequence or PSS text, which if legible would indicate the name of the owner of the wheat peel. Simon Martin identified one glyph as K, but he believes these are pseudo glyphs based on their cursive appearance. The stuccoed clothing wrapped around the lidded tripod cylinder similarly carries the PSS, but unlike the wheat peel, it is legible. The glyphs on the body of the vessel read Uchim Tasuts Cacao Ahau, or his cup for tree fresh chocolate lord. The owner of the clothing is the cacao deity who, happens, who also happens to be portrayed as the knob of the vessel. The statement of ownership appears on a multitude of items such as pots, precious jade implements, shells, and bones and can be understood in terms of the distributed personhood. They are the material extensions of the body which people use in the ultimate formation and projection of identity becoming integral to personhood. In addition to clothing, the cacao deity also wears ear flares. His hair is wrapped in paper or cloth and adorned with beads, material objects that socialize the body, transforming it into a person. The cheeks of the cacao deity have incised marks that may reference scarification. Stephen Houston, David Stewart, and Carl Tauba expand on Marcel Mauss's technique of the body, which focuses on movement and interaction between the body and objects to include another technique of the body, one that considers its ornamentation, whether by dress, paint, tattooing, or physical deformation. Such surface modifications, according to the authors, are focal because they involve the social skin, the frontier of the social self that serves as a symbolic stage upon which the drama of socialization is enacted. These material and decorative markers transform the pot, an artificial body, into a socialized body, just as humans would be perceived if they too carried these external ornaments of decoration. Moreover, through this external decoration, the pot is understood to be a specific body. It is perceived to be the body of the cacao deity, and therefore the cacao deity himself. The social body is the body that is perceived as an individual by other individuals. The contemporary Zeltel Maya identified two types of human bodies, a carnal body shared with animals and a specifically human phenomenological body. The carnal body is the flesh body, the bak etal. It is the union of flesh and bodily fluids making up the whole that is divisible into parts, an object that is sentient, though lacking the capacity to relate socially to other beings, and that represents the substantial homogeneity between humans and animals. The bakhtal is the natural body in which blood circulates. The glyphs on the body of the vessel refer not only to the cacao deity, but they also identify its contents, soots cacao or tree fresh chocolate, it, and its function as a chocolate cup. Liquid chocolate was equated with blood. Cacao pods for the Aztecs and likely their southern predecessors as well symbolized the human heart. 
In containing chocolate, therefore, the vessel, like the human body, was imbued with the life essence of blood. The pot itself, then, can be understood as the bakatal, the natural body through which blood pulsates. The phenomenological body, on the other hand, is known as winkilel. It is a presence body, an active subject capable of perception, feeling, and cognition, committed to an intersubjective relationship with bodies of the same species. The winkilel is the figure, the body shape, the face, the way of speaking, of walking, of dressing. It is a socialized body that has identity, individuality, and is meant to be perceived by others. The bakatal, in its natural state, is undifferentiated from animals, but when it masks itself through external decoration, the bak etal transforms into the winky lel. Ween, the root of winky lel, is associated with power, the capacity to do things, the face, the eye, the body, surface, oneself, facade, wrapping, and also mask. If the basic pot is understood as the bak etal, then the pot as the cacao deity, identified by his external accoutrements, which mask the bak etal, is simultaneously the winky lel. While the initial section of the PSS identifies the cacao deity, the second part, which continues on the lid, identifies the owner of the vessel itself, Nats Chan Ak, followed by his title, Sok Chuen. This statement, like the naming of the cacao deity, discussed early in this paper, functions as a claim of ownership and a projection of identity. Referring to Stone Stila, David Stewart observes that the statements of ownership identify both the patrons who commissioned the sculpture, as well as the portrait subjects who are depicted on these monuments. With this in mind, the statements of ownership indicate that the lidded tripod cylinder embodies the cacao deity in simultaneously Nats Chan Ak. Based on the relatively pristine condition of the stucco coating, as well as the color combinations of red and blue, each symbolizing the dualities of life and death, we can assume this vessel was recovered from a tomb and therefore functioned as a funerary offering. Within this context, the lidded tripod cylinder becomes an external material manifestation of its owner, Nats Chan Ak. The glyph Uyuchib, or his cup, is a name tag signifying this ownership and identifying the cup as an extension of the body and personhood. Rosemary Joyce notes that around 1400 to 1100 BCE, subfloor burials at Puerto Escondido, Honduras, began not with human remains, but rather with body ornaments removable items of costume, badges of status, or group affiliation, which were linked to the identities of the persons who wore them. Such objects have permanence, unlike the human body. At Puerto Escondido, while such objects as pendant figurines and ear spools were placed in subfloor burials and caches, their deceased human owners were deposited in mountain caves. With this example, it becomes apparent that permanent objects can stand in for the person who wore or used them. Ceramics, like the lidded tripod cylinder, similarly have permanence, outlasting and indexing the lives of their human owners. The presence of these material objects and burials, therefore, underlines them not only as extensions of the body and personhood, but as embodiments of their owners. The lidded tripod cylinder, then, is understood as a double embodiment the cacao, of the cacao deity and Nats Chanak. The cacao deity, among other fruit trees in Maya mythology, is born from the deceased body of the maize god. The maize deity, through sacrifice, provides sustenance for humans who are understood to be made from corn dough. It is not completely implausible to assume that humans made of maize similarly had a regenerative potential in death. This perhaps is the connection between Nats Chanak, a king in life, and his embodiment as the cacao deity in death. Notions of rebirth, regeneration, and embodiment may be further explained through examining the relationship between pot and architecture. In terms of form, the lid of the vessel appears to mimic the sloped thatched roof of traditional houses in the Maya region. The three legs or feet may reference a goben, a three stone hearth found in Maya structures. When establishing a place, a community, building a house or a new structure, the first thing that one does is drill a fire in order to domesticate that space, delineating it as separate from nature and creating a link between the gods and place. The three legs of life of the lidded tripod cylinder may therefore reference this three stone hearth, and as such, a direct line is forged connecting the cacao deity to Nats Chanak. References to house structures link this pot to the previously mentioned subfloor burials, which transform domestic spaces into places of curation, transformation, and regeneration of enduring social persona. 
When a family member died, his or her material possessions and things used in everyday life that were not entombed were broken or burned, releasing the owner's soul. The house in which the deceased lived in during life and was buried beneath in death was raised, creating the foundation for a new house to be constructed by surviving family members. The corpse of the deceased becomes a part of the new construction, literally providing the foundation on which future generations will live. By burying deceased family members under the floor of a residential space, the surviving relatives strengthen their rights to and control over the material as well as immaterial possessions of their ancestors. Intangible property, which seems to be even more valuable than physical property among the Maya, comprises names, official titles, rights, and souls, and is enduring, outliving the human being who appropriates them. Subfloor burials created a direct link, connecting surviving relatives to their ancestors, further legitimating ownership, rights, and status. Names specifically played a critical role in concepts of Kesh and regeneration. Kesh, or Keshel, translates across several Mayan languages as exchange, substitute, replacement, representative, and namesake. One type of Kesh deals with notions of rebirth. Maya groups believe believe that um, when a person dies, his or her soul re-enters a pool of souls and will later come back into this world as a newborn baby. Because they are limited in number and because souls are collectively owned in tangible property, families will do certain things to encourage the return and rebirth of the souls of their deceased relations. One way is through the use of subfloor burials. Another way to encourage soul regeneration is through the reuse of first names. Children among the Maya are identified as the Kesh replacement for their grandparents through say, shared names with children being named after one of their grandparents. This perhaps offers insight into the significance of the two names that appear on the lidded tripod cylinder, Kakao Ahau, or Lord, and Nats Chanak. Susan Gillespie notes that through the transfer of a name and accompanying soul from one body to another, or as the exchange of one body for another, the Maya achieved a form of immortality. If names have the ability to outlive their corporeal counterparts, then the appearance of the name Nats Chanak on a vessel is significant in that this vessel itself functions in preserving the name. Words written on permanent materials, either painted on ceramics or carved into stone, are capable of outliving the human body. The appearance of both names, however, seems to be equally, if not more important. Together, the two names identify this vessel in a certain sense as a microcosm, a compact recreation of the process of rebirth and regeneration. The appearance of Nats Chanak on a vessel that on one level mimics a house and in doing so references the function of subfloor burials and on another level references the body of the cacao deity, performs the process of transferring the soul from Nats Chanak, who survives or is present in the name itself, to the cacao deity. The, de the deity thus assumes the role of guardian and protector, ensuring that Nats Chanak continues to live even after death. The king becomes immortal twice over, first through the preservation of his name on a permanent material, and second through his rebirth as the cacao deity. Fire may play a crucial role in the vessel's regenerative function. Not only is fire referenced by the three feet and legs in the relationship to the three stone hearth, but it is also alluded to in the material. Ceramics go through a transformative process in the kiln. Clay sourced from lake beds or access points to the feminine underworld originates in a place that is cold, and coldness is related to disease and death. But when clay is exposed to fire, it transforms into a durable object, a container like the human body that can hold things, such as liquids, foods, or perhaps even souls. Fire is related through heat to life and power, as warmth is associated with vitality, the heart, and blood. Fire was used to purify and vivify space. Perhaps the firing of clay is one of several ways in which ceramics can be activated, making them appropriate containers in the preservation and regeneration of souls. Moreover, the color red symbolizes solar vitality. It is the color of sunrise, the cyclical and daily birth of the sun that gives rise to life on this planet, and heat created through the regenerative qualities of fire. Oftentimes, the corpses of kings were painted in red cinnabar, imbuing the bodily remains with solar heat, combating the cold earthiness of decay and ensuring rebirth. 
Red pigments and stucco were also used to cover structures such as temple pyramids in classic Maya cities, imbuing them with life. The red pigment on the lidded tripod cylinder surely carries the same significance. A final point I want to make addresses the vessel's sensorial aspects. As an embodied and animate vessel that contains, preserves, and regenerates souls, it is, use, it is also useful to think about the vessel's agency. Through sensorial engagement, the vessel guides its viewer's actions. The wraparound compositional format of the PSS text impedes complete, holistic, and instantaneous visual perception, instead allowing the vessel to reveal its painted surface in front of the eyes of the viewer. The person holding the vessel has to turn it clockwise once to read the glyphs on the body and a second time to read the text on the lid. Yeah. Glyphic texts were likely read aloud, engaging the auditory senses. Mayan languages are tonal, characterized by high and low accents as well as glottal stops. They have a musical quality, suggesting these glyphs were intended to be heard rather than read silently. Mesoamerican writing, according to Houston and Talba, was not so much an inert or passive record, but a device thought to speak or sing through vocal readings or performance. The human then becomes the instrument and voice through which the glyphs are vocalized. The fragrant scent of chocolate appeals to the olfactory senses, impelling the drinker to inhale its odor first and then drink it, activating the gustatory senses. The agency of the vessel manifests through the sensorial experience that it creates. The vessel prompts its viewers to feel, look, speak, smell, and taste, appealing to the tactile, visual, auditory, olfactory, and gustatory senses, becoming an all-encompassing sensorial experience. The sensorial invites viewers to engage with a vessel that is an active, animate embodiment of Nats Chanak. To conclude, this paper considers how ceramic vessels may have functioned in their original context, beyond their already established uses of utility, grave goods, and social currency. Using the lidded tripod cylinder as my primary case study, I explored notions of embodiment and personhood to argue that this vessel, in its construction, symbolism, and materiality, keeps Nats Chanak alive for all of eternity. Hello all, my name is Jamie Nisbet. I am on the faculty at UC Irvine and this winter leading the Graduate Consortium Seminar here at the GRI. As this is the final faculty introduction of the day, let me say what a terrific, a terrific symposium this has been. My sincere thanks to Mary Miller, Andrew Perchuk, Rebecca Peabody, Jennifer De La Fuente, all the staff involved in its brilliant organization and seamless execution, those participating from MA programs in LA, and from the Atlanta University Center Collective, my various colleagues from across the great state of California, and of course, all our brilliant speakers who make this possible. This really is a remarkable event. It's my genuine pleasure now to introduce Scott Volz, who is a fourth year PhD candidate in the Visual Studies program at UCI. This academic year, Scott has begun work on a dynamic dissertation project currently titled Aftermath, Waste and Ecology in the Art of the 1970s and 80s, which explores artistic responses to problems of ecological violence in urban, infrastructural, and geopolitical arenas, focusing in particular on the area of Greater New York City, or in other words, the kind of dense and diverse urban environment that has not previously been the focus of art history's eco-critical topics of study. Scott came to our program following the completion of an MA in Art History and Criticism from Stony Brook University, and before that completed a BA in Art History at Kent State. He is a co-founder of the Climate Features Collective at UCI, and will be staging a graduate conference this spring on the subject of fluid borders. Please join me in welcoming Scott. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for that very kind introduction. Thank you also to the GRI for putting this on today, all of the presenters, the Getty organizers, and the Getty staff who made this event possible. It's been really great, and I'm proud to be part of it.
we are looking at a representation of an ecological catastrophe, an aftermath. In the picture on the screen above, John Fechner, an intermedia artist best known for eco-critical street graffiti, has slathered an oozy layer of tar sealer across a found landscape painting that he picked up in the summer of 1985 while prowling Queens, New York, in search of similar pieces of refuse. Imagining a field swamped with toxic sludge, the remade canvas appeared in a series of pollution paintings reflecting on hazardous waste disasters titled X Americana X. In the time since this painting was made, tar sealer has become banned in many places because of its toxicity. A news article asking, could your driveway be making you sick? Linked the technology to contamination. During the so-called toxic decade of the 1980s, the danger of industrial contamination inspired more anxiety than any other environmental concern. News that Love Canal, a blue collar neighborhood in Niagara Falls, New York, had slowly and steadily been poisoned with buried chemical wastes sensationalized the nation when the story broke in 1978. Not unlike the coagulation of tar sealer in aftermath, liquid wastes were reported as oozing up through the soil of this planned community in such quantities that noxious pools rotted in the open air or seeped into architectural spaces. Fechner, angered by the events at Love Canal, traveled with his graffiti crew to the offices of the disgraced Hooker Chemical Company and vandalized corporate property with buckets of household paint. While the contamination of Love Canal eventually became, after bitter grassroots struggle, the first of the country's Superfund sites, myriad revel revelations of discriminatory and haphazard disposal practices in other areas of the United States reshaped psychosocial relationships with surrounding ecologies. The body and the home, if previously considered autonomous entities, were now seen as entangled with a multitude of environmental conditions, which chemical pollution marked and also destroyed. The 1985 series of paintings, Ex Americana X, draws from this field of shifting perceptual relations. I maintain that the series provides a layered meditation on the logic and affect of waste through simulated devastation and the manipulation of post-consumer objects. On the one hand, with their straightforward messages about pollution and decay, the pictures critically deconstruct the pictorial and ideological rhetoric of mass market landscape paintings. But more than a canny takedown of stale nature tropes, the series delineates the spatial character of waste through a process of actual physical movement in which the paintings geographically circulate through phases of disposal and transformation. Whether household rubbish or hazardous material, refuse perpetually navigates and withdraws from multiple disposal trajectories. Fechner's formulation of toxic agents as being in motion and liable to enter the home replicates waste's unstable process and, as a result, elicits the period's widespread fears of chemical contamination. In this capacity, Ex Americana X operates with rhetorical, formal, and affective force, satirizing ingrained landscape conventions and destabilizing everyday geographies. To assemble Ex Americana X, Fechner would drive around Queens, scanning secondhand sales and roadside detritus for discarded kitsch. The objects he collected consisted mostly of mass market decorative commodities, sometimes referred to as sofa art or schlock art, and were entirely landscape images. As multiple studies show, landscapes dominated the market for low-cost consumer artworks during this period. Some retailers stocked their inventory with over 70% landscapes in order to please high demand for the reported best sellers. In the home, the popularity of the landscape genre among non-specialists outpaced all other pictorial categories by a wide margin regardless of economic position, 
of the household's economic position. The emotional appeal of mass market landscapes included the frankness of subject matter and qualities of sentimentality, nostalgia, and tranquility. For this reason, the images typically follow a formulaic set of manufacturing procedures and are commonly generated with an assembly line of subspecialist painters. In general, landscapes deferential to traditional academic principles of organization and realism were favored for offering a calm aesthetic that was familiar in content and not overly complex in style. In line with these findings, the painted views of nature that Fechner salvaged from the curbside or thrift bin invariably reveal a sedate portrayal of the pastoral, with placid waters and distant mountains predictably laid out. But the added overpainting lampoons encoded ideas about land and country with darkly humorous irony. The construction of the serene landscape, historically, has factored into a racialized class fantasy in which access to nature constitutes health and prosperity. Because white landowners have conflated urban civilization with moral decay since at least the late 18th century, depictions of an untouched but peaceful wilderness serve to reinforce the illusion of rural purity that has become a key underpinning of the suburban ideal. In place of idyllic nature, Ex Americana X presents the spectacle of a contaminated environment. Words and icons stenciled in spray paint warn that the still visible tranquil settings have devolved into toxic territories. For Fechner, the stylized inscriptions engage a personal aesthetic ethos in which a brevity of form is intended to surfeit mnemonic or speculative associations about the unseen whereas blocky serif typeface stamps apparent degradation with bureaucratic facticity, conjuring the legal and institutional apparatuses circumscribing contamination, seven-segment digital lettering elicits media references to quote-unquote toxic time bombs and marks toxicity as a material residue of the era's emerging informational systems of global communication and exchange. Hence, the double X of the series' title serves to bracket and negate the mythos of Americana culture through a play of reversals that substitutes ruin for the national ideal. Significantly, while Fechner rejects the postulation of untainted nature, his deconstructive gesture stays with the straightforward rhetoric typical of commercially manufactured sentimental imagery. What makes the objects humorous is the suggestion that Fechner paints the landscape in a natural state, as if having merely stumbled upon it. In a statement for Ex Americana X, Fechner, an academically trained painter with a Master of Fine Arts degree, plays the amateur, stating he became a Sunday painter in order to sardonically communicate that the renderings truthfully represent the landscape through a sort of naive honesty. The original iconography of comforting outdoor settings and the added configurations of industrial corrosion in this sense complement one another in their mutual fidelity to a proposed verisimilitude. For some, nevertheless, the paintings could be too heavy-handed. A review in the New York Times welcomed Fechner's intervention in this register of commercial culture, and it commended him for not tempering the work's social critique. But the review also lamented that the images occasionally belabor their commentary. In the picture above, an apocalyptic fantasy portraying two small children gazing upon a nuclear blast, the pair of white arrows thrusting inwards from the upper left register, according to the reviewer, cheapen a picture already occupied by atomic annihilation and an unnaturally blackened sky. Taken on its own, the assessment very well may ring true. Obviously, no child could withstand such proximity to a nucle nuclear detonation, so why the insistence on this point? If they weren't incinerated by the blinding heat of the explosion, 
then certainly radiation would scar their bodies with disease. Do viewers really need this fact clarified? What is missing in this critical assessment is a fuller understanding of the significance of the arrows as context-specific linguistic signs. The icons do not simply trace the ballistic trajectory of the missile from left to right and reveal its victims. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Fechner systematically explored the sign systems and material infrastructures of driving and car culture in his graffiti, electronic and object-based work, frequently even using the bodies of abandoned vehicles as ground for spray-painted stencils. In the above painting, the two arrows reproduce road markers of the type found on the pavement of traffic intersections. The symbols, therefore, simultaneously describe the figurative illusion of a darkened firmament and a field of asphalt. The blacked out sky signals impending nuclear winter, but also transforms the air's open space into the flat ground of a paved street in the manner of collage. This double entendre links atomic warfare's spectacular mode of planetary necropolitics with large scale automobile based infrastructural development as two sides in a wider continuum of environmental violence. Fechner's reference here as in other works utilizing either literal or metaphorical blacktop, such as Aftermath, the first painting we saw, the reference here to the visual and material culture of motor vehicles imbues the interventions with notions of mobility that are essential to understanding how the works simulate the corrosive restlessness of toxic agents. To demonstrate this point, it is necessary to consider the site specificity of the Ex Americana X series of paintings. The majority of Ex Americana X was produced outdoors near the industrial lowlands of the Maspeth neighborhood of Queens. Situated beside the Long Island Expressway and surrounded by graveyards, Fechner painted each picture en plein air amid the noise and fumes of passing vehicles many of which would have been large trucks exiting for nearby warehouses. The precise location where this process took place was beneath the upper tier of the Long Island Expressway, or LIE, in an area where the road vertically divides into a double-decker system, one level stacked on top of another, in order to regulate the flow of traffic through an interchange with the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. As demonstrated on the map above, this area constitutes a major arterial junction in the outer boroughs. The east-west axis of the LIE, which spans the entirety of Long Island and links the city to the suburbs, intersects with the north-south axis of the BQE and forms what is essentially an enormous X shape straddling large swaths of Brooklyn and Queens. And with this, I think you can see the quiet pun that holds in the title X Americana X. This location on the LIE was a frequent space of artistic production for Fechner. From the late 1970s on, he spray painted a series of murals on the bearing wall of the upper tier that focused most often on themes of ecology and waste and which utilized a similar pictorial language as the recycled canvases. Two murals, for instance, protested controversial waste shipping procedures in which trucks from Brookhaven National Laboratory hauled radioactive sludge west through the expressway into New York City and then out of state. If the advantage of this site for the murals was the ability to broadcast a message to a large audience of truckers and commuters, what enticed Fechner for Ex Americana X was the smoggy atmosphere of the location. The area ranks among the borough's lowest in terms of air quality due to industry and traffic density. So while Fechner worked, microscopic pollution coughed out by passing vehicles was thought to settle on the fresh liquid pigment, which, or I'm sorry, where, to his delight, it became part of the chemical and material fabric of the work itself. The surface accumulation of ambient particulate matter 
thereby imbricates the self-contained object, or formerly self-contained object, with the historical composition of air in this corner of Queens. As a performative process, the artistic remaking of discarded commodities tapped into contemporaneous divisions within art critical discourse. Benjamin Buchloh, in 1980, argued that certain iterations of the artist as recycler reifies the collective processes of mass manufacture that have rendered craft-based production models obsolete. Using industrial techniques to fashion a traditional work of art, for example, masks capital's alienated conditions of production through the semblance of an organic artisanal creation. The sublimation process thus serves to recoup value for the art object in the wake of its critical deconstruction through tendencies like conceptualism and institutional critique. Following Buchloh, one might say that Fechner engages the trope of the, quote, melancholic stroller in the junkyards of capitalist technology, end quote, restabilizing an obsolete medium through an ideological sleight of hand. For the reclamation process he applies, invests discarded industrial products with culturally esteemed market purpose. However, the X Americana X pictures physical arrival on the banks of the Long Island Expressway, in fact entailed a mobile process of circulation that in itself performs the social processes of waste exhibited in the images. In a written statement for a skull and crossbones sculpture with similar found collection methods, Fechner framed the production process in explicitly ambulatory terms. Quote, there's quite a wealth of refuse out in the industrial areas of urban centers. While driving around looking for locations to stencil, I would pick up a discarded object or industrial bone. Later, I would fuse these various found objects by burning or gluing. In this case, the elements were a four barrel carburetor and a stack of 45 RPM records. This industrial trophy represents the hopes and dreams of all those who have attempted to make a hit record contrasted with an ill-fated industrial mechanism." End quote. By this account, the Death's Head sculpture, Man-Made Skeleton, explicitly thematizes petroculture through integrating a car engine part with petroleum-based music paraphernalia. But like X Americana X, it is a conspicuous and narrativized act of cruising the city, of roaming the streets by car, that first locates and then circulates the necessary detritus. According to Jennifer Gabris, disposal's quote unquote social death of things traces a complex pattern in which objects continually enter and take leave of the waste stream. Disposal occurs unevenly in stages, and each phase in the process represents a desire to retain or extract value from the no longer needed object. Top dollar items, like electronics, once obsolete, are commonly stockpiled in storage areas, such as closets and garages, before finally being trashed, prolonging the act of discarding out of a reluctance to part with expensive products. But even then, the larger infrastructure of disposal entails a transnational economy of salvaging, recycling, and exchange, which further delays waste matters deconstitution. In Gabrice's words, an object, quote, may pass into states of disposal and then enter several stages of delay, recuperation, and re-entry, end quote, which renegotiates its value. Waste, therefore, operates within an expanded and fluctuating field of spatial, cultural, and economic practices where it is constantly in motion. We might probe why Fechner reproduces the peculiar motion of the waste economy with its perpetual undulation of things homogenizing, breaking apart, and regaining purpose. For what reasons should he, per should he perform this in and out oscillation of discarded matter. 
One possibility I maintain is that Fechner's work articulates the logic of waste as a dynamic spatial process, but also evokes through the phenomenon of mobility, the widely felt panic that the specific brand of waste represented in Ex Americana X, toxic waste, inspired during the 1980s toxics crisis. As Mel Chen writes, toxins are critically mobile substances. They refuse to stay in place or to remain fixed. Contamination occurs when contact between misplaced matter and flesh exposes the human body to harmful content within a specific environmental context. Once set loose, the corrosive wandering of chemical or radioactive agents risks undoing partitions between organic and inorganic, or health and illness. Thus it is precisely the instability of toxins that proves threatening, and which lodged itself indelibly in the minds of many as stories of contamination, such as that of Love Canal, proliferated in news cycles. To cite an example that signals the paranoia, the dread, of Ex American X, consider a 1981 experimental video in which Fechner articulated toxic instability in terms not just peripatetic, but actually animated, endowed with an agential capacity that made hazardous materials an active rather than accidental danger. The computer-generated video, Toxic Wastes from A to Z, transforms a catalog of noxious chemicals into an abstract musical text played to the sound of children raucously chanting the words, toxic wastes from A to Z coming after you and me. As the video proceeds, a dizzying concatenation of sinister sounding chemical jargon populates the screen, including the multisyllabic appellations barium cyanide, dimenthal sulfoxide, and PCB, then largely associated with environmental racism in Warren County, North Carolina. The particular phrasing, coming after you and me, reverses normal subject-object grammatical distinctions and positions chemical agents as linguistic subjects who pursue an intended target. Human actors, on the other hand, become pursued as passive objects. This reversal of relations succinctly indexes the psychological torment associated with poisonous contamination. Sociological studies have linked contamination-related trauma to the perception of a hostile environment through fear of unseen but omnipresent synthetic dangers. In extreme cases, the shared sense of dread and stress surrounding contamination has the potential to ignite interpersonal antagonisms which can further deteriorate the afflicted community and lead to a regressive, sociolog or, I'm sorry, regressive social state of anime. Fechner's subversion of pastoral nature in Ex Americana X plays precisely on the feelings of trauma and disjuncture that are related to toxic circulation. In one recollection of the poisoning of Love Canal in the late 1970s, the presence of toxics were said to instill a view of the affected area with a menacing eeriness. The description of a winter wonderland, now besieged with hidden hazards, maps onto a sleepy, snowy landscape in Ex Americana X. The account reads, quote, I saw snow-covered, boarded-up houses, there were few tire tracks and footprints in the snow. It was so peaceful and quiet that I thought for a moment it was a ghost town. It was hard to believe that deadly chemicals were under, underneath those houses, that poisons were oozing up from under that pure white snow. Thank you. Thank you to Holly, Brianne, and Scott. If you would come back and join us on stage, I would like to introduce the moderator of our third session, Jenny Sorkin. 
Jenny is Associate Professor of the History of Art and Architecture at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she writes on the intersections between gender, material culture, and contemporary art, working primarily on women artists and underrepresented media. She is the author of Live Form, Women, Ceramics, and Community, published in 2016, which examines the confluence of gender, artistic labor, and the history of post-war ceramics. She is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Modern Craft, and has been the recipient of fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Center for Craft, the Getty Research Institute, and the ACLS Luce Fellowship in American Art. In November 2019, she gave the 23rd annual Peter Dormer Lecture at the Royal College of Art in London, which is Britain's most distinguished lecture series in the applied arts. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you all for staying uh, till the end of a very long day. We appreciate your attentiveness and um, kindness. Uh, so I just wanted to, to find a commonality across all three, and it actually seems to be uh, what I could come up with, is the idea of function, actually. Um, and in Holly's paper, function as service um, and craft as a moralizing force. Um, in Brianna's paper, uh, function as a series of alliances um, and intimacies of the body and corporal reality. Um, uh, and also the achievement of personhood. Uh, and in Scott's paper, the function of warning um, and the idea of uh, caution uh, and perhaps even communication, particularly in the X Americana X series, uh, in terms of these very brief declarative statements uh, in which the words look like either computer graphics or street signs, uh, and then the link then to the idea of the pavement and what for me was striking about uh, a New York based artist doing so much driving. Uh, which is something you usually see on this coast and not that coast. Um, and so I wondered if each of you could address this um, concept of uh, functionalism as uh, maybe the key to thinking across these papers. But you could respond in your own paper. Um, so thank you, Jenny, very much for that great question and for tying all three papers together in this way. Um, yeah, I think that functionalism is key in Fechner's entire project. And if you look at writings of his, particularly about his graffiti work, um, for which he saw X Americana X as an extension of, he talks about kind of reformulating our understanding of the urban environment in the same manner that a flaneur comes to a different understanding of walking the environment. And so um, his functions here in the context of these paintings is calling out things that are otherwise kind of passing through New York City streets, either unnoticed, um, such as in the case of hazardous waste shipments, um, which turned into a major controversy around the time that he was painting these murals. Um, or in other cases, in terms of areas that have been um, left kind of hazardous in different environmental ways. So you can think of the accumulation of debris in public spaces. And so something that Fechner would do was mark these things, either using graffiti or vandalism, and then call attention to these hazards um, to the Parks Department or whoever else in order to try to remediate the spaces themselves. Just as a quick follow-up, can you just give us a, like a two-sentence biography of this artist? Because I'm not familiar with him, and you said he has an MFA, but I'd like to locate where he's from mm -hmm. or something about him. Yeah, so he's from New York, and he grew up um, most of his life in Queens. Uh, um, and so much of his work has a kind of Queens focus to it. And he did his master's work at Lehman College in painting. Um, but moved from there into um, a lot of multimedia work which he had been doing throughout his artistic career, uh, lifelong artistic career, and started working um, largely as 
uh, a street artist. So if you think of mid and late 70s New York graffiti when it was first kind of emerging and coming into its own, he's one of the, um, the key players in that scene. But not an East Village artist. Um, he was involved somewhat in East Village. He was in, for instance, Lorene O'Grady's Black and White show. Um, but his identity as an artist was more associated with Queens. Um, and later in his career, he started to show at, at Fashion Moda as well. So I think that um, looking across all of the papers um, and thinking about function, I mean, something that struck me um, in all of them is this kind of preoccupation with how do human beings relate to the world around us if it's dysfunction in the case of your paper or uh, with Molly Gregory, it's, a, it's kind of trying to construct a very ideal environment or maybe it's a spiritual kind of function. Um, and really, I think, you know, in the case of Molly Gregory, there, there is this sense of kind of, of grasping. So there's function in the, in the sense of these physical objects support your, your human body or they hold food or they do these things. But they're also part of this economy um, of, a, of a community. And so in the case of, of Molly Gregory, there's, you know, there's the sense that the students are learning these aspects of cooperation. But I think also for her, being a woman who was trying to make her way as I think what we call now a maker, sort of a non-judgmental term, someone who's either an artist or a designer, they didn't have that then, they were very separate. Um, but someone who really wanted to have a creative engagement with the material world around her. Um, the function of these objects, I mean, they really, they launched her a career in craft, which was a very extraordinary thing at that time. But, but you also, I think, uh, underscored in a really um, provocative way at the very end of the paper where you see the young men standing on her stools to uplift literally the Buckminster Fuller that becomes rep like one of the primary iconic images that comes out of Black Mountain. She is ultimately the support, or what you say is, a helper discipline from from the beginning to the end of her entire career. I think, yeah, in at Black Mountain College for sure, um, they, they had kind of the Bauhaus model of design where the woodworkers are are a helper kind of. Um, they're a helper, they're anonymous, um, and really the attention is given to the architects, including Fuller. Um, I think later in her life, she goes to work, you know, she's working in schools and she's got, has her own, um, her own business in Massachusetts. And so I would say at that point, she's really doing what we would call studio furniture, where you have the designer and the maker are the same person. And that emerges later as a discipline and as a way of work. So I think things shift for her, but early on, certainly she is the support and the helper. And just to, one last thing on this, and then we'll move to you. Uh, that today we still find in art school context that the wood shop is still a helper discipline. Uh, and there is usually a kind of cranky guy with a gray haired ponytail uh, running the wood shop. Um, and that it really is usually in the basement, and that it also is, it functions as a support in some way to the, to the uh, the structures that students and faculty want to build onto. Yeah, I think that's certainly the case in a lot of in a lot of schools and uh, architecture programs, uh, art schools. I think maybe an exception would be furniture programs, and there are several where design and building get bundled together. And I think that there's a, an idea that this place of working with wood is a place of kind of knowledge production or art or something special is going, something of value is coming out of that hands-on work. And my sense of, is that someone like Molly Gregory, who is working with students and who's saying, this is productive of citizenship, you're becoming a good citizen by doing this, actually kind of primes a pump for that kind of thinking later on when you have generations of children coming out of these kinds of youth programs where they're learning that there's something intrinsically good about working with wood and getting your hands you know, dirty. Um, I, I also agree with what you said um, with ceramics and with other objects discussed or artworks discussed. It's 
about the relationship between the person who made it or the person who used it and their understanding of the environment. And that function kind of underlines that relationship, I think. Um, yeah. Could you say something a little bit about personhood in relation to your vessel? It was a really striking way of um, bringing the vessel to life, so to speak, even though it, had, it has an animism that you were um, emphasized for all of us uh, who, who are less familiar with your discipline. And it's, it's there it still is this, uh, I was really struck by the um, interiors of the vessels that you showed, particularly the Oyas and the, as, as uh, uh, you know, infant mortality burials. That was really uh, poignant and uh, I think very emotional. Um, and then also the relationship of chocolate to blood, which was entirely new to me and kind of uh, fascinating, particularly in cultures like ours that are really obsessed with chocolate. <laughs> um, with, with personhood, it's, I guess with the vessel, I was trying to explore how the vessel is sort of an extension of the of of the either it's the maker or whoever used it or whoever owned it um, just like any accessory that we have it it's part of our identity and an extension of that and it becomes sort of its own um, form of of the owner or the user or the maker um, but I also wanted to get at how if we think about it in terms of personhood, it really does highlight the animacy of it, that it's not um, just an object, but it can be understood as having its own personhood, maybe. But then also what you pointed out, which was really important too, is this idea of the um, activation of the object through the social, through the use of the vessel, through the, the construction of passing the vessel or of, um, uh, activating it through a kind of ritual aspect. So I wondered if you could speculate perhaps on, is this an elite object? Is this, could it only be an elite object? Or, uh, or could it be a kind of communal object for uh, everyday people? Well, I think most ceramics, especially the ceramics that show up in museum collections are probably elite objects, just because of how finely they're made and detailed in painting and construction. Um, so they were definitely part of that elite class and they were made by artists and um, craft or potters who also belong to the elite class as well. So they, yeah, they definitely are part of an upper class. Would there be a, a, an object that perhaps no longer exists, but would there be one in another area of society that would still function the same way? Like could uh, people who were not elites could could poor everyday people also have chocolate pots? The, and I'm forgetting the name of the one group, um, I think Copador ceramics, those ones were circulated, I believe, among other people outside of the elite group, but the quality of the painting is different or lower or slightly lower. The glyphs aren't quite the same. Pseudo glyphs appear, so it's like they're kind of mimicking the appearance of glyphs, but they don't actually say a whole lot. Um, and that the appearance of glyphs also seems to be tied to the objects as elite objects, too. Um, I don't know, I couldn't tell you if, they, <laughs> if the same arguments would apply to non-elite objects, possibly. Well, that's the interesting speculative part of it. I mean, I guess so, if we think about so one of the authors who wrote about animating objects, he talked about the steps to animating objects. And one is through painting um, that kind of activates it. Um, so yeah, I guess, yeah. And they were also broken to ritually killed. Well, and the activation actually come, goes across all three as well. The idea of activating uh, these kinds of highway spaces where dumping happens or where things break apart or underneath overpasses where people are graffitiing. That's kind of activating a dead space. Uh, Molly Gregory with her groups of students is activating objects, uh, you know, through 
the reanimation of community, uh, through the idea of service, through serving each other, through gift giving, through exchange, um, and then this uh, activating through ritual. So there's something very interesting about um, how activation crosses all of these uh, different kinds of disciplinary <laughs> structures. Um, I wonder with the time we have left, if we could open this up for questions or comments. Uh, thank you for the, t the talks. Um, I, I, besides functions, or maybe related to functions, if we think about organs and functions, but bodies seem to be like <clears throat> across the, the um, certainly Brian's and, and, and Scott's, but uh, one kind of like things that are breaking down bodies and the other things that are restoring bodies um, or life to bodies, I guess. Um, so I, I wonder if you could talk about that, the painting, um, in, in your case, maybe like the painting as a body. And how successful do you think that he was with getting these pollutants onto the body of the painting or the painting as an object? Did, was he successful ultimately in thematizing that by, by doing it? Like, do we see evidence of those pollutants or do we see them over time? Do, do they break down the body of the painting? Um, and for Brienne, my question was, um, did, did the classical Maya have a theory like the humors, like Galen? Is that, is that cross-cultural in that way? Because you mentioned like heat and cold and life and death, and I'm thinking about hot and wet and cold and uh, dry. Uh, or I guess I'm reversing it, but you know, the genderedness of uh, hot and cold and wet and dry, you know, you said that the, the womb is like this pot. So yeah, how did that, that figure into the, to, to this? Or, or is that not the schema that we think that the Maya used? Um, so to answer your question about how visible um, or evident the um, airborne pollution is on the paintings, is it's truly hard to say. Um, since such, so much of it would have just been fine particulate matter, it would have been invisible already. So it's almost a sort of conceptual gesture that this is being created in such a kind of smoggy, polluted environment that it's coming um, kind of brimming with invisible pollutants itself. But this notion of invisibility and pointing towards invisibility is a key theme in a lot of Fechner's work, starting from very early on um, when he has a series of breakout paintings while he's produced, doing his MFA at Lehman College, which are called the barely visible portraits. So for these, he would spend a very extensive amount of time, eight hours a day for a series of months, very lightly kind of stippling in um, what would become highly naturalistic portraits, usually people smiling, enjoying themselves and things like that, but they looked like white monochromes. They looked like Robert Ryman's. And so if you went to the gallery display of these and you just walked quickly past, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, it's abstractionist uh, doing Ryman-esque work. But what they asked for was a very keen and slow meditation because it was only after you spent time really focusing on them and kind of moving around to get different angles um, that the full portrait itself, which again is highly detailed and highly naturalistic despite being so lightly stippled in there, um, that it would come out. So um, that the ex Americana X paintings don't necessarily materially display um, the particulate matter that they were kind of immersed in is part of this ethos of Beckner's of pointing to something beyond the horizon of the painting itself. I hope that answered your question. Um, I think there is sort of an idea of humors among the Maya, um, but it's more like duality. So there's uh, complementary opposites, right, that work together. And so with clay, for example, because it's, it's a material that comes from, um, I think, feminine places that are watery or underworld access points to the underworld, um, lake beds or caves, the complementary to that is fire or the pigments, the mineral pigments that, um, or, yeah, there's there's something going on there with um, gendered things and. So it seems like if you're painting a clay thing red, it's almost like you're also reproducing the like, active conception. Yeah, 
I would think so. Yeah. I have a I have a question for Brienne and another and a question for Scott. Um, for Brienne, I'm wondering: Is there any thought that the spectacularly beautiful uh, cumulus cloud dominated skies of Central America help explain the fairly consistent volumetric and kind of cloudy, cumuli, puffy look of Central American visual art? Um, I was struck by the fantastic beauty of the clouds of Oaxaca Valley in the month of June, almost half a century ago. It was, these were the most beautiful skies I've ever seen. That must be influencing the art there, but I've never seen much evidence of it, especially in modern art from that region. And for Scott, I heard you, I thought I heard him mention that you're connected to, a, to an organization with climate in its name, and I'd like to find out a little more about that. Um. I, yeah, there are, there's, I don't remember the name of the rock that has a carving of it with clouds and, or maybe it's a cave entrance or something that has, something like that, that has clouds uh, coming out and it, they look like the clouds down there and it's very much an observation of the natural world. They're beautiful. Yeah, it's almost like you can touch them when you stand up on the pyramids. Um, so the group is the Climate Futures Collective, and it's a UCI-based research group that was um, uh, thought up by a fellow graduate student in the uh, Visual Studies program um, by the name of Mariana Davison. And um, I co-founded it with Mariana and another graduate student by the name of Aaron Kotzman. And right now, we've just been doing kind of monthly um, research group meetings, but we're building that towards a conference on May 1st. The CFP is still active if anyone's interested. Deadline's February 20th. And that conference will be um, called Fluid Borders, and it's about all sorts of um, border political issues, especially in an environmental sense. Um, so if you think about the way that the rising sea levels is something that will rewrite currently existing borders um, and the way that borders are expanded through militarization processes like what the U.S. is currently exercising. It's anything of that sort will be entertained during the conference. Excellent. Um, two questions, one for Scott, which is you referred to mobility and circulation, but actually dumps and waste is is a one-way street, as it were. It's the it's actually a different logic uh, in terms of movement because it's an endpoint. It's meant to be an endpoint. So, I'd just like you to entertain or um, respond to that um, concept. And then I want to kind of go to the micro um, history of education in America moment with woodworking and all of this um, and see if I can learn a little bit more because it all was so Protestant to me. That's what I kept thinking. Um, and then I thought, well, but Concord is not a religious school. And I wanted to hear more about both the tradition of where you might find Protestant value in, in the discourse that you were uh, talking about to us on the one hand. On the other hand, the gendered nature of this uh, because woodworking also was like the boys thing to do, you know, in certain schools where it was a vocational training, which is in public schools where, you know, women did home economics. So in these non-privileged settings, it was highly gendered and vocational and not this kind of Protestant good, you know. So I just wondered if you could maybe say a little bit more about these different valences, if you had any thoughts about that? Why, don't, why doesn't Holly start? Okay. okay, so I'll start with the gendered part. Um, and in my research, um, I've been looking at amateur woodworking throughout the 20th century. And you're absolutely right, in, in many situations, it's gendered um, in, in vocational training, but also in things like scouting. There is a building component and ideas that this is about 
being productive of manhood. It's not just that it's for boys, it's specifically for getting boys away from women and girls and, you know, don't want to be a mama's boy, get away from your mother, go and learn, you know, these, these, these things that boys do. Um, I think when you get into, and I think you're right to, to use the word privilege, right? This is New England, private schools, private education. Um, this is, uh, you know, one branch of progressive education where they talk about the human organism more so than they talk about gender. They just, it's, it's not that they treat boys and girls the same, but they aren't so, they aren't hung up on that. And so you get, you know, places like John Dewey's laboratory school at the University of Chicago, um, one of, they just they said, you know, well, we don't see any reason that girls shouldn't benefit from this kind of activity than in boys because it wasn't vocational training. So you had women teachers and you had girls working on these building projects. Um, in terms of the religion, the, the Protestantism, I, I think maybe the Protestant work ethic is perhaps what you're referring to. It is a very kind of... Um, stayed, right, a very, actually Molly Gregory became a Quaker later in her life. Um, she was, she didn't start out that way, but she, um, she was, she worked in, and then a lot of these, like the, the, the uh, Concord Academy Chapel was actually designed uh, to be non -denom they called it non-denominational because back then you could have a Christian chapel and call it non-denominational, but it was, you know, there, it was more of a gathering place, I think, than a place of uh, religious worship. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, I think that landfills and dumps as the kind of preeminent site of waste disposal that we think of in um, the U.S. are a lot less stable and a lot less final than we usually think about them as being. Um, so one good example from the 1980s is the fact that um, the famous incident of the ship, the Marlboro 5000, left U.S. shores to go take its trash elsewhere and no one would accept it. And so it ended up just kind of circulating around, you know, very visibly in the Atlantic Ocean for several months. Um, and even within uh, sites like landfills and dumps, there's a lot of different practices, cultural and economic, where um, things are picked up and take leave of those sites. So salvaging and recycling is, being, is one of these but then also the larger transnational um, economy of waste exchange. So just to give another example for that that's pertinent for Fechner, the radioactive sludge that was being shipped out of Brookhaven National Laboratory that he protested with the two murals that I showed was no longer use, usable at Brookhaven, but um, certain portion, portions of it stood, could still be reclaimed for um, fuel. And so they were shipped through Long Island, through New York, and then either to South Carolina or to other sites where they would be reprocessed and resold again. So I think there's a more expanded um, system of circulation and exchange that surrounds waste practices and that complicates um, how we think of dumps and landfills as being the kind of final resting point of waste. How are we doing on time? I don't have a watch up here. Okay. Yes. Do you want to use the mic? Thank you. Um, one of the interesting strands um, that seems to interconnect all three of your papers uh, concerns um, the way that the materiality of making and using things relates to the human body and its connection to the environment. Um, and also transitions and changes that come about through those interactions. Um, for instance, your paper on waste and discard. You know, the materiality of waste and discard is a tremendously interesting and provocative subject. Um, I mean, in your situation, it seems that um, you know there is a kind of anxiety about the toxifying environment and its ultimate impact on the body. So it's sort of on the individual level, but also your artist is addressing it on a community level of you know, concern about what this is doing to sort of an idealized environment, an idealized landscape and community. Um, 
the uh, educational setting involves kind of a construction of self uh, against some kind of protocols of gender and education and, and in the use of materials. And yet, you know, it's about the individual um, artist who is, who is constructing, but also it's about the community of people who are being built around these projects. And Brianne, um, your, your case involves um, so the, the vessel as the constructed metaphor for the body, and yet also, I thought your, your argument about the, um, the relationship to the, um, the burials and the to ultimate transitions of the soul through different states and into regeneration was quite interesting. I just wondered if each one of you would be willing to just offer us a few thoughts on that sort of aspect of the papers that you presented. I can start. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, like you said, um, at Black Mountain College, they were building this community. I mean, it really was. Uh, a collective endeavor, and it was it was a very difficult collective endeavor because they were very anti-authoritarian, and you had a lot of really big egos on the faculty, and they were living there all year round, and they could not go anywhere because of gas rationing during the war, and so they were really kind of in this little pressure cooker, um, where, and they had many different factions. There was a lot of drama. There's a wonderful book by Martin Duberman that documents all of this, how it nearly fell apart many times. And so a lot of these, it was not a given that this community was going to hang together. Um, and I think Molly Gregory was someone who really took a stand for this is going to work. Um, and so I think building, you know, building these, we did it with the studies building, we're going to build this other building. We're, th these things were really, uh, they were necessities for them, but they were also really declarations that we are coming together and we are successful. And look, we have been successful. So, so the buildings um, were then sort of material index of the unifying effect, the unifying consequences of these efforts. Absolutely. I think the studies building that I showed, it was the big, large, uh, modern building that they built. That was when their work program was really working well. They never quite got that kind of enthusiasm again. So it really did become this kind of emblem of the community coming together. And it was, it was a document that they, they, it was a project that they documented extensively, and then during the war, they so they built they built it in 1941, and then during the war they used that those documents as these kinds of wartime imagery of work. Um, so yeah, that was a, it was a moment. <laughs> oh, it's a, a, yeah, the yeah. wartime imagery of work was so central at that time. Yeah. That's another interesting dimension of what you were presenting. I, I hadn't really put into words, but thank you for bringing yeah. that up. Yeah, I think the, I didn't really have time to get into it in the, in the uh, presentation, but yeah, Molly Gregory gets there, they hire her, and then a lot of the male students go away, and it becomes a girls' school for a few years, effectively girls, girls and a lot of refugees from, from Europe. Um, so, you know, I think she did kind of ride that wave of um, uh, opportunity because the boys were, you know, the male students were going to war, but then after that they were going to Harvard to architectural school. So she was this person who stayed, who had those kind of building skills. Yeah, that was a bit of an interesting moment of subject formation for women through mm -hmm. these work and educational opportunities. Yeah, and I think, you know, she's very different from the Rosie the Riveter kind of character because that character goes back into the home in the 1950s, and she continued as a woodworker until she retired in, in the late 1980s. Oh, it's a great yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I think I have a good example that speaks to your uh, question um, about the kind of material or materiality of decay in its relation with community formation. Um, so the thing that Fechner is most known for is the word decay itself. Mm -hmm. It was a motif that he spray painted using the blocky serif stencil um, around different areas, uh, largely industrial or neglected areas in New York um, through the 70s and the 1980s. 
And in 1977, um, when the kind of uh, crisis of structural racism was ongoing in the Bronx and it led to the, the, the borough just being leveled with arson, largely committed by landlord, land, landlords um, collecting insurance money, um, Jimmy Carter came to Charlotte Street, which was the epicenter of the crisis, and he stood before you know, a host of burnt out tenements and said, I'm gonna rebuild the Bronx. Um, and that never happened. So then Ted Kennedy came, and then Ronald Reagan came, and then the Soviet delegation came, and it turned into a political football, Charlotte Street. Um, and so in 1980, um, a grassroots, organization, mostly of Bronx residents, came together under the name the Coalition for a People's Alternative. And they um, cleaned up Charlotte Street and turned it into a site of political activism, where they were going to launch a, um, a counter convention to the, to the DNC in the, in the same style as the 1968 protests of the DNC. So Fechner got involved with that campaign and spray painted on the site of several buildings where they ended up then putting up assembly booths and things like that. The words broken promises, falsas promesas, decay, and a number, number of other motifs. Broken promises and falsas promesas itself became the two rallying cries of the Coalition for a People's Alternative. So what happened then, I mean it's constant twists and turns, um, is Reagan co-ops this. Um, these murals. He goes to Charlotte Street and he stands before them and he kind of flips it into a sign of like the moral decay and the kind of decay of big government and things like that. So then Fechner re-co-ops it and makes this experimental video that's kind of lampooning Reagan, making fun of him, and in the 1984 elections this, this gets circulated on a big screen through Manhattan as part of Jenny Holzer's Sign on a Truck project. So, so there's an active contest at the kind of national and federal level over the site of Charlotte Street in which Fechner's contributions to that political battle become a kind of volatile and active signifier. That's, that, that is a great example, and I hope all of that goes into whatever book you're eventually going to write. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Thank you. It definitely will. <laughs> Brianne, do you want to finish out the question? Uh, sure. So the relationship between nature and the body and then the art product, um, it's very clear with the ceramic because it's made from materials that are understood and perceived through the body and the relationship to the body and the conceptions of the world and their place within the world um, and then collected to make an artificial body that possibly is then activated to, to, <laughs> to produce a whole another body um, and potentially animate body, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, you know, it does remind me of those sorts of transgenerational concepts of transition that also were, you know, play in, in the pottery of the Southwest. So well, I thought you argued that very beautifully. Thank you. Has to go in your dissertation. <laughs> It'll get there. <laughs> well, thank you all. Rebecca. Uh, Mary Miller would like to take a few minutes to share some concluding remarks. Uh, because her words will, will wrap us up, I want to just quickly say thank you very much for a wonderful, productive day. It's been a pleasure to be part of this for the second year in a row. Uh, if you haven't already, just a reminder to validate your parking before you head out. And also, uh, after Mary shares her thoughts with us, we have a reception for you, and I hope you will join us for that as well. Thank you. My thoughts are truly brief because I know I'm standing between you and a reception. Uh, I do feel as though my brain is exploding a bit after today because I am struck by how we have both recovered the past and seen the present fractured. Um, I, I think that it is a fascinating experience to be with a, a group of people who are forming uh, the art history of what is today and tomorrow, and a cohort 
was formed here today, and I'm happy to see that the presenters are actually still by and large with us um, because it's a cohort that didn't exist before you walked in this room. But over the next few years, and over the course of your lives as art historians, you're going to be intersecting with one another. You'll be at a panel, you'll pick up a, an exhibition catalog, and you'll say, oh yeah, I first met that person, and I first heard that person um, at the Getty Graduate uh, at the Getty Graduate Symposium. It, it's a moment when you, you know, you've been with the people who are in your program, but this is that moment when you begin to see the horizontal stratum of what is going on um, at the other programs in California. There are similar convenings that are happening this spring, one at the Frick in New York, one at COSVA in Washington, D.C. But print this in your memories, build on it, uh, and think about how to grow it at other meetings. And now, I'll stop being that obstacle and send you all off to a well-deserved refreshment. <laughs>